Section 34 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 8, Part 4. Dear Madam, a friend, or perhaps an enemy, no matter, a person who knows but wishes to remain unknown, takes this means of informing you that you are being betrayed. Your husband, so seeming virtuous, and your friend, who wants to pass for an innocent, are laughing at you for your good-humored confidence. You poor blinded wife! I have my own reasons for wishing to tear the mask off both their faces. It is not from goodwill to you that I so act, for I can easily imagine that this detection of two persons dearer to you may bring you more pain than profit, but I have no goodwill to you in my heart. Perhaps I am a rejected adorer who is taking his revenge this way. What matters the motive? The fact is there, and if you wish for proofs, I can furnish them to you. Besides, without proofs, you would give no credit to an anonymous letter. The accompanying billet was lost by Countess Gurr. This astounding letter lay on our breakfast table one fine spring morning. Frederick was sitting opposite to me, busied with his letters, while I read and reread the above ten times over. The note, which accompanied the traitor's epistle, was enclosed in an envelope of its own, and I put off tearing it open. I looked at Frederick. He was deep in a morning paper. Still, he must have felt the look which I fixed on him, for he let the newspaper fall, and with his usual kindly, smiling expression, turned his face to me. "'Hello! What is the matter, Martha? Why are you staring at me in that way?' "'I wanted to know whether you are still fond of me.' "'Oh, no, not for a long time,' he said, jestingly. Really, I have never been able to bear you. That I do not believe. But now I begin to see. But you are quite pale. Have you had any bad news? I hesitated. Should I show him the letter? Should I first look at the piece of evidence which I held in my hand still unbroken? The thoughts whirled through my head. My Frederick, my all, my friend and husband him whom I trusted and loved. Could he be lost to me? Unfaithful he? Oh, it must have been only a momentary intoxication of the senses. Nothing more. Was there not enough indulgence in my heart to forgive it? To forget it? To regard it as having never happened? But to be false? How would it be if his heart, too, had turned from me? How, if he preferred the seductive lorry to me? "'Well, do speak. You seem quite to have lost your voice. Show me the letter which has so shocked you.' And he stretched his hand out for it. "'There it is for you. I gave him the letter I had just read. The enclosure I kept back.' He glanced over the informer's writing. With an angry curse, he crumpled up the paper and sprang from his seat. "'Infamous!' he cried. "'And where is the proof he speaks of?' Here, not open. Frederick, say one word only, and I throw the thing into the fire. I do not want to see any proofs that you have betrayed me. Oh, my own one! He was now by my side and embraced me closely. My treasure! Look into my eyes! Do you doubt me? Proof or no proof, is my word enough for you? Yes, I said, and threw the paper into the fire but it did not fall into the flames, but remained close to the bars. Frederick jumped up to get it, and picked it out. No, no, we must not destroy that. I am too curious. We will look at it together. I do not recollect ever writing anything to your friend which could lead to the inference of a relation which does not exist. But you have spent her, Frederick. You have only to throw your handkerchief to her. Do you think so? Come, 
Let us look at this document. Right, my own hand. Oh, look here. It is surely the two lines which you dictated to me some weeks back, when you had hurt your right hand. My lorry, come. I am anxiously expecting you today at 5 p.m. Martha, still a cripple. The finder of this note did not understand the meaning of the parenthesis. This is really a funny confusion. Thank God that this grand proof was not burned. Now my innocence is plain. Or have you still any suspicion? No. After you had looked in my face, I had no more. Do you know, Frederick, I should have been very unhappy, but I should have forgiven you? Laurie is coquettish, very pretty. Tell me, has not she made advances to you? You shake your head. Well, truly, in this matter, you have not only the right, but almost the duty of deceiving even me. A man cannot betray a lady's favor whether he accepts or rejects it. And so you would have forgiven me a false step? Are you not jealous? Yes, in a way that tears my heart. If I think of you at another's feet, sipping joy from another's lips, grown cold to me, all desire dead, it is horrible to me. Yet, it was not the death of your love that I feared. Your heart would under no circumstances turn cold to me, that I am sure of. Our souls are surely so interwoven with each other. But, I understand. But you need, by no means, think of me, that my feeling for you is like that of a husband after the silver wedding. We have been married too short a time for that, so long as the fire of youth glows in me, for indeed I am forty years old already. It burns for you. You are the only woman on earth to me. And, should some other temptation in reality again assail me, my will is quite strong enough to keep it away from me. The happiness which is contained in the consciousness of having kept one's plighted troth, the proud repose of conscience with which a man can say of himself that he has kept the firmly tied bond of his life in every respect sacred, all this is to me too noble to allow it to be destroyed by a passing intoxication of the senses. You have besides made so perfectly happy a man of me, my Martha, that I am raised as far above everything, above all intoxication, all amusement, all pleasure, as the possessor of ingots of gold above the gain of copper pieces. With what delight did such words as these sink into my heart? I was expressly thankful to the anonymous letter-writer for helping me to this delightful scene, and I transferred every word into my red book. I can still reproduce the entry here, under date one four eighteen sixty five. Ah, how far, how far back is all that? Frederick, on the contrary, was highly incensed against the slanderer. He swore that he would find out who had been guilty of the composition, so as to punish the actor as he deserved. I found out the same day what the origin and aim of the writing was. Its result, which was that Frederick and I were thenceforth drawn a little closer together, its originator could hardly have foreseen. In the afternoon I went to my friend Lori to show her the letter. I wanted to let her know that she had an enemy by whom she was falsely exposed to suspicion, and I wanted to laugh with her over the chance that my dictated note had been so misconstrued. She laughed more than I expected. So you were shocked at the letter? Yes, mortally, and yet I had nearly burned the enclosed note. Oh, then the whole joke would have missed fire. What joke? You would have believed, to the end, that I had really betrayed you. Let me take this opportunity to make you a confession, that I did in an hour of delirium. It was after the dinner at your father's at which I sat next to Tilling, and it was because I had drunk too much champagne, that I did then, so to say, offer him my heart on a salver. And he? And he answered me very much to the purpose, that he loved you above all other things and was firmly resolved to remain true to you, to death. The whole joke was contrived to teach you to prize this phenomenon better. What is this joke that you keep talking of? 
Why, you must know, inasmuch as the letter and the envelope come from me. From you? I know nothing about it. Have you then not turned the enclosure round? See here, on the back of it is written my name and the date. April 1. End of section 34. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 35 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 9. Part 1. The Indefinite Approximation of Two Loving Hearts. A Serious Illness. Progress of Conrad's Suit to My Sister. Aunt Mary's Letter. First Rumors of War with Prussia. Sequel of the Schleswig-Holstein War. The Poor Parlors and Negotiations Leading to the Austro-Prussian War. Arguments with my father and aunt about war. New Year's Day, 1866. Conrad and Lily engaged. My father's toast. War visibly approaching. Hopes and fears. Recriminations and reciprocal provocations. Prussia occupies Holstein. The army of the Bund mobilized. War declared. Manifestos of the sovereigns and generals. Brought nearer, ever nearer. I have found out that this capacity of approximation of loving hearts belongs to the class of things of which divisibility is an example. Things which have no limits. One might have believed that a particle might have become so small already that nothing smaller could be conceived, and yet it is susceptible of division into two halves. And so one might think that two hearts might be already so fused together that a more intimate union could not be possible, and yet some external influence acts, and the atoms, the two hearts, embrace and interpenetrate each other still more firmly and closer, ever closer. This was the effect of Laurie's sufficiently tasteless April fooling, and such was the effect of another external event which happened soon after, that is, a violent nervous fever which attacked me and laid me on a sickbed for six weeks. It was indeed a sad event, and yet how fruitful it was in happy recollections for me, and how powerful in its influence on the process sketched above. I mean, the bringing nearer and nearer of to so closely attached hearts, whether it was the fear of losing me, which made me still dearer to my husband, or whether it was that his love had merely become more noticeable to me by his behavior as sick nurse. In short, during this nervous fever, and after it, I still more and still more surely felt that I was beloved than before. I was also truly afraid of dying, First, because it would have given me horrible pain to lose a life which seemed to me so rich in beauty and happiness, and to leave my dear ones. Frederick, with whom I wished so much to grow to old age. Rudolph, whom I wished so much to train up to manhood. And secondly, too, not in respect to myself, but with regard to Frederick, the thought of death was horrible to me because I knew as well as one can know anything that the pain of laying me in the grave would be, to the bereaved one, well-nigh intolerable. No, no, people who are happy, and people who are beloved by those they hold dear, cannot feel any contempt for death. The chief ingredient in the latter is contempt for life. On my sickbed, where sickness buzzed around me with its deadly power, as the warrior on the battlefield hears the buzz of those bullets around him, I was able to enter perfectly into the feelings of those soldiers who love their lives and to know that their death will plunge hearts they love into despair. There is but one thing, said Frederick in reply to me when I communicated this thought to him, in which the soldier has the advantage over the fever patient, the consciousness of duty fulfilled. Still, I agree with you in this, to die with indifference, to die with joy, as we are on all hands told to do is what no happy man can do. Only those could who were exposed in former times to all the ills of life, 
or those who have nothing left to lose in a peaceful existence, or such as can only free their brethren from shame and an intolerable yoke by their own death. When the danger was over, how I enjoyed my recovery, my new birth. That was a feast for both of us, like the happiness of our reunion after the Schleswig-Holstein War, but still different. Then the joy came with a single stroke, and here, little by little. And besides, since that time we were closer to each other, ever closer. My father had visited me daily during my illness, and shown much concern. But for all that I knew that he would not have taken my death to heart overwhelmingly. He was much more attached to his two younger daughters than to me, and the dearest of all to him was Otto. I had become to some extent estranged from him by my two marriages, and particularly by the second, and perhaps also by my totally different way of thinking. When I was completely recovered, which was in the middle of June, he removed to Grumitz, and gave me a warm invitation to come to him there with my little Rudolph. But I preferred, since Frederick was prevented from leaving the city by his duties, to take my country holiday quite close to Vienna, where my husband could visit me daily, and so I hired a summer lodging at Heitzing. My sisters, still under Aunt Mary's protection, traveled to Marienbad. In her last letter from Prague, Lily wrote to me as follows, amongst other matters, I must confess to you that Cousin Conrad begins to be by no means displeasing to me. During several cotillions I was in the humor to have said yes, if he had put the important question. But he omitted to take the decisive step at the right moment. When it was settled that we were to leave the city, he did, it is true, make me an offer again. But then I had again an impulse to refuse. I have become so used to do this to poor Conrad that when he used the accustomed form to me, Will you not now become my wife, Lily? My tongue replied quite automatically. I have no idea of doing so. But this time, I added, ask me again in six months. That means that I am going to examine my heart during the summer. If I long after him in his absence, if the thought of him, which now follows me almost uninterruptedly day and night, does not quit me when I am at Marienpad, if neither there nor in the ensuing shooting season any other man succeeds in making an impression on me, why then the perseverance of my obstinate cousin will have prevailed. Aunt Mary wrote to me about the same time. This happens to be the only letter of hers which I have kept. My dear child, this has been a fatiguing winter campaign. I shall be not a little glad when Rosa and Lily have found partners. Found they have, plenty of them, for as you know each has refused, in the course of the carnival, half a dozen offers, not counting the perennial Conrad. Now the same drudgery is to begin again at Marienbad. I should like to have gone to Grumitz to spend some time, above all things, or to you, and instead of this I am obliged to play over again the tiresome and thankless part of chaperon to these pleasure-seeking girls. I am very glad to hear that you are quite well again. Now that the danger is over, I may say that we were in great trouble. Your husband used for some time to write us such despairing letters. Every moment he was in fear of seeing you die. But let us thank God that it was not destined so to be. The novena which you kept at the Ursulines for your recovery also perhaps helped to preserve you. The Almighty designed to spare you for your little Rudy. Kiss the dear little boy and tell him to keep hard at his learning. I send him with this a couple of little books the pious child and his guardian angel, a charming story, and our country's heroes, a collection of war sketches for boys. A taste for such things cannot be instilled too early into the young. Your brother Otto, for instance, was not five years old when I used to tell him about Alexander the Great and Caesar and other famous conquerors, and it is a real pleasure to see what a spirit he has now for everything heroic. I have heard that you prefer to remain for the summer in the neighborhood of Vienna, instead of going to Grumitz. You are quite wrong there. The air of Grumitz would suit you much better than that dusty heatsing, and poor Papa will be quite bored all alone. Probably it is on your husband's account that you will not go away, but it seems to me that the duty of a daughter also should not be quite neglected. Tilling, too, could surely come to Grumitz for a day sometimes. To be so very much together is not altogether good for married folks trust my experience of life. I have noticed that the best marriages are those in which the couples are not always sitting, prosing together, 
but allow each other a little latitude. Now good-bye. Spare yourself, so as not to get a relapse, and think again about Heatsing. May heaven preserve you and your Rudy. This is the constant prayer of your affectionate Aunt Mary. P.S. Your husband has, I know, relatives in Prussia. Happily, he is not so arrogant as his countrymen. So ask him what they are saying there about the political situation. It is surely very grave. This letter of my aunt made me reflect again that there was a political situation. During all this time I had not troubled myself about anything of the sort. I had, it is true, read a good deal both before and after my illness, as usual, daily and weekly papers, reviews and books, but the leading articles in the journals remained unnoticed. Since I no longer debated with myself the anxious question, war or no war, the chatter about home and foreign politics possessed no interest for me. The postscript of the letter quoted above looked serious, and it occurred to me to look up what I had neglected and inform myself about our present position. What does Aunt Mary mean by her expression threatening, you least arrogant among the Prussians? I asked my husband, as I gave him the letter to read. Is there then a political situation at the present time? There is one, as there is weather, always, more's a pity, and one is always as changeable and treacherous as the other. Well, tell me then, are they talking still about these complicated duchies? Have they not done with them yet? They are talking about them more than ever. They have not done with them in the least. The Schleswig-Holsteiners have now a great fancy to get free of the Prussians, the arrogant Prussians we are called in the latest form of speech. Sooner Danish than Prussians, say they, repeating a signal given them by the central states. Do you know that the hackneyed Mirumschlungen song is now sung with this variation? Schleswig-Holstein Stammverwand, schmeißt die Prussian aus dem Land. And what has happened to the Augustenberg? Have they got him then? Oh, do not tell me, Frederick, do not tell me that they have not got him. It was on account of this, the only rightful heir for whom the poor countries oppressed by the Danes were longing so that the whole war had to be waged which might have cost me you. Leave me then at least the consolation that this indispensable Augustenberg has been reinstated in his rights and is reigning over the undivided duchies. I take my stand on this word undivided. It is an old historical right which has been assured to them for several centuries and the foundation of which I had trouble enough in investigating. It is going badly with your historical rights, my poor Martha, said Frederick, laughing. No one says anything at all about Augustenberg now, except himself and his protests and manifestos. From this time I began again to look into the political complications, and found out as follows. Absolutely nothing had really been settled or recognized, in spite of the protocol signed at the time of the Peace of Vienna. Since that, the Schleswig-Holstein question had been brought into all sorts of stages, but now was debated more than ever. The Augustenberg and the Oldenburg had made haste since the abdication which had taken place on the part of Lagusberg to make reclamation before the assembly of the Bund, and Lauenburg was eagerly desirous to be incorporated in the kingdom of Prussia. No one knows exactly what the Allies were going to try to do with conquered provinces. Each of these two powers attributed to the other a design of overreaching the other. End of section 35。Section 36 of Lay Down Your Arms。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 9, Part 2. What is this Prussia up to now? Such was the question, indicating mischief, which Austria, the central states, and the duchies kept always asking. Napoleon III advised Prussia to annex the duchies up to North Schleswig, where they speak Danish. But Prussia was not thinking of that for the moment. At last, on February 22, 1865, her claims were formulated to this effect. Prussian troops to remain in the countries, the latter to put their defensive forces under Prussian leadership, with the exception of a contingent of troops of the Bund, 
the harbour of Kiel to be occupied, posts and telegraphs to be Prussian, and the duchies to be compelled to join the Tolverein. Of these demands, our minister, Mensdorf Puli, complained, I do not know why. And still further, again I have no why, presumably out of envy, that distinctive feature in the conduct of external relations, the central states complained also. They vehemently demanded that the Augustenburg should, with all speed, be at once inducted into the government of the duchies. Austria, however, had something to say also, and what she said was this. She treated the Augustenburg as non-existent, was willing to consent to the possession by Prussia of the Kiel Harbor, but stood out against the right of recruiting and pressing sailors. And so the quarrel went on without cessation. Prussia declared that her demands were made only in the interests of Germany, that she did not wish for annexation. Augustenburg might enter on his inheritance, if he accepted the demands laid down, but if these necessary and moderate claims were not granted, then, with voice raised to the pitch of threatening, perhaps she would be compelled to demand more. Against this menacing voice, other voices were raised in scorn, in mockery, in provocation. In the central states and in Austria, public opinion became daily more and more embittered against Prussia, and especially against Bismarck. On June 27, the central states accepted a motion to request information from the great powers. But as giving information is not the habit of diplomacy, but keeping everything snug and secret, the great powers negotiated in private. King William traveled to Gastein, the Emperor Francis Joseph to Ischel, Count Bloma fitted hither and thither between them, and an agreement was arrived at, on certain points. The occupation was to be half Austrian and half Prussian. Lauenburg, according to her own wish, was to be united to Prussia. For this, Austria was to receive as compensation two and a half millions of dollars. This last result was not calculated to inspire me with patriotic joy. What good could this insignificant sum do to the thirty-six millions of Austrians, even if it was to be divided among them, which was not the case? Would it replace the hundreds of thousands which, for example, I had lost with Schmidt and Sons? Or, still more, the losses of those who were mourning for their dear ones? What pleased me was a treaty which was signed at Gastein on August 14th. Treaty. The word sounds so promising of peace. It was not till afterwards that I learned that international treaties very often only serve, by means of importune violations of them, to introduce what is called casus belli. Then it is only necessary for one party to charge the other with a breach of treaty, and immediately the swords spring out of their sheaths, with all the appearance of a defense of violated rights. Still, the Gastein Treaty brought me repose. The quarrel seemed to be laid aside. General Goblins, handsome General Goblins, for whom all we ladies had a slight pension, the Stadtholder in Holstein, Manteuffel in Schleswig. I had at last to give up my favorite security, enacted in the year 1460, that the countries should remain together, forever undivided. As far as concerned my Augustenburg, for whose rights I had with so much trouble got up some warmth, it happened that this prince went on one occasion into his country and received the homage of his adherents, on which Manteuffel signified to him that if he ever ventured to come into those parts again without permission, he would unquestionably have him arrested. Whoever cannot see in that a good joke of use Cleos can have no comprehension of the comicalities of history. In spite of the Gastein Treaty, the situation would not calm down. And as I now, being alarmed by Aunt Mary's letter, and the explanations of it, which I received, resumed the regular perusal of the political leading articles, and collected intelligence from all sides about the opinions which gained currency, I was in a position to follow once more, with accuracy, the phases of the varying strife. That the latter would lead to a war, I did not apprehend. Such legal questions would have to be brought to an issue in the legal way that is, by weighing the claim of right on the two sides, and by a sentence consequent on this. All these consultative meetings of ministers and assemblies, these negotiating statesmen and monarch in friendly intercourse, would surely settle 
the debated points, which were in themselves so trivial. It was with more curiosity than anxiety that I followed the course of this incident, the different stages of which I find noted in my red volumes. October 1st, 1865. In the assemblage of delegates at Frankfurt, the following conclusions were accepted. 1. The right of the people of Schleswig-Holstein to decide on their own destiny remains in force. The Gastein Treaty is rejected by the nation as a breach of right. 2. All representatives of the people are to refuse all taxes and expenses to such governments as assert the policy of violence hitherto followed. October 15th. The Prussian Crown Syndic gave his judgment on the hereditary rights of Prince Augustenberg. The father of the latter had renounced for himself and his posterity his succession to the throne for a sum of one and a half million of specie dollars. The duchies were surrendered in the Treaty of Vienna. The Augustenberg had no claims at all upon them. In impudence, in assumption, such were the terms applied to this speech delivered at Berlin, and the arrogance of Prussia became a catchword. We must protect ourselves against it, was accepted as dogma of all kinds. King William seems disposed to play the part of the German Victor Emmanuel. Austria's secret motives to reconquer Silesia. Prussia is paying court to France. Austria is paying court to France. It patati, it patata, as the French say. Trich trotch is the German name for it and it does not go on more busily in the coffee-house coteries of country towns than between the cabinets of great powers. The winter brought my whole family back to Vienna. Rosa and Lily had amused themselves very much in the bohemian watering places, but neither was engaged. Conrad's affairs were in an excellent way. In the shooting season he was to come to Grumitz, and, although at this crisis the decisive word had not yet been spoken, Still, both were inwardly convinced that they would end in being united. Neither at this autumn shooting season did I make my appearance, in spite of my father's pressing persuasions. Frederick could not get any leave, and to separate from him was to exist in such sorrow as I would not expose myself to, without necessity. A second reason for not passing any length of time at my father's was that I did not wish to expose my little Rudolph to his grandfather's influence, whose effort always was to inspire the child with military tastes. The inclination for this calling, to which I was thoroughly averse as a profession for my son, had been awakened in him without this. Probably it was in his blood. The scion of a long race of soldiers must, by nature, bring warlike instincts into the world with him. In the works on natural science, whose study we were now pursuing more eagerly than ever, I had learned about the power of heredity of the existence of so-called congenital instincts, which are nothing but the impulse to put in action the customs handed down from our ancestors. On the boy's birthday, the grandfather was careful to bring him again a saber. But you know, father, I remonstrated, that my son will certainly not become a soldier, and I must really beg you seriously. What, do you want him to tie to his mother's apron strings? I hope you will not succeed there. Good soldier's blood is no liar. Let the fellow only grow up, and he will soon choose his profession for himself, and there is no finer one than that which you want to forbid him. Martha is frightened, said Aunt Mary, who was present at this conversation, of exposing her only son to danger. But she forgets that if one is destined to die, the fate will overtake one in one's bed, as surely as in battle. Then suppose one hundred thousand men to have fallen in war. They would have all been killed in peace, too? Aunt Mary was not at a loss for an answer. It was the destiny of these one hundred thousand to die in war. But if men had the sense not to begin any war, I suggested. Oh, but that is an impossibility, cried my father. And then the conversation turned again into a controversy such as my father and I used to often wage, and always on the same lines. On the one side, the same assertions and principles. On the other, the same counter-assertions and opposite principles. There is nothing to which the fable of the Hydra is so applicable as to some standing difference of opinion. No sooner have you cut one head off the argument and settled yourself to send the second the same way, when, lo, the first has grown again. Thus my father had one or two favorite positions in favor of war, 
which nothing could uproot. 1. Wars are ordained by God himself, the Lord of hosts, see the holy scriptures. 2. There have always been wars, and, consequently, there will always be wars. 3. Mankind, without this occasional decimation, would increase at too great a rate. 4. Continual peace relaxes, effeminates, produces, like stagnant water, corruption, especially the degeneration of morals. 5. Wars are the best means for putting in practice self-sacrifice, heroism, in short, the firmer elements of character. 6. Men will always contend. Perfect agreement in all their views is impossible. Divergent interests must be always impinging on each other. Consequently, everlasting peace is a contradiction in terms. None of these positions, in particular none of these consequentlies contained in them, could be kept standing if stoutly attacked, but each of them served the defender as a bulwark if compelled to let another of them fall, and while the new bulwark was being reduced to ruins, he had been setting the old one up again. For example, if the champion of war, driven into a corner, has to confess that peace is more worthy of humanity, more rich in blessing, more favorable to culture than war, he says, Oh yes, war is an evil, but it is inevitable. And then follows numbers one and two. Then if one shows that it could be avoided, and how, by alliances of states, arbitration courts, and so forth, then comes the reply, Oh yes, war could be avoided, but it ought not. And then comes number four and five. Then if the advocate of peace upsets these objections, and goes on to prove that, on the contrary, war hardens men and dehumanizes them, Oh yes, I allow that, but number three. This argument, too, is overthrown, for it is admitted that nature herself will see that the trees do not grow up to the sky, and wants no assistance from man to that end. This again turns out not to be the result which the professor of force has in view in making war. Granted, but number one. And so there is no end to the debate. The advocate of war is always in the right. His reasoning moves in a circle where you may always follow, but can never catch him. War is a horrible evil. It must exist. I grant it is not a necessity, but it is a great good. This want of consecutiveness, of logical honesty, all those people incur who defend a cause on principles which are not axiomatic, or else with no principles, merely from instinct, and to that end, will make use of all such phrases or commonplaces as may have come to their ears, and which have obtained currency in the maintenance of that cause. That these arguments do not proceed from the same points of view, that accordingly they not only do not support each other, but even do directly neutralize each other, makes no matter to them. It is not because this or that reasoning has originated from their own reflections, or is in harmony with their own convictions that it comes into their train of argument, they merely use to bolster the latter up, without any selection, the conclusions which others have thought out. All this might not have been so clear to me at that time when I was disputing with my father on the topic of peace and war. It was not till later on that I had accustomed myself to follow, with attention, the movements of the intellect in my own and other people's heads. I only recollect that I will always come away from these discussions in the highest degree fatigued and excited, and now see that this fatigue proceeded from this pursuing in a circle which my father's way of argument necessitated. This conclusion was, however, every time a compassionate shrug of the shoulders on his part, with the words, you do not understand that, words which, as he was treating of military matters, sounded certainly very well deserved in the mouth of an old general as addressed to a young lady. End of section 36. Section 37 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 9, Part 3 New Year's Day, 1866 We were all sitting with our punch and New Year's cakes, assembled round my father's table, when the first hour of this eventful year struck. It was a cheerful feast. We celebrated an engagement with the end of the old year, Conrad and Lily's. As the hand pointed to twelve, and Fou du Joie was fired in the street, my enterprising cousin threw his arm around the young lady who was sitting beside him, pressed, to the surprise of us all, a kiss on her lips, and then asked, Will you take me in sixty-six? Yes, I will, she replied, and I love you, Conrad. Then followed on all heads a clinking of glasses, embracing, handshaking, felicitations, and blessings without end. The health of the lovers. Long live Conrad and Lily. God bless your union, my children. Heartfelt congratulations, cousin. Happiness to you, sister. And so on and so on. A joyful and peaceful frame of mind took possession of us all. Perhaps not quite free of envy and all, for as death represents the most mournful and most lamentable of events, so love, the love which is sanctioned by the life-giving union, is the most joyful and the most enviable. I indeed could detect no trace of envy in myself, for happiness which had only just become a promise to the new bride had long since been my actual and firm possession. It was rather a feeling of doubt that crept over me. Such perfect bliss, as was prepared for me by Frederick, can hardly fall to poor Lily's lot. Conrad is, it is true, a very amiable man, but there is but one Frederick. My father brought to an end the tumult of congratulations by tapping on his glass with the signet ring on his little finger and rising to speak. He spoke somewhat to this effect. My dear children and friends, the year 66 begins well. To me it is bringing in its very first hour the fulfillment of a cherished wish, for I have long looked forward to having Conrad for my son-in-law. Let us hope that this prosperous year may also bring our Rosa under the yoke. And to you, Martha, and Tilling, a visit from the stork. To you, Dr. Bresser, may it bring many patients, though this as far as I can see hardly goes with the many wishes for good health that we have all been exchanging. And to you, dear Mary, may it present, that is, provide that it has been destined for you, for I know and honor your fatalism, a pitched battle of plenary indulgence or whatever it is that you are wishing for. You, my Otto, may it endow with eminent distinction in your final examination, and with all possible soldierly virtues and acquirements, so that you may one day become the ornament of the army and pride of your old father. And to the latter also I must try and get something good to come. And since he is one who knows no higher wish than for the good and the glory of Austria, I hope the coming year may bring some great conquest to the country. Lombardy, or who knows, the province of Silesia. One cannot tell to what all this is preliminary, but it is by no means impossible that we may take back again from the insolent Prussians that country which was stolen from the great Maria Theresa. I recollect that the close of my father's toast threw a chill on us. Lombardy and Silesia? Truly, none of us felt any pressing need for them. And the underlying wish for war, that is, fresh lamentation, more death pangs, that surely did not accord with the tender joyfulness which this hour, made sacred by a new bond of love, had awakened in our hearts. I even permitted myself to reply, No, dear father, today is the new year for the Italians, and Prussians also so we will not wish any destruction for them. May all men in the year 66, and in the years that are to follow, grow more united and more happy. My father shrugged his shoulders. You enthusiast, said he pityingly. Not at all, said Frederick in my defense. The wish expressed by Martha has no taint of enthusiasm, for its fulfillment is assured to us by science better and more united and more happy are men constantly becoming, from the beginning of all things 
to the present day, but so imperceptibly, so slowly, that a little span of time, like a year, may not show any visible progress. If you believe so firmly in everlasting progress, remarked my father, why are you so often complaining about reaction, about relapse into barbarism? Because, Frederick took out a pencil and drew a spiral on a sheet of paper, because the march of civilization is something like this. Does not this line, in spite of its occasional twist backwards, always move steadily onwards? The year which is commencing may, it is true, represent a twist, especially if it seems likely another war is going to be waged. Anything of that sort pushes culture a long way back, in every aspect, material as well as moral. You are not talking much like a soldier, my dear Telling. I am talking, my dear father-in-law, of a general proposition. My view about this may be true or false. Whether it is soldierly or not is another question. At any rate, truth can only be, in any matter, one way. If a thing is red, should one man call it blue on principle because he wears a blue uniform, and black if he wears a black cowl? A what? My father was in the habit, if any discussion did not go quite as he liked, to affect a little difficulty of hearing. To reply to such a what by repeating the whole sentence was what few people had the patience to do, and the best way was to give up the argument. Afterwards, the same night when we had got home, I put my husband under examination. What was that you said to my father? That there was every appearance that there would be another fight this year. I will not have you go into another war. I will not have it. What is the use, dear Martha, of this passionate I will not? you would certainly be the first to withdraw it in the face of facts, by how much more visibly war stands at the gate, by so much more the impossible would it be for me to apply for my discharge. Immediately after Schleswig-Holstein it might have been feasible. Ah, that unlucky Schmidt and Sons! But now, when the new clouds are gathering, then you really believe that? I believe that these clouds will disperse again. The two great powers will not tear each other to pieces for those northern countries. But now that it seems threatening again, retirement would have a cowardly look. You must see that, too. I was obliged to be guided by this reasoning, but I clung to the hopeful phrase, these clouds will disperse again. I now followed with anxiety the development of political events, and the opinions and prophecies about them that were current in the newspapers and public speeches. Be prepared, be prepared, was the cry now. Prussia is silently preparing. Austria is silently preparing. The Prussians assert that we are preparing, and it is not true. It is they who are preparing. You lie. No, it is not true that we are preparing. If they prepare, we must prepare also. If we leave off our preparations, who knows if they will? And so the note of preparation sounded in my ear in all possible variations. But then, what is all this kind of arms for if one is not to take them in hand? I asked, to which my father answered in the old phrase, Sivis bachum, parabellum. We, that is, are only preparing out of precaution. And the other side? With a view of attacking us. But they also are saying that their action is only a precaution against our attack. That is malice. And they say that we are malicious. Oh, they say that only as a pretext, to be better able to make their preparations. So again, in endless circle, a serpent with his tail in his mouth, whose upper and lower end is a double dishonesty. It is only by producing an impression on an enemy who desires war that the method of fighting him, by preparations, can be effective on the side of peace. But two equal powers, both desirous of peace, cannot possibly act on that system unless each is firmly persuaded that the other is deceiving him with hollow phrases. And this persuasion becomes the more firm the more one knows that one is oneself hiding the same views as one charges on one's adversary under similar phrases. It is not only the augurs. The diplomatists also know well enough about each other, what each has in mind behind the public ceremonies and modes of speech. The preparation for war lasted on both sides during the early months of the year. On March 12th, my father burst into my room, radiant with joy. 
Hurrah, he shouted. Good news. Disarmament? I asked, delighted. What for? On the contrary. This is the good news. Yesterday, a great council of war was held. It was really splendid. What an armed power we are masters of. The arrogant Prussians had best take care. We are prepared any hour to take the field with 800,000 men. And Benedek, our best strategist, is to be commander-in-chief with unlimited power. I say this to you, my child, in confidence. Silesia is ours whenever we choose. Oh, God. Oh, God, I groaned. Must this scourge come on us once more? Who, who can be so devoid of conscience as from ambition, from greed of territory? Calm yourself. We are not so ambitious, nor are we greedy of territory. What we desire, that is to say, not I exactly, for to me it would be quite the right thing to get our own Silesia back again, but what the government desire is to keep peace. That they have asserted often enough. And the enormous strength of our active army, as it comes out in the communication yesterday, made to the council of war by the emperor, will inspire all other powers with due respect. Prussia, to begin with, will certainly sing small, and leave off trying to speak in a commanding tone. Thank God. We shall have our say in Schleswig-Holstein, too, and I am sure we shall never endure that the other great power should, by too great an extension of its dominion, conquer itself a preponderance in Germany. That is a matter which touches our honor, our prestige, as the French call it, perhaps our existence but you cannot understand it. The whole affair is a contest for hegemony. The miserable Schleswig is the last thing in it, but this splendid council of war has shown plainly which takes the first place and which is to dictate conditions to the other, the successors of the little electors of Brandenburg or those of the long line of Romano-German emperors. I consider peace as certain, but if the others are going on still, to behave themselves in an impudent and arrogant way, and so to make war inevitable, then our victory is assured, and with it conquests are absolutely incalculable. It were to be wished that it would break out. Oh, yes, and you do wish it too, father, and the whole council of war seems to be with you. Then I should like it better if you said it out plainly. Only do not let us have this falsehood, this assurance to the people and the friends of peace that all this purchasing of weapons and demands for war credits are only for the purpose of your beloved peace. If you are already showing your teeth and closing your fists, do not whisper soft words all the while. If you are trembling with impatience to draw the sword, do not make believe that it is only from the precaution that you are laying your hand on the hilt. So I went on talking for a while, with trembling voice and rising passion, while my father was too much taken aback to answer a word, and at last I ended by bursting into tears. End of section 37。section 38 of Lay Down Your Arms。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 9, Part 4 Now followed a time of fluctuating hopes and fears. Today it was peace is secure. Tomorrow, war inevitable. But persons were of the latter view. Not so much because the situation pointed to a bloody arbitrament, but on this account that if once the word war has been pronounced, there may be a good deal of debating one way and the other, but experience shows that the end always is war. The little invisible egg which contains the casus belli is brooded over so long that at last the monster creeps out of it. Daily did I note in the red volumes the phases of the varying strife, and thus I knew at that time, and still know today, how the eventful War of 66 was prepared, and how it broke out. Without these entries, I might easily find myself in the same ignorance about this precise piece of history as most men are who live where history is being played out. The great majority of the people usually know nothing about why or how a war exists. They only see it coming for a certain time, and then it is there. 
and when it is there people make no more inquiries about the petty interests and differences of opinion which brought it about but are then only busied with the mighty events to which its progress gives birth and when it is over at last what one remembers chiefly are the terrors and losses we have personally experienced the conquests and triumphs that have marked its course but on the political grounds for its origin no one wastes the thought in the many works of history which appear after every campaign under the title of the war of the year so and so historically and strategically described or something to that effect all the old motives for the strife and all the tactical movements of the campaign in question are recounted and any one who takes an interest in such things can pick out the explanation from the literature in which it is wrapped up but in the remembrance of the people such histories certainly do not live even of the feelings of hatred and enthusiasm of embitterment and hope of victory with which the whole population greets the commencement of the war feelings expressed in the common saying this is a very popular war even of these feelings all was wiped out after a year or two on march twenty fourth prussia issued a circular note in which she complained of the threatening preparations of austria then why do we not disarm if we do not wish to threaten why how can we for on march twenty eighth you see it is enacted on the side of prussia that the fortresses in silesia and the two corps d'armee are to be put on a war footing march thirty first thank god austria declares that all the rumors in circulation about her secret preparations are false it has never even entered into her head to attack prussia and on this she founds the demand that prussia shall suspend her measures of warlike preparation Prussia replies that she has not the remotest idea of attacking Austria, but that it has become compulsory, in consequence of the late preparations, to be prepared for attack. And so the responsive song of the two voices goes on without pause. My preparations are defensive. Your preparations are offensive. I must prepare because you are preparing. I am preparing because you prepare. Then let us prepare. Yes. Let us go on preparing. The newspapers give the orchestral accompaniments to this duet. The leading articles revel in what is called conjectural politics. It was all poking up, baiting, bragging, slandering. Historical works on the Seven Years' War were published with the avowed intention of renewing the old enmity. Meanwhile, the exchanges of notes went on. In that of April 7, Austria again officially denied her preparations, but laid stress on an oral expression, said to have been used by Bismarck to Count Caroli, that it would be easy to disregard the Gastein Treaty. Must then the destiny of nations depend on anything that the two noble diplomatists may have said to one another, in more or less good humor about treaties? And what kind of treaties can those be, after all, whose contents remain dependent on the good will of the contracting parties, and are not assured by any higher court or arbitration. Prussia answered this note on April 15, that the charge was untrue, but she was obliged to persist in asserting that Austria had really made preparations on the frontier, and on this she founded the justification of her own preparations. If Austria were in earnest about not attacking, she would first disarm. To this, the Vienna cabinet replied, we will disarm on the 25th of this month if Prussia promises to do the same on the following day. Prussia declared herself ready. What a breathing again. So then, in spite of all threatening signs, peace will be preserved. I noted this change joyfully in the Red Book. But prematurely. New complications arose. Austria declared that she could only disarm in the north, but not in the south at the same time, since she was threatened in that quarter by Italy. To which Prussia replied, If Austria does not disarm altogether, we shall also remain in a state of preparation. Now Italy expressed herself to the effect that it had never, in the faintest way, entered into her mind to attack Austria, but that after this last declaration she was under the necessity of at least making counter-preparations. And so this charming song of defense was now sung by three voices. 
I allowed myself to be again in a measure lulled to sleep by this melody. After such loud and repeated protestations, neither surely can attack, and unless one of them attack, there can be no war. The principle that it is only defensive wars that can be justified has now taken such firm possession of the public conscience that surely no government can any more undertake an invasion of a neighboring country. And if none but mere defensive troops are ranged opposite each other, however threatening their armies are, however determined they may be to defend themselves to the knife, still they cannot actually break the peace. What a delusion! Beside the offensive, there are, I find, many other ways of commencing hostilities. There are demands and interventions regarding some small third country and which have to be resisted as unfair. There are old treaties which are declared to be violated, and for the upholding of which recourse must be had to arms. And finally there is the European equilibrium, which would be endangered by the acquisition of power by one state or the other. And so energetic steps are demanded to prevent such acquisition. It is not avowed, but one of the most violent impulses to fight is the hate which has long been stirred up, and which at last presses on to the death-dealing combat as ardently, and with the same natural force, as long-cherished love to the life-giving embrace. Events now began to tread on each other's heels. Austria declared for the Augustenberg so decisively that Prussia characterized it as a breach of the Gastein Treaty, and discovered in that a plainly hostile intention, the consequence of which was that the preparations on both sides were carried to their highest point. And now Saxony also began to do the same. The excitement was universal, and became more violent every day. War in sight, war in sight, was the announcement of every newspaper and every speech. I felt as if I were at sea and a storm approaching. The most hated and most reviled man in Europe, then, was called Bismarck. On May 7th, an attempt was made to assassinate him. Did Blind, the perpetrator of the deed, wish to avert this storm? And would he have averted it? I received letters from Prussia, from Aunt Cornelia, from which it seemed that in that country the war was anything but desired while with us there prevailed universal enthusiasm for the idea of a war with Prussia, and we looked with pride on our million of picked soldiers. Inward contention reigned there. Bismarck was no less reviled and slandered in his own country than in ours. The report went that the land there would refuse to go out to the fraternal war, and it was said that Queen Augusta threw herself at her husband's feet to pray for peace. Oh, how glad should I have been to kneel at her side, and how gladly would I have hurried off all my sister-women, yes, all, to do the same. It is this and this alone that should be the effort of all women. Peace. Peace. Lay down your arms. If our beautiful empress had also thrown herself at her husband's feet, and with tears and lifted hands had begged for disarmament, who knows? Perhaps she did. Perhaps the emperor himself also wished to preserve peace but the pressure proceeding from the councils and the speakers and the shouting and the writing was such as no one man, even on the throne, could stand against. End of section 38。Section 39 of Lay Down Your Arms。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 9 Part 5 On June 1, Prussia declared to the Assembly of the Bund that she would at once disarm if Austria and Saxony set the example. Against that came a direct accusation from Vienna that Prussia had for a long time been planning, in concert with Italy, an attack on Austria, and on that account, the latter now desired to call the whole Bund to arms, in order to request it to undertake the decision of the case of the duchies. She desired at that same time to call the estates of Holstein to cooperate. Against this declaration, Prussia lodged a protest, inasmuch as it overturned the Gastein Treaty. That being so, the position reverted to the Vienna Treaty, that is, to the common condominium. 
The consequence was that Prussia had also the right to occupy Holstein, as on her side, Austria was permitted to occupy Schleswig, and the Prussians at once moved into Holstein. Goblins withdrew without sword drawn, but under protest. Bismarck had previously said in a circular letter, We have found no disposition at all to meet us at Vienna. On the contrary, expressions have fallen from Austrian statesmen and counselors of the emperor, which have reached the ear of the king from authentic sources, trich trash, and which prove that the ministers wish for war at any price, to wish for public slaughter, what a fearful accusation, partly because they hope for success in the field, partly to get free of internal difficulties, and to eke out their own shattered finances by contributions from Prussia. Statecraft. The press was now completely warlike, and of course, as the patriotic custom is, sure of victory. The possibility of defeat must be entirely left out of view by every loyal subject whom his prince summons to the battle. Numerous leading articles pictured Benedict's entry into Berlin and also the sack of that city by the Croats. Some even recommended to raise the capital of Prussia to the ground. Sack! Raise to the ground! Ride over spurs in blood! These are the expressions which do not indeed any longer express the popular conception in modern times of what is right. But they have, since the days of our school studies of the ancient histories of war, been always clinging to the people, and they have been so often recited in the histories of battles learned by heart, so often written down in our essays in German, that if a man has to write an article on the subject of war in a newspaper, such expressions drop from his pen spontaneously. Contempt for the enemy cannot be too strongly expressed. For the Prussian troops, the Vienna newspapers had no other term than the tailors. Adjutant General Count Grüner expressed himself thus, We shall chase off these Prussians with a flea in their ear. That is the kind of way to make a war quite popular. That sort of thing strengthens the national confidence. June 11. Austria proposes that the Bund shall take action against Prussia's helping herself in Holstein, and mobilize the whole army of the Bund. On June 14th, this proposition is put to vote, and by nine votes to six, accepted. Oh, those three votes! How much grief, and how much shrieks of pain have made groaning echo to those three votes! It is done. The ambassadors have received their dismissal. On the 16th, the Bund requested Austria and Bavaria to go to the assistance of the Hanoverians and Saxons, who were already attacked by Prussia. On the 18th, the Prussian War Manifesto appeared, and at the same time the Manifesto of the Emperor of Austria to his people, and the proclamation of Benedict to his troops. On the 22nd, Prince Frederick Charles published his orders to his army, and thus commenced the war. I copied the four original documents at the time. Here they are. King William says, Austria will not forget that her princes were once the rulers of Germany, and will not regard modern Prussia as a co-partner, but only as a hostile rival. Prussia, it is held, must be opposed in all her efforts, because whatever profits Prussia injures Austria. The old unblessed jealousy has again burst out into a fierce flame. Prussia is to be weakened, destroyed, disinherited. With her, no treaties are to be any longer in force. Wherever we look in Germany, we are surrounded by foes. And their war cry is humiliation for Prussia. Up to the last moment I have sought for and kept open the way to a friendly solution, Austria refused. On the other hand, the Emperor Francis Joseph expresses himself thus. The latest events prove incontestably that Prussia is now setting open force in the place of right. Thus has the most impious of wars, a war of Germans against Germans, become inevitable. The answer for all the misery it will bring on individuals, families, neighbors, and districts, I summon those who have brought it about before the judgment seat of history, and of the eternal and almighty God. The opposite party is always the one that wishes for war. 
the opposite party are always charged with setting up force in the place of right. Why then is it anyhow possible, consistently with public law, that this can happen? An impious war, because it is one of Germans against Germans. Quite true. The point of view is a higher one, which, beyond Prussia and Austria, raises the wider conception of Germany. But take one step more, and we shall reach that still higher unity in the light of which every war, men against men, especially civilized men against civilized, will necessarily appear in impious fratricide, and to summon before the judgment seat of history. What is the use of that? History, as it has been managed hitherto, has never pronounced any other judgment than a worship of success. When anyone comes out of a war as conqueror, the guild of historic scribblers fall in the dust before him, and praise him as the fulfiller of his mission of educative culture, and before the judgment seat of Almighty God. Yes, but is not this he who is represented as the producer of the fights? Is not the same almighty irresistible will equally concerned with the outbreak as with the course of the war? Oh, contradiction on contradiction, and this is what must certainly take place always, whenever the truth is hidden under hypocritical phrases, when an attempt is made to hold equally holy two principles which are mutually destructive, such as war and justice, or national hatred and humanity, or the god of love and the god of battles. And Benedict says, We are standing opposed to a war power which is composed of two halves, line and landwehr. The first is formed exclusively of young fellows who are not accustomed either to fatigue or privation, who have never taken part in any considerable campaign. The second consists of untrustworthy, discontented elements, who would like better to overthrow their own government, which they disliked, than to have to fight us. The enemy has also, in consequence of the long period of peace, not a solitary general who has had the opportunity of educating himself on the field of battle. Veterans of Mincio and Palestro, you will, I think, count it as a special point of honor, acting under your old and tried leaders, not to yield to such antagonists even the smallest advantage. The enemy has for a long time been pluming himself upon his quick-firing needle-gun, but I think, my men, that will not do him much good. We shall most likely leave him no time for that, but charge him home at once, with a bayonet and the butt, as soon as, with God's help, the enemy has been beaten and compelled to retreat, we shall follow on his traces, and you will rest from your toils in the foeman's country and demand, in the amplest measure, those refreshments which a victorious army will have fully merited. Finally, Prince Frederick Charles says, Soldiers, the faith in covenant-breaking Austria has now for some time, without any declaration of war, disregarded the frontiers of Prussia in Upper Silesia, so I might have equally considered myself entitled to cross the Bohemian frontier without any declaration of war. But I have not done so. Today I have forwarded a regular declaration of war, and today we tread the territory of our enemies in order to protect our own country. May our commencement have God's sanction. Is this the same God with whose help Benedict promised to strike down the enemy? Let us rest our cause in his hands, who guides the heart of men, who decides the fate of nations and the result of battles, as it is written in the scriptures. Let your hearts beat for God, and your hands strike the foe. In this war, as you know, Prussia's dearest interests, nay, the continued existence of our beloved Prussia, are in question. The enemy avows in the most open manner to wish to dismember and humiliate her. Shall then the rivers of blood which your fathers and mine poured out under Frederick the Great, and that which we lately poured out in Dupel and Alsen, have been poured out in vain? Never. We will maintain Prussia as she is, and make her stronger and more powerful by victory. We will show ourselves worthy of our fathers. We rely on the God of our fathers that he will be gracious to us, and bless the arms of Prussia. 
So now, forward with our old battle cry, with God, for king and fatherland, long live the king. End of chapter 9. End of section 39. Section 40 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tahare, Tyrol, Austria. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Sotner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 10, Part 1. The Austro-Prussian War, My Husband with the Army, Parting Letters, Dr. Bresse, The Course of the War, Victory of Kutstosa, Austrian Reverses in Bohemia, War Correspondence in the Newspapers, Discussions with My Father, A Long Letter to My Husband. So it had come again, this greatest of all misfortunes, and was greeted by the populace with an accustomed rejoicing. The regiments marched out. In what state were they to return? And wishes for victory and blessings and the shouting of the street boys were their accompaniment. Frederick had been ordered to Bohemia some time previously, even before war had been declared. And just when matters were in such a position as to enable me to entertain a confident hope that the quarrel about the duchess, so unblessed and so contemptible, would be settled amicably. And therefore, this time I was spared the heart-rending leave-taking which proceeds to the setting off of one's beloved directly to the war. When my father brought me the news in triumph, now it is off, I had been already alone for a fortnight, and for quite some time I had quite made my mind up to this news, as a criminal in his cell has made up his mind to the reading of the death sentence. I bowed my head and said nothing. Keep up a good heart, my child. The war will not last long. In a day or two we shall be in Berlin. And as your husband came back from the Schleswig-Holstein, so he will come back from this campaign, but covered with much greener laurels. It may indeed be unpleasant for him, being himself of Prussian extraction, to fight against Prussia. But after he entered into Austrian service, he became one of us, body and soul. Those Prussians, the arrogant windbags, they want to turn us out of the Bund. They will soon repent it. If Schelisha becomes ours again, and if Habsburg's, I stretched out my hand. Father, one request, leave me to myself. He might have imagined that I felt the need of giving my tears full vent, and as he was an enemy to all scenes of emotion, he willingly granted my wish and took his departure. I, however, did not weep. I felt as if a numbing stroke had fallen on my head. Breathing heavily, staring blindly, I sat motionless for some time. Then I went to my writing table, opened the red volume, and made this entry. The sentence of death is pronounced. A hundred thousand men are to be executed. Will Frederick be among them? And I also as a consequence. Who am I that I should not perish like the rest of the hundred thousand? I wish I were dead already. From Frederick I received the same day a few hasty lines. My wife, be of good cheer. Keep your heart up. We have been happy. No one can take that from us. Even if today for us, as for so many others, the decree has gone forth, it is finished. The same thought here as I expressed in my red book about the many others who were sentenced. Today we go to meet the enemy. Perhaps I shall recognize there a few comrades in battle of Dupel and Alsen, possibly my little cousin Godfrey. We are to march on Libenau with the advanced guard of Count Clamgallas. From this time, there will be no more leisure for writing. Do not look for any letters for you. 
at the most if opportunity offers a line as a token that I am alive. But before that, I should like to find one single word which could comprehend in itself the whole of my love that I might write it here for you in case it might be my last. I can find only this word, Martha. You know what that means for me. Conrad Althaus had also to march. He was full of fire and delight in battle, and animated by sufficient hatred of the Prussians to make him start off with pleasure. Still, his parting was hard for him. The marriage license had arrived only two days before the order to march. Oh, Lily, Lily, he cried with pain as he said adieu to his affianced bride. Why did you delay so long to accept me? Who knows now whether I shall come back again? My poor sister was herself full of repentance. Now, for the first time, there sprang a passionate love for him she had slighted so long. When he was gone, she sank into my arms in tears. Oh, why did I not say yes long ago? I should now have been his wife. Then, my poor Lily, the parting would have been all the more painful for you. She shook her head. I well understood what was going on in her mind, perhaps more clearly than she understood herself. To be obligated to part with the love longing still unfulfilled, and perhaps destined to remain forever unfulfilled. To see the cup torn from their lips and possibly shattered before they had a single drought that might well be doubtly torturing. My father, sisters, and Aunt Mary now removed to Grimitz. I was easily persuaded to go there, too, with my little son. As long as Frederick was away, my own hearth seemed extinguished. I could not stay there. It is strange. I felt myself just as much a widow, to have done with life just as thoroughly as if the news of the outbreak of war had been at the same time of the news of Frederick's death. Occasionally in the midst of my dull grief, a brighter thought would break in. He is alive and surely may come back. But along with it, an idea of horror would rise again. He is writhing and agonizing in intolerable pains. He is fainting in a trench. Heavy wagons are driving over his shattered limbs. Flies and worms are crawling over his open wounds, and the people who are clearing the field of battle take the stiffened object lying on the ground for dead, and are shoveling him still alive along with the dead into the damp trench. There he comes to himself, and, with a loud scream, I woke up from such images as these. "'What is the matter with you now, Martha?' said my father in a scolding tone. You will drive yourself out of your senses if you brood in this way and cry out so. Why will you summon up such foolish pictures out of your fancy? It is sinful. I had indeed often given expression aloud to these ideas of mine, and this irritated my father extremely. Sinful, he went on, and improper and nonsensical. Such cases as your excited fancy pictures, do no doubt occur once in a thousand times among the common men. But a staff officer, as your husband is, is not left to lie on the field. Besides, as a general rule, folks should not think about such horrid things. Such conduct involves a kind of sacrilege, a profanation of war, in keeping these pitiful details before one's eyes instead of the sublimity of the whole. One should not think about them. Yes, yes, not think about it, I replied. That is always the custom of mankind in the presence of any human misery. Don't think about it. That is the support of all kinds of barbarity. Our family doctor, Dr. Bresse, was not at this moment at Grimitz. He had voluntarily placed himself at the disposal of the army medical department and had started for the theater of war and the idea occurred to me also whether I should not go, too, as a sick nurse. Yes, if I could have known that I should be in Frederick's neighborhood, be at hand in case he was wounded, I would not have hesitated. But for others? No, 
There my strength broke down. My spirit of sacrifice failed. To see them die, hear the death rattle, want to give help to hundreds begging for help and have no help to give, to bring on myself all this pain, this disgust, this grief, without thereby getting to Frederick, on the contrary, diminishing thereby the chance of meeting him again. For the nurses themselves ran into various kinds of danger to their lives. No, that I would not do. Besides, my father informed me that a private person like myself was altogether inadmissible for nursing in a field hospital, that this office could only be exercised by soldiers of the army medical service, or at the most by sisters of charity. To pluck Sharpie, he said, and prepare bandages for the Patriotic Aid Society. That is the only thing that you ladies can do to help the wounded, and that my daughters ought to do diligently. On that I bestow my blessing. And it was now this occupation that my sisters and I devoted many hours of every day. Rosa and Lily worked with gently compassionate, almost happy-looking faces. As we heaped up the fine threads under our fingers in soft masses, or folded up the strips of linen in beautiful order together, the occupation affected the two girls like an office of charitable nursing. They fancied themselves soothing the burning pains and staunching the bleeding wounds, hearing the sighs of relief and seeing the grateful glances of those on whom they attended. The picture they so formed on the condition of a wounded man was then almost a pleasant one. Inevitable soldiers, who delivered from the dangers of the raging fight, were now stretched on clean, soft beds, and there would be nursed and pampered up to the time of their recovery lulled, for the most part, in a half-unconscious slumber of luxurious fatigue, waking up again occasionally to the pleasant consciousness that their lives were saved, and that they would be able to return to their friends at home and relate to them how they had received their honorable wounds at the battle of... Our father also encouraged them in this innocent way of looking at it. Bravo, bravo, girls! Working again today, you have now again prepared delights for a number of our brave defenders. What a relief it is to get a pad of sharpie like that on a bleeding wound. I can tell you a tale about that. Long ago, when I got that bullet in my leg at Palestro. And so on and so on. I, however, sighed and said nothing. I had heard other histories of wounds than those which my father loved to relate histories which bore about the same relation to the usual veterans' antidotes as the realities of the life of a poor shepherd to do the pastoral pictures of Watteau. The Red Cross I knew through what an impulse of popular sympathy, shocked to the most painful degree, that institution had been called into life. In its time I had followed the debate which took place at Geneva on the subject, and had read the tract by Dunant, which gave the impetus to the whole thing. A heart-rending cry of woe was that tract. The noble patrician of Geneva had hurried to the field of Solferino in order to give what aid he could, and what he found there he had related to the world. Innumerable wounded men who had been lying there for five or six days without any assistance. He would have liked to save them all, but what could he, a single person, do? What could the other few individuals in the face of this mass of misery? He saw men whose lives might have been saved by a drop of water, by a mouthful of bread. He saw men who, still breathing, had to be buried in fearful haste. Then he spoke out, said what had often been admitted, but now found an echo for the first time, that is, that the means for nursing and rescue at the disposal of the army administration had not grown in proportion to the requirements of a battle, and so the Red Cross was founded. Austria had at the time not yet adhered to the Geneva Convention. Why? Why is there resistance opposed to everything that is new, however rich in blessing, and however simple it may be? Because of the law of laziness, the power of holy custom, the idea is very fine, but impracticable, is the saying. 
I often heard my father repeat these arguments of hesitation used by several of the delegates at the Conference of 1863. Impracticable, and even if practicable, yet in many points of view unbecoming. The military authorities could not allow that private action on the field of battle was admissible. In war tactical aims must have the priority over the friendly offices of humanity. And how could this private action be surrounded with proper guarantees against the existence of espionage? And the expenses! Is not war costly enough already? The voluntary nurses would, through their own material wants, fall as a burden on the provision department. Or, if they are to supply themselves in the country occupied, will there not arise a regrettable difficulty for the army administration through the purchase of the articles necessary for the service and the immediate raising of their price? Oh, this official wisdom, so dry, so well instructed, so real, so redolent of prudence, and so unfathomably stupid. End of section 40. Recording by Tahare, Tyrol, Austria. Section 41 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 10, Part 2. The first engagement between our troops in Bohemia and the enemy took place on June 25th at Libano. My father brought us this news with his usual triumphant mien. That is a grand beginning, he said. You can see heaven is on our side. It is significant that the first with whom these windbags had to do were the troops of our celebrated Iron Brigade. You know, of course, the Pashak brigade which defended Königsberg in Silesia so valiantly. They will give them all they want. However, the next news from the seat of war showed that after five hours fighting this brigade, forming part of the advanced guard of Klam Galas, retreated to Podol. Also that Frederick was there, which I did not know, and that in the same night Podol, which had been barricaded, was attacked by General Horn, and the fight renewed by the bright moonlight, which also I heard later. But, continued my father, even more splendid than in the north is the beginning of matters in the south. At Custoza we have gained a victory, children, more glorious than any but one. I've always said it, Lombardy must become ours. Are you not delighted? I regard the war as already decided, for if we get done with the Italians, who do at any rate set a regular trained army in the field against us, we shall not find it hard to deal with these tailors' apprentices. This Landwehr, it is really an impudence, but it is just of a piece with the whole Prussian conceit to take the field against regular armies with such stuff. There are these fellows torn away from the workbench and the writing desk, they're not inured to any hardship, and so it is impossible that they can stand in the field against soldiers, proof against blood and steel. Just look there at what the Wiener Zeitung of June 24th writes in its original correspondence. Surely that is good news. Quote, in Prussian Silesia, cattle plague has broken out, as is understood in a highly threatening form. Unquote. Cattle plague, threatening form, joyful news, I said with a slight shake of the head. Nice things people must take pleasures in in times of war. However, one good thing is that black and yellow posts are erected on the frontiers so that the plague cannot cross. But my father did not hear and went on reading his pleasant intelligence. Quote, Fever is raging among the Prussian troops at Neisse. The unhealthy marshland, the bad treatment, and the miserable shelter of the troops accumulated in the villages around must necessarily produce such results. In Austria, we have no idea of the treatment of the Prussian soldiery. The nobles believe themselves entitled to give any orders they please to the common folk. Six ounces of pork per man is all, and that for men who are not experienced soldiers. End quote. The newspapers are all full of capital news, above all the account of the glorious day of Costoza. You should read these papers, Marta. And I have kept them. 
It is what people should always do, and when a new national quarrel is impending, then read not the most recent papers, but those dating from the former war, and then you will see what weight to attach to all their prophesying and boasting, and even to their accounts and intelligence. That is instructive. Quote, from the seat of war in the north, from headquarters of the Army of the North, they write to us as follows on the subject of the Prussian plan of campaign. According to the latest advices, the Prussian army has shifted its headquarters to eastern Silesia, then follows in the usual tactical style a long narrative of the projected movements and positions contemplated by the enemy, according to which the gentleman who furnished the news must have had a much clearer picture before him than Moltke and Rhun. According to this, it seems to be the object of the Prussians to anticipate in this way our march on Berlin, by their own, in which, however, they will hardly succeed, having regard to the precautions taken, with which, again, our special correspondent is much more familiar than Benedict. Favorable accounts may be looked for from the northern army with the utmost confidence, even if they do not arrive so quickly as the popular longing desires them to do. They will, however, thereby become more decisive and more important. Unquote. The new Frankfurter Zeitung relates a pleasant interlude, the march of Austrian troops of Italian nationality through Munich, as follows. Quote, Among the troops passing through Munich were some battalions of the line. They, like the rest of the troops passing through the Bavarian capital, were entertained in the garden of an inn situated near the station. Any one might convince himself with what delight these Venetians testified to their joy in fighting the foes of Austria. Perhaps, too, any one might have imagined that drunken soldiers would willingly show enthusiasm for anything they were told to be enthusiastic about. In Würzburg, the station was filled by the rank and file of an Austrian regiment of infantry of the line. As far as could be ascertained, the whole consisted of Venetians. They were received with equal friendliness, i.e. they were made equally drunk, and the men could not find words to express with sufficient warmth their joy and their determination to fight against the truce-breakers. Of two parties at war with each other, the other is always the truce-breakers. The hurrahs were endless. Could not this Mr. Anyone, who was thus lounging about the railway station and so edified by the cries of the soldiery, find out that there is nothing so contagious as hurrahing? that a thousand voices shouting together are not the expression of a thousand unanimous sentiments but simply exemplify the working of the natural instincts of imitation Unquote. at Böhmisch trubau field marshal benedek communicated to the army of the north the three bulletins relative to the victory of the army of the south and added the following order of the day Quote, in the name of the army of the north I have dispatched the following telegram to the commander of the Army of the South, Field Marshal Benedek, and the whole Northern Army to the glorious and most illustrious commander-in-chief of the brave Southern Army, with joyful admiration, sends most hearty congratulations on the news of the famous day of Kostotza. The campaign in the South is opened with a new and glorious victory for our arms. Glorious Kostotza shines on the escutcheon of the Imperial Army. Soldiers of the Army of the North, you will receive the news with shouts of joy. You will move to battle with increased enthusiasm, so that we also may very soon inscribe names of fame on that same shield, and announce to the Emperor a victory from the north also, towards which our warlike ardor burns, and which your valor and devotion will conquer, to the cry, Long live the Emperor! Benedict. Unquote. To the foregoing telegram, the following answer from Verona reached Bermisch Trubau. The Army of the South and its commander return their thanks to their beloved ex-commander and his brave army, convinced that we also shall soon have to send our congratulations for a similar victory. Convinced! Convinced! Does not your heart leap up, my children, when you read such things? shouted my father in delight. Can you not rise up to a sufficient height of patriotic feeling to throw into the background your private circumstances at the sight of such triumphs? You, Marta, to forget that you're Frederick, and you, Lily, that your Conrad is exposed to some danger, danger which probably they will come out of safe and sound, and even to succumb to which, a fate which they share with the best sons of our country, would redound to their fame and honour. There is not a soldier who would not willingly die to the call for our country. 
if after a lost battle a man is left lying with shattered limbs on the field i replied and lies there undiscovered for four or five days and nights in indescribable agonies from thirst and hunger rotting while still alive and so perishes knowing all the while that his death has not helped his country you talk of one bit but has brought his loved ones to despair i should like to know whether all this time he's gladly dying to the call you speak of you are outrageous and besides you speak in such shrill tones quite unbecoming for a lady oh yes the true word the naked reality is outrageous is shameless only the phrase which by thousandfold repetition has become sanctioned is proper but i assure you father that this unnatural joy in dying which is thus exacted from all men however heroic it may seem to him who uses the phrase sounds to me like a spoken death knell End of section 41. Read by Sandra. Section 42 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Berta von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 10, Part 3 Among Frederick's papers many years later, I found a letter which in those days I sent to the seat of war. This letter shows as clearly as possible with what feelings I was filled at that time. Gromitz, June 28, 1866 Dear one, I am not alive. Fancy that in the next room people are debating whether I am to be executed in the next few days or no, while I have to wait outside for their decision. During this period of waiting I do indeed breathe, but can I call it living? The next room in which the question is to be decided is called Bohemia. But no, my love, the picture is hardly yet correct, for if it were only a matter of my life or death, the anxiety would not be so great, for my anxiety concerns a far dearer life than my own, and my fear is concerned even with something still worse than your death, with your possible agony in dying. Oh, that all this were over, over! Oh, that our victories would come in speedy succession, not for the sake of the victory, but of the end. Will these lines ever reach you, and where, and how? Whether after a hot day's fight, or in camp, or perhaps in hospital? In any case, it will do you good to get news of your dear ones. If I can write nothing but what is mournful, and what else but what is mournful can be felt during this time, when the sun is darkened by the great black pall hoisted up in the name of our country, to fall down on the country's sons? still my lines will bring you refreshment for i am dear to you frederick i know how dear and my written word rejoices and moves you as would a soft touch from my hand i am near you frederick be assured of that with every thought with every breath by day and night here in my own circle i move and act and speak mechanically my innermost self that belongs to you that never leaves you for a moment only my boy reminds me that the world still contains for me a thing which is not you the good little fellow if you knew how he asks and cares for you we two talk together of nothing but papa he knows well like a boy of sharp perceptions what object fills my heart and however little he may be you know that he's already in a sense a friend to his mother i even begin to speak with him as with a reasonable being and for this he's thankful i on my part am thankful to him for the love he shows to you it is so seldom that children get on well with their step-parents it's true there is nothing of the stepfather about you you could not be more tender and kind to a child of your own my own tender and kind one yes kindness great soft and mild is the foundation of your being and what does the poet say Quote, as heaven is vaulted by one single great sapphire so the greatness of character of a noble man is formed of one single virtue kindness Unquote. In other words, I love you, Frederick. That is still always the refrain of all my thoughts about you and your qualities. I love you so confidingly with such assurance I rest in you, Frederick, warm and soft. That is when I have you, of course. Now when you are torn away from me, my repose is naturally gone. Oh, if the storm were only over, over, if you were only in Berlin to dictate terms of peace to King William for my father is firmly convinced that this will be the end of the campaign and from all that is heard and read here i also most believe him as soon as with god's help the enemy is struck down 
so runs benedict's proclamation we will follow on his track and you shall repose in the country of the foe and enjoy those refreshments and so on what then are these refreshments at this day no general dare say openly and without circumlocution you shall plunder burn murder and ravish as they used to say in the middle ages to excite their hordes now at the most all that could be kept before their eyes as a reward would be the free distribution of beer and sausages but that would be a little tame and so it was put figuratively those refreshments and so on every one may make out of that what he pleases the principle that in the country of the foe is to be found the reward of war is still maintained in military language and how will you feel in the foe man's land which is really your own ancestral country where your friends and your cousins are living will you refresh yourself by laying aunt cornelia's pretty villa even with the ground enemy's country that is really a fossilized conception of those times when war was openly what its raison d'etre proclaims it a piracy and when the enemy's country attracted the combatant as a land of prey which promised him a recompense i am talking now with you as i used in those happy hours when you were at my side and when after the reading of some book of the progressive school we used to philosophize with each other about the contradictions of our times so intimately so entirely understanding and supplementing each other in my circle there is no one no one with whom i could talk about matters of that kind dr bresser would have been the only one with whom ideas condemnatory of war could be exchanged and he also is now gone himself drawn into this horrible war but with the purpose of healing wounds not inflicting them another contradiction really this humanity in war an essential contradiction it is about the same as enlightenment in faith one thing or the other but humanity and war reason and dogma that will not do the outright burning hatred of the enemy coupled with an entire contempt for human life that is the vital nerve of war exactly as the unquestioning suppression of reason is the fundamental condition of faith but we live in a time of compromise the old institutions and the new ideas are working with equal power and so people who do not wish to break entirely with the old and who cannot entirely comprehend the new make an attempt to fuse the two together and it is this which generates this mendacious inconsistent contradictory half-and-half -half system under which spirits who thirst for truth accuracy and completeness so groan and suffer ah why do i compose all this treatise you will at the present time be scarcely disposed for such generalizations as you used to be in our happy hours of chat you hear raging round you a horrible reality with which you have to reckon how much better would it be if you could accept it with the simple assurance of ancient times when the warlike life was to the soldier a proud pleasure and a delight better also would it be if i could write to you as other wives do letters full of wishes for prosperity confident promises of victory and incitements to your courage girls of the present day are educated in patriotism so that at the proper time they may cry to their husbands go on die for your country that's the most glorious of deaths or come back with victory and then we will reward you with our loves in the meantime we'll pray for you the god of battles who protects our army he will hear our prayers day and night our intercession is rising up to heaven and we're sure to take his favour by storm you will come back crowned with fame we will never tremble for an instant for we're worthy comrades of your valour no no the mothers of your sons must be no cowards if they would raise up a new race of heroes and even if we have to give up what is dearest to us for king and country no sacrifice is too great that would be the right letter for a soldier's wife would it not but not such a letter as you would wish to read from your wife not from the partner of your thoughts from her who shares your disgust at the old blind delusion of mankind oh such disgust so bitter so painful that i cannot describe it to you when i picture to myself these two armies composed of individuals with the gift of reason and for the most part kind and gentle men how they are rushing on each other to annihilate each other desolating at the same time the unfortunate land in which they cast aside the villages they have taken like cards in their game of murder when i picture all this i feel inclined to shriek out do bethink you do stop and out of the hundred thousand ninety thousand individuals would certainly be glad to stop but the mass is compelled to go on in its fury
But enough. You will prefer to hear the accounts and the news from home. Well, then, we are all well. My father is constantly in the highest state of excitement over present events. The victory of Custoza fills him with radiant pride. He behaves as if he'd won it himself. In any case, he regards the splendor of that day as so bright that the reflection which falls on him as an Austrian and a general makes him completely happy. Lori, too, whose husband, as you know, is with the Army of the South, writes me a letter of triumph about this same Custoza. Do you recollect, Frederick, how jealous I was for a quarter of an hour about this same good Lori, and how I came out after that attack with stronger love and stronger trust in you? Oh, if only you had betrayed me then, if only you had sometimes a little ill-treated me, then I should perhaps bear your absence now more easily. But to know that such a husband is in the storm of bullets, let me go on with my news. Lori has offered to spend the remainder of her grass widowhood in grumets along with her little Beatrix. I could not say no, yet frankly any society is at the present time disagreeable to me. I want to be alone, alone with my longing for you, the extent of which no one but you can measure. Next week Otto begins his vacation. He laments in every letter that the war should have begun before instead of after his admission to an officer's rank. He hopes to God that the peace will not break out before he leaves the academy. That word break out is not perhaps the one he used, but in any case it expresses his meaning, for peace appears to him to be a threatening calamity. It is indeed the way they are brought up. As long as there are wars, men must be brought up to be war-loving soldiers, and so long as there are war-loving soldiers, there must be war. Is that our eternal inevitable circle? No, God be thanked, for that love, in spite of all school training, is constantly diminishing. We found the proof of this diminution in Henry Thomas Buckle. Do you not recollect? But I don't want any printed proof. A glance into your heart, your noble human heart, my Frederick, is enough to demonstrate this to me. Let me get on with my news. From all our landed connections and acquaintances in Bohemia, we get on all sides epistles of lamentation. The march of the troops through the country, even if they are marching to victory, devastates it and sucks everything out of it. And how, if once the enemy should advance into it, if the fight should be played out in their neighborhood, there where their possessions, their chateaux and fields are situated, all is ready for flight, all their effects packed up and their treasures buried. Adieu to our happy tours among the Bohemian spas. Adieu to the pleasant visits to the country houses. Adieu to the brilliant autumn hunting parties, and in any case adieu to the usual revenues from farms and businesses. The harvests are trampled down, the factories, if they're not battered down and burned, are robbed of their laborers. It is indeed a real misfortune, they write, that we live exactly on the borderland, and it is a second misfortune that Benedict did not assume the offensive with more vigor, so as to fight out the war in Prussia. Perhaps it might also be called a misfortune that the whole political quarrel could not have been adjusted before a court of arbitration, but that the murderous devastation must be carried out on Bohemian or Silesian soil, for in Silesia also, if we believe the accounts of trustworthy travellers, there are really men and fields and crops. But that idea does not occur to anybody. My little Rudolf is sitting at my feet while I'm writing. He sends you a kiss and his love to our dear Puxl. We both miss him much, the good merry little dog, but on the other hand he would have missed his master sadly, and he will be a diversion and a companion to you. Give Puxel both our loves. I shake his paw, and Rudy kisses his dear black snout. And now, goodbye for today, my all on earth. End of chapter 10 Read by Sandra in Montreal, 2021「Sketches from the Seat of War, showing its realities as viewed by a soldier who abhors war. Death of poor Paxel.
My husband avows his determination never to serve in another campaign. Never was such a thing heard of. Defeat after defeat. First the village of Podol, barricaded by clam gallows, carried by storm, taken in the night by moonlight and by the light of the conflagration. Then Gitchin conquered. The needle gun, the cursed needle gun, mows our troops down by whole ranks at a time. The two great army corps of the enemy, that commanded by the crown prince and that under Prince Frukal, have joined and are pressing forward against Münchengratz. Thus sounded the terrible news, and my father communicated it with as great a degree of lamentation as he had shown joy in telling us the victorious news from Kostotza. But his confidence was not yet shaken. Let them come, all of them, into our Bohemia and be annihilated there, to the last man. There is no escape there, no retreat for them. We hem them in, we encircle them, and the enraged country folks themselves will give them the finishing stroke. It is not altogether so advantageous as you might suppose to operate in an enemy's country, for in that case you have not only the army, but the whole population against you. The people bore boiling water and oil on the Prussians from the windows of the houses at... I uttered a low sound of disgust. What would you have, said my father, shrugging his shoulders. It is horrible, I grant, but it is war. Then at least never assert that war ennobles men. Confess that it unmans them, makes them tigers, devils. Boiling oil, ugh! Self-defense, which is enjoined on us in righteous retribution, my dear Martha. Do you think that our people like the bullets of their needle guns? Our brave fellows have to be exposed, like defenseless cattle in a slaughterhouse, to this murderous weapon. But we are too numerous, too disciplined, too warlike, not to conquer these tailors for all that. At the beginning, one or two failures have taken place. Then I admit, Benedek ought to have crossed the Prussian frontier at once. I have my doubts whether this choice of a general was quite a happy one. If it had been determined to send Archduke Albert there and give Benedek the army of the south, but I will not despond too soon. Up to the present, there have really been only some preliminary engagements which have been magnified by the Prussians into great victories. The decisive battles are still to come. We are now concentrating on Königgrätz. There we shall await the enemy, a hundred thousand strong. There our northern Kostotza will be fought. Frederick was to fight there too. His last letter arrived that morning brought the news. We are bound for Königgrätz. Up to this time I had had tidings regularly. Though in his first letter he had prepared me for his being able only to write little, yet Frederick had made use of every opportunity to send me a word or two. In pencil, on horseback, in his tent, in a hasty scrawl, only legible by me, he would write on pages torn out of his notebook letters destined for me. Some he found opportunities for sending, and some did not come into my hands until the campaign was over. I have kept these memorials up to the present hour. They are not careful, polished descriptions of the war, such as the war correspondents of the papers offer in their despatches, or the historians of the war in their publications. No sketches of battles worked up with all the technicalities of strategical details, no battle pictures heightened with rhetorical flights, in which the narrator is always occupied in letting his own imperturbability, heroism, and patriotic enthusiasm shine out. Frederick's sketches are nothing of this sort, I know, but what they are I need not decide. Here are some of them. In Bivouac. Outside the tent it is indeed a mild, splendid summer night, the heavens so great and so indifferent, full of shining stars. The men are lying on the earth, exhausted by their long, fatiguing marches. Only for us, staff officers, have one or two tents been pitched. In mine there are three field beds. My two comrades are asleep. I am sitting at the table, on which are the empty grog glasses and a lighted candle. It is by the feeble flickering light of this, a draft of wind comes in through the open flap, that I am writing to you, my beloved wife. I have left my bed to Puxel. He was so tired, the poor fellow. I am almost sorry I brought him with me. He too is, as our men say the Prussian landwehr are, not used to the hardships and privations of a campaign. Now he is snoring sweetly and happily, is dreaming, I fancy, very likely of his friend and patron, Rudolf, Count Dotsky. And I am dreaming of you, Martha. 
I am silly, I know, but I see your dear form as like you as the image of a dream sitting in yonder corner of the tent on a camp stool. What longing seizes me to go thither and lay my head on your bosom? But I do not do so, because I know that then the image would disappear. I have just been out for an instant. The stars are shining as indifferently as ever. On the ground a few shadows are gliding, those of stragglers. Many, many men are left behind on the road. These have now slipped in here, drawn on by the light of our watch-fires. But not all. Some are still lying in some far-off ditch or cornfield. What a heat it was during this forced march! The sun flamed as if it would boil your brains, add to that the heavy knapsack and the heavy musket on their galled shoulders, and yet no one murmured. But a few fell out and could not get up again. Two or three succumbed to sunstroke and fell dead at once. Their bodies were put on an ambulance wagon. This June night, however illuminated by moon and stars, and however warm it may be, is still disenchanted. There are no nightingales or chirping crickets to be heard, no scents of rose and jasmine to be breathed. All the sweet sounds are drowned by the noise of snorting or neighing horses, by the men's voices and the tramp of the sentry's tread, all sweet scents overpowered by the smell of the harness and other barrack odors. Still all that is nothing, for now that you do not hear the ravens croaking over their feast, you do not smell gunpowder, blood and corruption. All that is coming. At majorum patriae gloriam. It is worth noting how blind men are. In looking at the funeral piles which have been lighted for the greater glory of God in old times, they break out into curses over such blind, cruel, senseless fanaticism, but are full of admiration for the corpse-strewn battlefields of the present day. The torture chambers of the dark Middle Ages excite their horror, but they feel pride over their own arsenals. The light is burning down. The form in that corner has disappeared. I will also lie down to rest, beside our good Paxel. End of section 43section 44 of lay down your arms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by katerina lay down your arms by bertha von suttner translated by timothy holmes chapter 11 part 2 up on a hill, amidst a group of generals and high officers with a field glass at his eye, that is the situation in a war which produces the greatest aesthetic effect. The gentlemen who paint battle pieces and make illustrations for the journals know this too. Generals on a hill reconnoitring with their glasses are represented again and again, and just as often a leader pressing forward at the head of his troops on a horse, as white and light stepping as possible stretching his arm out towards a point in the background all in smoke and turning the head towards those rushing on after him plainly shouting follow me lads from my station on this hill one sees really a piece of battle poetry the picture is magnificent and sufficiently distant to have the effect of a real picture without the details the horrors and disgusts of the reality no gushing blood no death rattles nothing but elevated and magnificent effects of line and color those far extended ranks of the army corps winding on that unbounded procession of infantry regiments divisions of cavalry and batteries of artillery then the ammunition train the requisitioned country wagons the pack horses and bringing up the rear the baggage the picture comes out still more imposing if in the white country stretched out beneath the hill you can see not merely movement of one, but the meeting of two armies. Then how the flashing sword blades, the waving flags, the horses rearing up like foaming waves mingle with each other, while amongst them clouds of smoke arise, forming themselves in places into thick veils which hide all the picture, and when they lift show groups of fighters. Then, as accompaniment, the noise of shots rolling through the mountains, every stroke of which thunders the word, death death, death, through the air. Yes, that sort of thing may well inspire battle lays. And for the composition, too, of those contributions to the history of the period which are to be published after the conclusion of the campaign, the station on the hilltop offers favorable opportunities. There, at any rate, 
the narrative can be made out with some exactness. The X Division met the enemy at N, drove him back, reached the main bulk of the army. Strong forces of the enemy showed themselves on the left flank, and so on and so on. But one who is not on the hill, peering through his field glass, one who is himself taking part in the action, he can never, never relate the progress of a battle in a way worthy of belief. He sees, feels, and thinks of only what is close to him. All the rest of his narrative is from intuition, for which he avails himself of the old formulas. Look, Tilling, one of the generals said to me, as I was standing near him on the hill. Is not that striking? A grand army, is it not? Why, what are you thinking about? What was I thinking about, my Martha? About you. But to my superior officer I could not say so. So I answered with all due deference some untruth. All due deference and truth have besides little to do with each other. The latter is a very proud fellow and turns with contempt from all servility. The village is ours. No, it's the enemy's. Now ours again, and yet once more the enemy's. But it is no longer a village, but a smoking mass of the ruins of houses. The inhabitants, was it not really their village? Had left it previously and were away, luckily for them, for the fighting in an inhabited place is something really fearful, for then the bullets from friend and foe fall into the midst of the rooms and kill women and children. One family, however, had remained behind in the place which yesterday we took, lost, retook, and lost again, namely an old married couple and their daughter, the latter in childbed. The husband is serving in our regiment. He told me the story as we were nearing the village. There, Colonel, in that house with the red roof is living my wife with her old parents. They have not been able to get away, poor creatures. My wife may be confined any moment, and the old folks are half crippled. For God's sake, Colonel, order me there. Poor devil! He got there just in time to see the mother and child die. A shell had exploded under their bed. What has happened to the old folks I do not know. They are probably buried under the ruins. The house was one of the first set on fire by the cannonade. Fighting in the open country is terrible enough, but fighting amongst human dwellings is ten times more cruel. Crashing timber, bursting flames, stifling smoke, cattle run mad with fear, every wall a fortress or a barricade, every window a shot hole. I saw a breastwork there which was formed of corpses. The defenders had heaped up all the slain that were lying near, in order from that rampart to fire over on to their assailants. I shall surely never forget that wall in all my life. The man who formed one of its bricks, pent in among the other corpse bricks, was still alive and was moving his arm. Still alive. That is a condition occurring in a war with a thousand differences which conceals sufferings incalculable. If there were any angel of mercy hovering over the battlefield, he would have enough to do in giving the poor creatures, men and beasts, who are still alive, their coup de grace. Today we had a little cavalry skirmish in the open field. A Prussian cavalry regiment came forward at a trot, deployed into line, and then, with their horses well in hand and their sabers above their heads, rode down on us at a hand gallop. We did not wait for their attack, but galloped out against the enemy. No shots were exchanged. When a few paces from each other both ranks burst out into a thundering hurrah, shouting intoxicates, the Indians and Zulus know that even better than we do, and so we rushed on each other, horse to horse, knee to knee. The sabers whistled in the air and came down on the men's heads. Soon all were huddled together too close to use their weapons. Then they struggled breast to breast, and the horses, getting wild and frightened, snorted and plunged, reared up and struck about them. I too was on the ground once, and saw, no very pleasant sight, a horse's hoof striking out within a hair's breadth of my temples. Another day of marching, with one or two skirmishes. I have experienced a great sorrow. Such a mournful picture accompanies me. Among the many pictures of woe which are all around me, this ought not so to strike me, ought not to give me such pain. But I cannot help it. It touches me nearly, and I cannot shake it off. Puxel, our poor, happy, good little dog. Oh, if I had only left him at home with his little master, Rudolph. 
He was running after us, as usual. Suddenly he gave a shriek of pain. The splinter of a shell had torn off his foreleg. He could not come after us, so is left behind and is still alive. Between twenty-four and forty-eight hours have passed, and he is still alive. Oh, master, my good master, his cries seemed to say. Do not leave poor Puxel here. His heart will break. And what especially pains me is the thought that the faithful dying creature must misunderstand me. For he saw that I turned round, that I must have understood his cry for help, and yet was so cold and so cruel as to leave him there. Poor Puxel could not understand that a regiment advancing to the attack, out of whose ranks comrades are falling and are left on the ground, cannot be ordered to halt for the sake of a dog who has been hit. He has no conception of the higher duty which I had to obey, and so the poor true heart of the dog is complaining of my unmercifulness. Only think of troubling oneself about such trumpery in the midst of the great events and gigantic misfortune which fill the present time. That is what many would say, with a shrug of the shoulders. But not you, Martha, not you. I know that a tear will come into your eyes for our poor Puxel. End of section 44section 45 of lay down your arms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by katerina lay down your arms by bertha von suttner translated by timothy holmes chapter 11 part 3 what is happening there the execution party is drawn out has a spy been caught one seventeen this time there they come in four ranks each one of four men surrounded by a square of soldiers the condemned men step out with their heads down behind comes a cart with a corpse in it and bound to the corpse the dead man's son a boy of twelve also condemned i could not look on at the execution and withdrew but i heard the firing a cloud of smoke rose from behind the walls all were dead the boy included at last a comfortable night's lodging in a little town the poor little nest provisions which were to have served the people for months we have taken on requisition requisition well it is one good thing to have a pretty recognized name for a thing however i was at least glad to have got a good night's lodging and a good night's food and let me tell you a story i was just going to lie down in bed when my orderly announced that a man of my regiment was there and earnestly begged for admission as he had something for me well let him come in and the man entered and before he went out i had rewarded him handsomely shaken him by both hands and promised to look after his wife and children for what he brought me the fine fellow had given me the greatest pleasure and had freed me from a pain under which i had been suffering for the last thirty-six hours it was my puxel injured it is true honorably wounded but still alive and so happy to be with his master by whose behavior he must certainly have seen that he had been wrong in charging him with want of fondness for him ah that was indeed a scene of reunion first of all a drink of water how good it was he interrupted his greedy drinking ten times to bark out his joy to me then I bound up the stump of his leg for him, set before him a tasty supper of meat and cheese, and put him to sleep on my bed. We both slept well. In the morning when I woke, he licked my hand again and again in token of thanks. Then he stretched out his poor little leg, breathed deep, and was no more. Poor Puxel, it is better so. What is all I have seen today? If I shut my eyes, what has passed before them comes with terrible distinctness in my memory. Nothing but pain and pictures of horror, you will say. Why, then, do other men bring such fresh, such joyful images away with them from war? Ah, yes, these others close their eyes to the pain and the horror. They say nothing about them. If they write, or if they narrate, they give themselves no trouble to paint the experiences after nature, but they occupy themselves in imitating descriptions which they have read and which they take as models and in bringing out those impressions which are considered heroic if they occasionally tell also of scenes of destruction 
which contain in themselves the bitterest pain and the bitterest terror, nothing of either is to be discovered in their tone. On the contrary, the more terrible, the more indifferent are they, the more horrible, the more easy. Disapprobation, anger, excitement? Nothing of all this. Well, perhaps of this, a slight breath of sentimental pity, a few sighs of compassion, but their heads are soon in the air again. The heart to God and the hand against the foe. Hua, tra ra ra. Now look at two of the pictures which impressed themselves on me. Steep, rocky heights, jägers nimble as cats climbing up them. The object was to take the heights from the top of which the enemy was firing. What I see are the forms of the assailants who are climbing up, and some of them who are hit by the enemy's shot, suddenly stretch both arms out, let their muskets fall, and with their heads falling backwards drop off the height, step by step, from one rocky point to another, smashing their limbs into pieces. I see a horseman at some distance obliquely behind me, at whose side a shell burst. His horse swerved aside and came against the tail of mine, then shot past me. The man sat still in the saddle, but a fragment of the shell had ripped his belly open and torn all the intestines out. The upper part of his body was held onto the lower only by the spine. From the ribs to the thighs nothing but one great bleeding cavity. A short distance further he fell to the ground, with one foot still clinging in the stirrup, and the galloping horse dragging him on over the stony soil. An artillery division is sticking fast in a part of the road which is steep and soaked with rain. The guns are sinking deeper than their wheels in the morass. It is only with the most extreme exertion, dripping with sweat and animated by the most unmerciful flogging, that the horses can get forward. One, however, dead beat before, now can do no more. Thumping him does no good. He is quite willing, but he cannot. He literally can not. Cannot that man see this, whose blows are raining down on the poor beast's head? If the cruel brute had been the driver of a wagon in the service of some builder, any peace officer, even I myself, would have had him arrested. But this gunner, who has to get his death-laden carriage forward anyhow, is only doing his duty. The horse, however, cannot know this. The tortured, well-meaning, noble creature, who has exerted himself to the utmost limit of his vital power, what must he think in his inmost heart of such hard-heartedness and such want of sense? Think as animals do think, not in words and conceptions, but in feelings, and feelings which are all the more lively for wanting expression. There is but one expression for it, the shriek of pain. And he did shriek, that poor horse, till at last he sank down, a shriek so long drawn and so resounding that it still rings in my ear, that it haunted me in my dream the next night. A horrible dream in other respects. I thought that I was... How can I ever tell you the story? Dreams are so senseless that language conformable to sense is hardly adapted to their reproduction. That I was the sense of pain in such an artillery horse. No, not one, but in a one hundred thousand, for in my dream I had quickly summed up the number of horses slaughtered in one campaign, and thus this pain multiplied its effect at once a hundred thousandfold. The men know at least by their lives I exposed to danger. They know whither they are going, and what for, but we poor unfortunates know nothing. All around us is night and horror. The men seem to go with pleasure to meet their foes, but we are surrounded by foes, our own masters, whom we would love so truly, to serve whom we spend our last energies. They rain blows on us, they leave us lying helpless, and all that we have to suffer besides, the fear that makes the sweat of agony run from our whole body, the thirst, for we too suffer from fever. Oh, that thirst! The thirst of us poor, bleeding, maltreated one hundred thousand horses. Here I woke and clutched the water bottle, I was myself suffering from burning, feverish thirst. Another street fight in the little town of Saar. To the noise of the battle cries and the shots is joined the crashing of timber and the falling of walls. A shell burst in one of the houses, and the pressure of the air, caused by its explosion, was so powerful that several soldiers were wounded by the ruins of the house which were borne along by the air. A window flew over my head, with the window sash still in it. 
The chimney stack stumbled down, the plaster crumbled into dust and filled the air with a stifling cloud that stung one's eyes. From one lane to another, how the hoofs rang on the jagged pavements, the fight wound on and reached the marketplace. In the middle of the square stands a high pillar of the Virgin. The Mother of God holds her child in one arm and stretches the other out in blessing. Here the fight was prolonged, man to man. They were hacking at me. I was laying about me on all sides. Whether I hit one or more of them I know not. In such moments one does not retain much perception. Still two cases are photographed on my soul, and I fear that the marketplace at Tsar will always remain burnt into my memory. A Prussian dragoon, strong as Goliath, tore one of our officers, a pretty dandified lieutenant, how many girls are perhaps mad after him, out of his saddle and split his skull at the feet of the virgin's pillar. The gentle saint looked on unmoved. Another of the enemy's dragoons, a Goliath too, seized just before me almost, my right-hand man, and bent him backwards in his saddle so powerfully that he broke his back. I myself heard it crack. To this also the Madonna gave her stony blessing. From a height today, the field glass of the staff officer commanded once more a scene rich in changes. There was, for instance, the collapse of a bridge as a train of wagons was moving across it. Did the ladder contain wounded? I do not know. I could not ascertain. I only saw that the whole train, wagons, horses, and men, sank into the deep and rushing stream and there disappeared. The event was a fortunate one, since the train of wagons belonged to the blacks. In the game now being played, I designate us as the white side. The bridge did not collapse by accident. The whites, knowing that their adversaries had to cross it, had sawn through the pillars. A dexterous stroke, that. A second prospect, on the other hand, which one might view from the same height, represented one of the follies of the whites. Our Kevenhuller regiment was directed into a morass, from which it could not extricate itself, and they were all, except a few, shot down. The wounded fell into the morass, and there had to sink and be smothered, their mouths, nose, and eyes filled with mud, so that they could not even utter a cry. Oh, yes! It must be admitted to have been an error of the man who commanded the troops to go there, but to err is human, and the loss is not a great one. Might represent a pawn taken, a speedy, lucky move of castle or queen, and all is right again. The mud, it is true, remains in the mouth and eyes of the fallen, but that is a very secondary consideration. What is reprehensible is the tactical error, that has to be wiped out by some later fortunate combination, and then the leader implicated in it may still be decorated with grand orders and promotions. That lately our 18th battalion of Jaegers in a night battle was firing for several hours on our King of Prussia regiment, and the error was not found out until break of day, that a part of the Guali regiment was let into a pond. These are little oversights, such as may happen even to the best of players in the heat of a game. It is decided. If I come back from this campaign... I quit the service. Setting everything else aside, if one has learned to regard anything with such horrors as war produces in me, it would be a continual lie to keep in the service of that thing. Even before this I went, as you know, to battle unwillingly and with a judgment condemnatory of it, but now this unwillingness has so increased, this condemnation has become so strengthened that all the reasons which before determined me to persevere with my profession have ceased to operate. The sentiments derived from my youthful training, and perhaps also, to some extent, inherited, which still pleaded with me in favor of the military life, have now quite departed from me in the course of the horrors I have just experienced. I do not know whether it is the studies which I undertook in common with you, and from which I discovered that my contempt for war is not an isolated feeling, but is shared by the best spirits of the age, or whether it is the conversations I have had with you, in which I have strengthened myself in my views by their free expression and your concurrence in them. In one word, my former vague, half-smothered feeling has changed into a clear conviction, a conviction which makes it from this time impossible to do service to the war god. It is the same kind of change as comes to many people in matters of belief. 
First, they are somewhat skeptical and indifferent. Still, they can assist at the business of the temple with a certain sense of reverence. But when once all mysticism is put aside, when they rise to the perception that the ceremony which they are attending rests on folly, and sometimes on cruel folly, as in the case of the religious death sacrifices, then they will no longer kneel beside the other befooled folks, no longer deceive themselves and the world by entering the now desecrated temple. This is the process which has gone on with me in relation to the cruel worship of Mars, the mysterious, supernatural, or inspiring feeling which the appearance of this deity generally awakens in man, and which in former times obscured my senses also, has now entirely passed away for me. The liturgy of the bulletins and the ritual of heroic phraseology no longer appear to me as divine revelation. The mighty organ voice of the canon, the incense smoke of the powder, have no charm more for me. I assist at the terrible worship perfectly devoid of belief or reverence, and can now see nothing in it except the tortures of the victims, hear nothing but their wailing death cries. And thence comes it that these pages which I am filling with my impressions of war, contain nothing except pain seen with pain. End of section 45。Section 46 of Lay Down Your Arms。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 12, Part 1. Ruin of the Austrian cause at Königgratz. Dr. Bresser at the seat of war. I resolve to join him and seek for my husband. Aspect of the railway station and line in a time of defeat. The journey. The regimental surgeon's experiences of the horrors of war. I arrive at the seat of war and meet Dr. Bresser and Frau Simon. Night journey to Horonewas. The horrors I saw there. I sink exhausted under them and am carried back by Dr. Bresser to Vienna. My father takes me home, and there I am joined by my husband, who had been wounded. The Battle of Kunigretz had been fought another defeat, and this time as it seemed a decisive one. My father communicated the news to us in such a tone as he would have used in announcing the end of the world. And no letter, no telegram from Frederick. Was he wounded? Dead? Conrad gave his fiancée news of himself. He was untouched. The lists of the slain had not yet arrived, it was only known that there were 40,000 killed and wounded at Konigratz, and the latest news I had had ran, We are moving today to Konigratz. On the third day still, not a line. I wept and wept for hours. I could weep just because my grief was not quite hopeless. If I had known that all was over, there would have been no tears for my load of woe. My father, too, was deeply depressed, and my brother Otto was mad with thirst for revenge. It was announced that corps of volunteers were to be formed in Vienna. He wanted to join them. It was further announced that Benedek was to be removed from his command, and the victorious Archduke Albert summoned to the north to take his place. And then perhaps there might yet be a rally. The overweening enemy who wanted altogether to annihilate us might be beaten back, as he would be caught on his march to Vienna. Fear, rage, pain filled all minds. All pronounced the name of the Prussians, as if they were all that is detestable. My only thought was Frederick, and no news, none. A few days afterwards arrived a letter from Dr. Bresser. He was busy in the neighborhood of the battlefield in giving what assistance he could. The need, he wrote, was without limit, mocking all power of imagination. He had joined a Saxon physician, Dr. Brower, who had been dispatched by his government to give them information from actual inspection on the state of affairs. In two days, a Saxon lady was to arrive, Frau Simon, a new Miss Nightingale, 
who, since the outbreak of the war, had been busy in the hospitals of Dresden, and who had offered to undertake the journey to the fields of battle in Bohemia in order to render assistance in the hospitals adjacent. Dr. Brower and Dr. Bresser with him were going, on a day named, at seven in the evening, to Konigenhof, the nearest station to Konigratz, to which the railway was still open, to await the courageous lady there. Bresser begged us to send, if possible, a quantity of bandages and such things to that station, so that he might receive them there himself. I had hardly read this letter before my resolution was taken. I would take the box of bandages myself. In one of those hospitals which Frau Simon was to visit, possibly lay Frederick, I would join her and find the dear sufferer, nurse him, save him. The idea seized me with compelling force, so compelling that I held it to be a magnetic influence from afar, derived from the longing wish with which the dear one was calling for me. Without telling any one in my family of my purpose, for I should only have encountered resistance on all hands, I embarked on the journey a few hours after the receipt of Brester's letter. I had given out that I wanted to look out the things which the doctor required in Vienna, and send them off myself, and so I managed to get away from Grimitz without difficulty. From Vienna I meant to write to my father, I am off to the seat of war. It is true that doubts arose in me, my incapacity and want of experience, my horror of wounds, blood, and death, but I chased these doubts away. What I was doing, I was compelled to do. The gaze of my husband was fixed on me, in prayer and supplication. From his bed of pain he was stretching his arms out after me, and, I am coming, I am coming, was all I was able to think of. I found the city of Vienna in unspeakable excitement and confusion, disturbed faces all around me. My carriage came across a number of carriages full of wounded men. I was always looking to see whether Frederick might be among them. But no. His longing cry, which vibrated in my vitals, rang from far away, from Bohemia. If he had been sent off home, the news would have come to us simultaneously. I drove to an hotel. From thence I went to look after my purchases, sent the letter which I had prepared for Grimitz, got myself equipped in a traveling costume most adapted for rough work, and drove to the northern station. I wanted to take the first train that was starting, so as to reach my destination in good time. I had a single fixed idea under whose domination I carried out all my movements. At the station all was in a bustle of life, or should I say a bustle of death. The halls, the waiting room, the platform, all full of wounded, some of them at their last gasp, and a corresponding crowd of people, sick nurses, soldiers of the sanitary department, sisters of mercy, physicians, men and women of all ranks and occupations, who had come there to see whether the last train had brought one of their relations, or again to distribute presents, wine and cigars among the wounded. The officials and servants, busy everywhere in pushing back the folks who were pushing forward. They wanted to send me off, too. What do you want there? Make way. You are forbidden to give out things to eat and drink. Go to the committee. Your presence will be taken in there. No, no, I said. I want to set off. When does the next train start? It was long before I could get information in reply to this. Most of the departure trains, I found at last, were suspended in order to keep the line open for the arrival trains which were coming in, one after another, laden with the wounded. For the day there were absolutely no more passenger trains. There was only one with the reserve troops that were being sent forward, and another exclusively reserved for the service of the Patriotic Aid Society, which had to take away a number of physicians and sisters of mercy, and a cargo of necessary material to the neighborhood of Konigratz. And could not I go by that train? Impossible. I heard, ever plainer and more beseeching, Frederick's cry for help, and could not get to him. It was enough to drive one to despair. Then I espied at the entrance of the hall Baron S., vice president of the Patriotic Aid Society, whose acquaintance I had first made in the year of the War of 59. I hastened to him. 
For God's sake, Baron S., help me. Surely you recognize me? Baroness Tilling, the daughter of General Count Altas. Of course I have that honor. What can I do to serve you? You are sending off a train to Bohemia. Let me travel by it. My dying husband is pining for me. If you have a heart, and your action surely proves how fair and noble your heart is, do not reject my prayer. There were still all kinds of doubts and difficulties, but in the end my wish was granted. Baron S. called one of the physicians dispatched by the Aid Society and recommended me to his protection as a fellow traveler. There was still an hour before our departure. I wanted to go into the waiting room, but every available space had been turned into an hospital. Wherever you looked, you saw cowering, prostrate, bandaged, pale forms. I could not look at them. The little energy which I possessed I had to save up for my journey and for its object. I could not venture to expend here anything of the stock of strength, of compassion, or of power of assistance which was at my command. All belonged to him, to him who was calling for me. Meantime, there was no corner to be found in which a painful scene could be spared me. I had taken refuge on the platform, and there I was brought face to face with the most grievous of all sights, the arrival of a long train, all whose carriages were full of wounded, and the disembarkation of the latter. The less seriously wounded got out by themselves and managed to get themselves forward, but most had to be supported or even carried altogether. The available stretchers were at once occupied, and the remaining patients had to wait till the bearers returned, lying on the floor. Before my feet, at the spot where I was sitting on a box, they laid a man who made, without cessation, a continuous gurgling sound. I bent down to speak a word of sympathy to him, but I started back in horror and covered my face with both hands. The impression on me had been too fearful. It was no longer a human countenance. The lower jaw shot away, one eye welling out, and added to that a stifling reek of blood and corruption. I should have liked to jump up and run away, but I was deadly sick, and my head fell back against the wall behind me. Oh, what a cowardly, feeble creature I am, I said, reproaching myself. What have I to do in these abodes of misery, where I can do nothing, nothing to help, and am exposed to such disgust? Only the thought of Frederick rallied me again. Yes, for him, even if he were in the condition of the poor wretch at my feet, I could bear anything. I would still embrace and kiss him, and all disgust, all horror would be drowned in that all-conquering feeling, love. Frederick, my Frederick, I am coming. I repeated half aloud this fixed thought of mine, which had seized me at the time I read Bresser's letter and had never quitted me. A fearful notion passed through my brain. What if this man should be Frederick? I collected all my forces, and looked at him again. No, it was not he. End of section 46 Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks Section 47 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 12, Part 2. The anxious hour of waiting did, however, come to an end. They had carried off the poor, gurgling fellow. Lay him on the bench there, I heard the regimental doctor order. He is not to be brought back into hospital. He is already three parts dead. And yet he must surely have still understood the words, this three parts dead man. For with a despairing gesture he raised both his hands to heaven. Now I was sitting in a carriage with the two physicians and four sisters of mercy. It was stiflingly hot, and the carriage was filled with the smell of the hospital and sacristy, carbolic acid and incense. 
I was unspeakably ill. I leaned back in my corner and shut my eyes. The train began to move. This is just the time when every traveler brings before his mind's eye the object towards which he is being taken. I had often before traveled over the same ground, and then there lay before me a visit to a chateau full of guests, or a pleasant bathing place. My wedding tour, a blessed memory, was made on this same route, to meet with a brilliant and loving reception on the metropolis of Prussia. What a different sound that last word has assumed since then. And today? What is our object today? A battlefield and the hospitals round it, the abodes of death and suffering. I shuddered. My dear lady, said one of the physicians, I think you are ill yourself. You look so pale and so suffering. I looked up. The speaker had a friendly, youthful appearance. I guessed that this was his first service on being recently promoted to the rank of surgeon. It was good of him to devote his first service to this dangerous and laborious duty. I felt grateful to these men who were sitting in the carriage with me for the relief which they were in the act of bringing to the sufferers, and to the self-sacrificing sisters, really, of mercy. I paid heartfelt admiration and thanks. Yet what was it that each of these good men had to bestow? An ounce of help for one thousand hundredweights of need. These courageous nuns must, I thought, bear in their hearts for all men that overmastering love which filled mine for my own husband. As I had felt just now, that if the fearfully disfigured and repulsive soldier who was gurgling at my feet had been my husband, all my repulsion would have vanished. So these women must have felt towards every brother man, and surely through the power of a higher love that for their chosen bridegroom, Christ. But, alas, here also these noble women brought an ounce only, one ounce of love to a place where one thousand hundredweights of hatred were raging. No, doctor, I replied to the sympathetic question of the young physician. I am not ill, only a little exhausted. The staff surgeon now joined in the conversation. Your husband, madame, as Baron S. told me, was wounded at Konigratz, and you are travelling thither to nurse him. Do you know in which of the villages around he is lying? No, I did not know. My destination is Kunigenhof, I replied. There a physician awaits me who is a friend of mine, Dr. Bresser. I know him. He was with me when we made a three days examination of the field of battle. Examined the field of battle, I repeated with a shudder. Let us hear. Yes, yes, doctor, let us hear, begged one of the nuns. Our service may bring us into the position of helping at an examination of the kind. So the regimental surgeon began his narration. Of course, I cannot give the exact words of his description, and again he did not speak in a single flow of words, but with frequent interruptions and almost with reluctance, being only compelled to speak by the persistent questions with which the curious nuns and I assailed him. The narration, however, though sketchy, formed a series of perfect pictures before my mind's eye, which impressed themselves so on my memory that I can even now make them pass before me. In other circumstances I should not have so clearly comprehended and retained the doctor's sketches. One always forgets so easily what one has heard or read. But at that time, the narratives made almost the impression of an experience. I was in a state of high nervous tension and excitement. My fixed thought of Frederick, which had gained the mastery over me, made me represent Frederick to myself as a person concerned in each scene described. And on that account, they remained fixed in my mind as painful things I had myself experienced. Later on, I noted down the events related by the regimental surgeon in the Red Book, just as if they had taken place before my own eyes. The ambulance was placed behind a hillock which protected it. The battle was raging on the other side. The ground quavered and the heated air quavered. Clouds of smoke were rising. The artillery was roaring. 
Now the duty was to send out patrols to repair to the scene of battle, pick out the badly wounded, and bring them in. Is there anything more heroic than such going into the midst of the hissing rain of bullets, in the face of all the horrors of the fight, exposed to all the perils of the fight, without allowing oneself to be penetrated by its wild excitement? According to military conceptions, this office is not distinguished. On the sanitary corps, no smart, active, handy young fellow will serve. No man in it turns the girls' heads. And a field doctor, even if one is no longer called by that name, but regimental surgeon, can he nevertheless hold a comparison with any cavalry lieutenant? The corporal of the sanitary corps ordered his people towards some low ground against which a battery had opened its fire. They marched through the dark veil of the powder smoke and the dust and the scattered earth to a point where a cannonball, which struck the ground at their feet, bounded in front of them. They had only gone a few paces when they began to meet with wounded men, men slightly wounded who were crawling to the ambulance, either alone or in pairs, giving each other mutual support. One sank down, but it was not his wounds which had sapped his strength, it was exhaustion. We have eaten nothing for two days, made a forced march of twelve hours, got into the bivouac, and then two hours afterwards came the alarm and the fight. The patrol went forward. These men would find their way for themselves and manage to take their exhausted comrade with them. Aid must be reserved for others still more in need of aid. On a heap of rocks forming part of a precipitous declivity lies a bleeding mass. There are a dozen soldiers lying there. The sanitary corporal stops and bandages one or two of them. But these wounded men are not carried off. Those must first be fetched in who have fallen in the center of the field. Then, perhaps on their return march, these men can be picked up here. And again the patrol goes on, nearer to the battle. In ever thicker swarms, wounded men are tottering on, painfully creeping forward, singly or together. These are such as can still walk. The contents of the field flasks is distributed amongst these. A bandage is applied to such wounds as are bleeding, and the way to the ambulance pointed out to them. Then forward again. Over the dead, over hillocks of corpses, many of these dead show traces of horrible agonies. Eyes staring unnaturally, hands grasping the ground, the hair of the beard staring out, teeth pressed together, lips closed spasmodically, legs stiffly outstretched. So they lie. Now through a hollow way, here they are lying in heaps, dead and wounded together. The latter greet the sanitary patrol as angels of rescue and beg and shriek for help. With broken voices weeping and lamenting, they shout for rescue, for a gulp of water. But alas, the provisions are almost exhausted. And what can these few men do? Each ought to have a hundred arms to be able to rescue them all. Yet each does what he can. Then sounds the prolonged tone of the sanitary call. The men stop and break off from their work of aid. Do not desert us, do not desert us, the poor injured men cry. But the signal horn calls again and again, and this, plainly distinguishable from all other noises, is evidently going further afield. Then also an adjutant comes in hot haste. Men of the sanitary corps? At your command, replies the corporal. Follow me. Evidently a general wounded. It is necessary to obey and leave the rest. Patience, comrades, and keep a good heart. We will return. Those who hear and those who say it know that it is not true. And again they go further, following the adjutant at the double quick, who spurs on in front and points the way. There is no halting on the way, although on the right hand and on the left resound shrieks of woe and cries for help. And although also many bullets fall among those who are thus hurrying on, and stretch one and another on the ground, only onwards and over everything, 
over men writhing with the pain of their wounds, men trodden down by horses tearing over them, or crushed by guns passing over their limbs, and who, seeing the rescue corps, mutilated as they are, rear themselves up for the last time. Over them. Over them. End of section 47 Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks Section 48 of Lay Down Your Arms This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 12, Part 3 This sort of thing goes on for pages of the Red Book. The relation that the regimental surgeon gave of the march of a sanitary patrol over the battlefield contains many similar and even more painful things, such as the description of moments when bullets and shells fall in the midst of the dressers and tear up new wounds, or when the course of the battle brings the fight on to the dressing station itself, right up on to the ambulance, and sucks in the whole personnel of the sanitary corps, with the physicians and with the patients into the whirl of the fighting or fleeing or pursuing troops, or when frightened riderless horses all abroad come across the way and overturn the stretcher on which a severely wounded man is lying, who is now dashed to the earth all shattered. Or this, the most gruesome picture of all, a farmyard into which a hundred wounded men had been carried, bandaged, and made comfortable, the poor wretches glad and thankful that their rescue had been effected. Then a shell came and set the hole on fire. A minute afterwards the hospital was in flames. The shrieks, or rather the howls, which resounded from this abode of despair, and which in its wild agony drowned all the other noises, will remain forever in the memory of any one who heard it. Ah, me, it remains forever in my memory too though I did not hear it, for as the regimental surgeon was telling it, I fancied again that Frederick was there, that I heard his shriek out of the burning place of torture. "'You are getting ill, dear madam,' said the narrator, breaking off. "'I must have tried your nerves too much.' But I had not yet heard enough. I assured him that my momentary weakness was the consequence merely of the heat and of a bad night and I was not too tired to ask for the rest. I kept feeling still that I had not yet heard enough, that of the infernal circles that were being described, the description had not yet been given of the lowest and most hellish, and when once the thirst for the horrible has been awakened, it is impossible to stop till it has been slaked by the most horrible of all. And I was right, for there is something more hideous than a battlefield during the fight namely, one afterwards. No more thunder of artillery, no more blare of trumpets, no more beat of drum, only the low moans of pain and the rattle of death. In the trampled ground some redly glimmering pools, lakes of blood, all the crops destroyed, only here and there a piece of land left untouched and still covered with stubble. The smiling villages of yesterday turned into ruins and rubbish. The trees burned and hacked in the forests, the hedges torn with grape shot. And on this battleground, thousands and thousands of men dead and dying, dying without aid. No blossoms of flowers are to be seen on wayside or meadow, but sabers, bayonets, knapsacks, cloaks, overturned ammunition wagons, powder wagons blown into the air, cannon with broken carriages. Near the cannon, whose muzzles are black with smoke, the ground is bloodiest. There, the greatest number and the most mangled of dead and half-dead men are lying, literally torn to pieces with shot. And the dead horses, and the half-dead which raise themselves on their feet, such as they have left them, to sink again. Then raise themselves up once more and fall down again till they only raise their head to shriek out their pain-laden death cry. 
There is a hollow way quite filled with corpses trodden into the mire. The poor creatures had taken refuge there, no doubt, to get cover, but a battery has driven over them, and they have been crushed by the horses' hooves and the wheels. Many of them are still alive, a pulpy, bleeding mass, but still alive. And yet there is still something more hellish even than all this, and that is the appearance of the most vile scum of humanity, as it shows itself in war. That is, the appearance and the activity of the hyenas of the battlefield. Then slink on the monsters who grope after the spoils of the dead, and bend over the corpses and over the living, mercilessly tearing off their clothes from their bodies. The boots are dragged off the bleeding limbs, the rings off the wounded hands, or to get the ring the finger is simply chopped off, and if a man tries to defend himself from such a sacrifice, he is murdered by these hyenas, or in order to make him unrecognizable, they dig his eyes out. I shrieked out loud at the doctor's last words. I again saw the whole scene before me, and the eyes into which the hyena was plunging his knife were Frederick's soft, blue, beloved eyes. Pray, forgive me, dear lady, but it was by your own wish. Oh, yes, I desire to hear it all. What you are now describing was the night which follows the battle, and these scenes are enacted by the starlight and by torchlight. The patrols which the conquerors send out to survey the field of battle carry torches and lanterns, and red lanterns are hoisted on signal poles to point out the places where flying hospitals are to be established. And next morning, how does the field look? Almost more fearful still. The contrast between the bright, smiling daylight and the dreadful work of man on which it shines has a doubly painful effect. At night the entire picture of horror is something ghostly and fantastic. By daylight it is simply hopeless. Now you see for the first time the mass of corpses lying around on the lanes, between the fields, in the ditches, behind the ruins of walls. Everywhere dead bodies, everywhere plundered, some of them naked, and just the same with the wounded. These who, in spite of the nightly labor of the sanitary corps, are still always lying around in numbers, look pale and collapsed, green or yellow with fixed and stupefied gaze, or writhing in agonies of pain, they beg anyone who comes near to put them to death. Swarms of carrion crows settle on the tops of the trees and with loud croaks announce the bill of fare of the tempting banquet. Hungry dogs from the villages around come running by and lick the blood from their wounds. There are a few hyenas to be seen who are still carrying on their work hastily further afield. And now comes the great interment. Who does that? The sanitary corps? How could they suffice for such a mass of work? They have fully enough to do with the wounded. Then troops detailed for the work? No. A crowd of men impressed or even offering themselves voluntarily. Loiterers, baggage people who are supporting themselves by the market stalls, baggage wagons, and so forth, and who now have been hunted away by the force of the military operations, together with the inhabitants of the cottages and huts to dig trenches. Good large ones, of course, wide trenches, for they are not made deep. There is no time for that. Into these the dead bodies are thrown, heads up or heads down just as they come to hand. For it is done in this way. A heap is made of the corpses, and a foot or two of earth is heaped up over them. And then it has the appearance of a tumulus. In a few days rain comes on and washes the covering off of the festering dead bodies, but what does that matter? The nimble, jolly gravediggers do not look so far forward. For jolly, merry workmen they are, that one must allow. Songs are piped out there, and all kinds of dubious jokes made. Nay, sometimes a dance of hyenas is danced round the open trench, whether in several of the bodies that are shoveled into it, or are covered with the earth, life is still stirring, they give themselves no trouble to think. The thing is inevitable, 
for the stiff cramp often comes on after wounds. Many who have been saved by accident have told of the danger of being buried alive which they have escaped. But how many are there of those who are not able to tell anything? If a man has once got a foot or two of dirt over his mouth, he may well hold his tongue. Oh, my Frederick, my Frederick, I groaned in my heart. That is the picture of the next morning, said the surgeon in conclusion. Shall I go on further and tell you what happens next evening? I will tell you that, doctor, I broke in. One of the two capitals of the powers engaged has received the telegraphic news of the glorious victory. And there in the morning, while the hyena dance is going on round the trench, they are singing in the churches. Now thank we all the Lord. And in the evening there, the mother or the wife of one of the men buried alive is putting a lighted candle or two in the window sill, because the city is illuminated. Yes, madam, that is the comedy which is being played at home. Meanwhile, on the field of battle, the tragedy is still far from played out by the second sunset. Besides those who are carried to the hospital or the trench, there still remains the missing, hidden behind some thick brushwood in the fields of standing corn or amongst the ruins of buildings, they have escaped the sight of the bearers or the barriers, and for them begins now the martyrdom of an agony which lasts many days and nights, in the burning heat of midday, in the dark shadows of midnight, crouched on stones and thistles, in the stench of the corpses around, and of their own putrefying wounds, a prey while still quivering for the feasting vultures. End of section 48 Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks Section 49 of Lay Down Your Arms This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner, translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 12, Part 4 What a journey that was! The regimental surgeon had long ceased to speak, but the scenes he had described went on continually presenting themselves before my mind's eye. To escape from this train of thoughts which persecuted me, I began to look out of the carriage windows and try to find destruction in the prospect of the country. But here, also, pictures of the horrors of war presented themselves to my vision. It is true that no violent devastation had taken place in this neighborhood. There were no ruined villages smoking there. The enemy had effected no lodgment there. But what was raging there was perhaps still worse, that is, the fear of the enemy. The Prussians are coming! The Prussians are coming! was a signal of alarm through the whole region and though in travelling past one did not hear the words, yet even from the carriage window their effect was plainly to be seen. Everywhere on all the roads and lanes were people flying, leaving their homes with bag and baggage. Whole trains of wagons were moving inland, filled with bedding, household furniture, and provisions, all evidently packed up in the greatest haste. On the same car would be some little pigs, the youngest child, and one or two sacks of potatoes, beside it on foot, man and wife and the elder children. That is how I saw a family making their escape as they moved down a road near me. Where were the poor creatures going? They themselves very likely did not know. It was only away, away from the Prussians. So men flee from the roaring fire or the rising flood. Frequently a train passed us on the other line, wounded, always and again wounded, always once more the ashy faces, the bandaged heads, the arms in slings. At the stations especially, one might feed on this site in all its variations to satiety. All the large or small platforms on which one usually sees the traveling population waiting, or cheerfully standing, or walking about, were now filled with prostrate or cowering figures. They were the invalid soldiers 
who had been brought from the field or private hospitals in the neighborhood, and were waiting for the next train which might serve for the transport of the wounded. There they might have to lie for hours, and who knows how many removals they have already passed through, from the battlefield to the first aid station, from thence to the ambulance, from thence to a movable hospital, then to the village, and now to the railway, whence they have still the journey to Vienna before them, then from the station to the hospital, and from thence, after all these long tortures, perhaps back to their regiment, perhaps to the churchyard. I was so sorry, so sorry, so terribly sorry for these poor fellows. I should have liked to kneel down before each of them and whisper a few words of compassion to him, but the doctor would not allow me. When we got out at a station, he gave me his arm and took me into the station master's office. There he brought me some wine or some other refreshment. The nurses carried on their work of mercy here also. They gave the wounded men drink and food, such as they could hunt up. But often there was nothing to be had. The provisions in the refreshment rooms were generally exhausted. This movement at the stations, especially at the large ones, had a bewildering effect on me. It seemed to me like an evil dream. All this running hither and thither, this confused pell-mell, troops marching out, people flying away, sick bearers, heaps of bleeding and complaining soldiers, sobbing women wringing their hands, shouts, harsh words of command, crowds on all hands, no free passage anywhere, baggage being sent in, war material cannons, on another side horses and bellowing cattle, and amongst them the continuous sound of the telegraph, trains rushing through, filled or crowded, rather, with the reserves coming up from Vienna. These soldiers were brought along in third- and fourth-class carriages, nay, also in baggage and cattle trucks, just in the same way as cattle to be slaughtered, and regarding it as a matter of fact, I could not repress the thought. What else were they in reality? Were they not like the cattle marked out for slaughter? Were they not, like them, sent to the great political market, where business is done in food for powder, what the French call Chez Canon? A mad roar, was it a war song, pealed out and drowned the rattling sound of the wheels. One minute, and the train was gone. With the speed of the wind it bore a portion of its freight to certain death. Yes, certain death. Even if no individual can say of himself that he is sure to fall, yet a certain percentage of the whole must and will fall. An army marching to the field, as they sweep along the high road on foot or on horseback, may have a touch of antique poetry about it, but for the railroad of our modern day, the symbol of culture binding nations together to serve as the means for promoting barbarism let loose, that is a thing altogether too inconsistent and horrible. And what a false ring also has the telegraph signal used in this service, that splendid sign of the triumph of the human intellect, which has enabled us to propagate thought with lightning speed from one land to another. All these inventions of the new era, which are designed to promote the intercourse of nations, to lighten, beautify, and enrich life, are now misapplied by that old-world principle which aims at dividing the people and annihilating life. Our boast before savages is, look at our railroads, look at our telegraphs, we are civilized nations. And then we use these things to increase a hundredfold our own savagery. My being forced to torture myself with such thoughts as these, and these only, as I waited at the station or pursued my way in the train, made my grief still more deep and bitter. I almost envied those who merely wrung their hands and wept in simple pain, who did not rise up in wrath against the whole hideous comedy, who accused no one, not even that lord of armies, of whom yet they believed that he was so, and that it was he who was keeping suspended over their heads the misery that had come to them. It was late at night when I got to Konigenhof. My traveling companions had been obliged to get out at an earlier station. I was alone, in fear and anxiety. 
How if Dr. Bresser were prevented from coming? What step could I then take in this place? Besides, I was, so to speak, broken on the wheel by the journey, quite unnerved by all the experiences of grief and terror that I had passed through. If it had not been for my longing for Frederick, I should have wished now for nothing but death, to be able to lie down, go to sleep, and never wake again in a world where things go on so horribly and so madly. But preserve me from one thing at least, to live on and know that Frederick is among the missing. The train stopped. Tired and trembling, I lighted and took out my hand baggage. I had taken with me a hand basket, with some linen for myself and sharpie and bandages for the wounded, and also my traveling dressing case. This I had taken quite mechanically, in the belief in which I was brought up that one could not exist without the silver cases and baskets, the soaps and essences, the brushes and combs. Cleanliness, that virtue of the body, corresponding to honor in the soul, that second nature of educated humanity. What a lesson had I now to learn, that there can be no thought of it at such times as these. That, however, is only consistent. War is the negation of education, and therefore all the triumphs of education must be annihilated by it. It is a step backwards into barbarism, and must therefore have everything that is barbarous in its train, and amongst others, that thing which to the cultured man is so utterly abominable, dirt. The chest with materials for the hospitals, which I had looked out for Dr. Bresser in Vienna, had been given over with the other chests to the care of the aid committee, and who could tell when and where they would be delivered. I had nothing with me except my two pieces of hand baggage and a bag of money round my neck containing a few hundred florin notes. With a tottering step I crossed the rails to the platform. There, in spite of the lateness of the hour, the same confusion prevailed as at the other stations, and the same picture was always repeated. Wounded men, wounded men. No, not the same picture, one still worse. Konigenhof was a place which was overfull of these unfortunates. There was not an unoccupied room in the whole village, and now they had brought the sick in crowds to the railway station, where hastily bandaged up they were lying about everywhere, on the ground, on the stones. It was a dark, moonless night. The scene was illuminated only by three or four lamps on the pillars. Exhausted and thirsting for sleep, almost for the sleep of death, I sank on the unoccupied corner of a bench and put my luggage on the ground in front of me. At first I had not the courage to look about me and see whether amongst the number of men who were busy passing to and fro, here one might be Dr. Bresser. I was almost persuaded that I should not meet him. It was at least ten chances to one that he would be prevented from coming, or that he would get here at another hour than the one fixed, for there was no longer any regularity in the service. My train had certainly arrived much later than it was fixed by the railway regulations. Regulations, another civilized conception, and so it was now set aside along with the rest. My undertaking seemed to me now a perfect lunacy. The fancied call from Frederick, could I then believe in mystical things of that sort? I certainly had no foundation whatever. Who knows? Frederick was perhaps on his way home. Perhaps he was dead. Why was I seeking for him here? Another voice began now to call upon me. Other arms were stretched out to meet me. Rudolph, my son. How he would have been asking for Mama and not been able to get to sleep without his mother's kiss when he bade good night. Whither should I turn here if I did not find Bresser? And the hope of finding him had of a sudden become as small as the hope of the lucky number among the hundred thousand lots. Luckily I had my bag of money. The possession of banknotes affords always a means of getting out of difficulties. Mechanically, I felt the place where the bag should have been hanging. Good God! The strap by which it had been fastened had been torn off, and the bag was gone was lost. What a blow! And yet I had not recourse to any complaint against my destiny. I could not lament. How hard fortune is hitting me! 
for at a time when misfortune was falling in floods on all sides, to complain about a little misfortune of one's own would have made one blush for one's own selfishness. And besides, for me, there was only one possibility which could alarm me. Frederick's death. All the rest was nothing. I began to look at all the people present. No, Dr. Bresser. What to do now? To whom to address myself? I stopped one of the men passing. Where can I find the station master? You mean the director of the sick depot, Staff Sergeant S. He is standing there. He was not the person I meant, but perhaps he would be able to give me information about Dr. Bresser. I approached the place he pointed out. The staff surgeon was speaking to a gentleman standing near him. It is a pity, I heard him say. Here and at Turnau, depots have been founded for all the hospitals of the theater of war. Gifts are flowing in in mass. Linen, food, bandages, as much as you can wish. But what is to be done with them? How are they to be unpacked? How sorted? How sent out? We have no hands. We could occupy a hundred active officers. I was just going to speak to the staff surgeon when I saw a man hurrying towards him in whom, oh joy, I recognized Dr. Bresser. In my excitement, I fell on the neck of my old family friend. You, you, Baroness Tilling, whatever are you doing here? I am come to help, to nurse. Is not Frederick in one of your hospitals? I have seen nothing of him. Was this a disappointment or a relief? I do not know. He was not there, and therefore either dead or unhurt. Besides, Bresser could not possibly know all the wounded in the neighborhood. I must search through all the hospitals myself. And Frau Simon, I asked next. She has been here now some hours. A splendid woman. Quick in decision, prudent. Just now she is busied in getting the wounded who are lying here carried into empty railway trucks. She has discovered that in a village near, at Horonawas, the need is the greatest. She is going there and I am to accompany her. And I also, Dr. Bresser, let me go with you. Baroness Martha, where are you thinking of going? You, so delicate and unaccustomed to such hard, bitterly hard work as this. What else have I got to do here? I said, interrupting him. If you are my friend, Doctor, help me to carry out my purpose. I will really do anything, perform any service. Introduce me to Frau Simon as a volunteer nurse, but take me with you. For mercy's sake, take me with you. Very well, your will shall be done. The brave lady is there. Come. End of section 49 Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks Section 50 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 12, Part 5. When Dr. Bresser brought me to Frau Simon, and introduced me to her as a sick nurse. She nodded, but turned away at once to give some order. I was not able to see her features in the dubious light. Five minutes later, we were on our journey to Horonewos, A country wagon, which had just brought some wounded from that place, served as our conveyance. We sat upon the straw, which was perhaps still bloody from its former freight. The soldier who sat by the driver held a lantern which threw a flickering light on our road. An evil dream, an evil dream. Such was more and more the impression of what I was going through. The only thing which brought to my mind the reality of my situation, and which at the same time gave me repose, was Dr. Bresser's company. I had placed my hand in his, and his other arm supported me. Lean on me, Baroness Martha, my poor child, he said softly. I did lean on him as well as I could, but what a position of torture it was, when one has been accustomed during the whole of one's life to repose upon cushioned seats, carriages on well-hung springs, and soft beds. 
how heavy it falls on one all at once, after an exhausting day's travel, to be sitting on a jolting country cart, the hard planks of which are cushioned only by a layer of bloody straw. And yet I was uninjured. What then must those have felt who were hurried over stock and stone in such a conveyance as that, with shattered limbs and their bones sticking out of their skin? My eyelids closed with a leaden weight. A painful feeling of sleepiness tortured me. Sleep was indeed impossible from the discomfort of my position. Every limb was aching, and from the excitement of my nerves, but the somnolence which I could not shake off had the more terrible effect on me. Thoughts and images as confused as the visions of fever whirled through my brain. All the scenes of horror which the regimental surgeon had described repeated themselves before my spirit, partly in the very words of the narrator, partly as delusions of sight and hearing, called up by those words. I kept seeing the gravediggers shoveling in the dead, saw the hyenas sneaking up, heard the shrieks of those who were being sacrificed in the burning lazaretto, and between whiles, words came in as if they were pronounced aloud in the accents of the regimental surgeon, such as carrion crows, market folks, sanitary patrols. That, however, did not prevent me from hearing the conversation that was being carried on half aloud by my companions in the cart. A part of the routed army fled to Koningratz, Dr. Bresser said, but the fortress was closed and the fugitives were fired on from the walls especially the Saxons, who in the twilight were mistaken for Prussians. Hundreds plunged into the ditches of the fort and were drowned. The flight was checked by the Elbe, and the disorder reached its height. The bridges were so overcrowded by horses and cannon that the infantry could find no room. Thousands flung themselves into the Elbe, even the wounded. It must be a horrible state of things at Horanewas, said Frau Simon all abandoned by its inhabitants, village and castle, the whole of the inner rooms destroyed and yet filled with helpless wounded men. What joy will the refreshments we are bringing give the wretched men? But it will not be enough, not enough. And our medical aid is also not enough, added Dr. Bresser. There should be a hundred of us in order to do what is required. We are in want of instruments and medicines, and would even these help us? The overcrowding of these places is such as to threaten the outbreak of dangerous epidemics. The first care is always this, to send away as many wounded as possible. But their condition is usually such that no conscientious man would take the responsibility of their transport. To send them off means to kill them. To leave them there means to introduce hospital gangrene? A sad alternative. The horrors and miseries I have seen in these days since the Battle of Konigratz exceed all conception. You must prepare yourself for the worst, Frau Simon. I have the experience of many years and courage. The greater the misery, the higher rises my determination. I know your fame has preceded you. I, on the contrary, when I see so much misery, feel all my courage sink, and it strikes me to the heart. To hear hundreds, nay, thousands of men in want of help, praying for help, and not to be able to help, it is hideous. And all these ambulances which have been set up in the most hasty way around the field of battle, we have been in want of restoratives. Above all things, there is no water. Most of the wells around have been made unserviceable by the inhabitants. Far and wide there is not a piece of bread to be obtained. All rooms that have a roof over them, churches, country houses, chateau, huts, are all filled with sick. Everything in the shape of a carriage has been sent off with its load of wounded. The roads in all directions are covered with such carts of hell, for in truth the sufferings carried by those wheels are hellish. There they lie, officers, petty officers, soldiers, disfigured by dirt and dust and blood, till they are unrecognizable, with wounds for which there is no human help available, uttering cries of pain, shrieks which are hardly human, and yet those who can still cry are not the most pitiable. Then many die on the way, 
Certainly. Or after they are unloaded, they finish quietly and unobserved on the first bundle of straw on which they have been left to die. Some quietly, but others raving and raging in a desperate fight with death, uttering such curses as might make your hair stand on end. It must have been curses like these that Mr. Twining of London heard, who made the following proposal at the Geneva Conference. Would it not be well if the condition of a wounded man leaves not the slightest hope of recovery, in such a case to give him first the consolations of religion, then, as far as the circumstances allow, leave him a moment for reflection, and then put an end to his agony in the least painful way possible. This would prevent his dying a few moments later with fever in his brain, and perhaps blasphemies against God on his tongue. How unchristian! cried Frau Simon. What, to give him the coup de grace? No, but the idea that a blasphemous expression wrung from the soul of a man in the midst of unbearable tortures could imperil his soul. The Christian's God is not so unjust as that, and assuredly will take every fallen warrior into his grace. Mahomet's paradise was assured to every Muslim man who would kill the Christian replied Bresser. Believe me, my dear Frau Simon, all those deities who have been represented as leaders of war, and whose assistance and blessing the priests and commanders promise as the wages of murder, all of them are as deaf to blasphemies as to prayers. Look up there, that star of the first magnitude, with reddish light, it is only seen twinkling, or rather shining, for it does not twinkle over our heads, every second year. That is the planet Mars, the star dedicated to the god of war. That god who was so feared and reverenced in old times that he had by far more temples than the goddess of love. Of old on the field of Marathon, in the narrow pass of Thermopylae, that star shed a bloody light on the battles of men, and to him rose up the curses of the fallen who accused him of their misfortune while he, indifferent and peaceful, then as now, was circling round the sun. Hostile stars, there are no such things. Man has no enemy except man, but he is savage enough. And no other friend, either, added Bresser after a short pause. Of that you yourself are giving an example, magnanimous lady. You are— Oh, doctor, interrupted Frau Simon. Look there, that flame on the horizon. It is surely a village in flames. I opened my eyes and saw the red glare. No, said Dr. Bresser, it is the moon rising. I tried to get into a more comfortable position and sat up for a time. I kept constantly preventing myself from closing my eyes, for that state of half slumber with the consciousness of not being asleep, in which the most horrible fancy pictures carried on their wild procession, was far too painful. Better to take part in the conversation of the other two, and tear myself away from my own thoughts. But the gentleman and lady were dumb. They were looking towards the place where now the luminary of night was really rising. And again, in spite of me, my eyes closed for a space. This time it was sleep. In the one second during which I felt that I was going to sleep, that the world around me was ceasing to exist, I felt such a delight in annihilation that the brother of my benefactor, Death, would have been quite welcome to me. I do not know how long a space I passed in this negatively happy state of removal from existence. But I was torn out of it suddenly and forcefully. It was no noise, no shock that woke me, but a vapor of intolerably poisoned air. What is that? The others called out the same question at the same time as I did. Our wagon turned round a corner, and at the side of the way, we found the answer. Brightly lighted by the moon, there stood up a white wall, probably of a church. Anyhow, it had served as a cover from gunshot. At its foot, heaped up, lay numerous corpses. It was the smell of putrefaction which rose up from their dead bodies that had broken my sleep. As we drove by, a thick crowd of ravens and crows rose screaming from the heap of dead, fluttered for a time, 
as a black cloud against the clear background of the sky, and then settled down again to their feast. Frederick, my Frederick! Calm yourself, Baroness Martha, said Bresser consolingly. Your husband could not have been present there. The soldier who was driving had pressed his team on in order to get away the quicker from the neighborhood of the mephitic Faber. The conveyance clattered and jolted as if we were in wild flight. I thought the horses had run away. Trembling fear took hold on me. With both hands I clasped Bresser's arm, but I could not help turning my head back to look there, at that wall. And was it the deceptive light of the moon? Or was it the movements hither and thither of the birds as they came back to their booty? I thought that the whole troop of the dead rose up, and that the corpses all stretched their arms towards us and made ready to pursue us. I would have shrieked, but my throat was closed by fear and would not obey my impulse. End of section 50 Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks Section 51 of Lay Down Your Arms This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 12, Part 6 Again the wagon turned round the corner of a street. Here we are. This is Horanewos, I heard the doctor say, and he ordered the driver to stop. What are we to do with the lady? said Frau Simon complainingly. She will be rather a hindrance than any help. I collected myself. No, no, I said. I am better now. I will do all I can to help you. We found ourselves in the middle of the village at the gate of a chateau. We will first do here what there is to do, said the doctor. The chateau, which is deserted by its owners, must be filled from cellar to roof with wounded. We got out. I could hardly keep on my feet, but stiffened myself with all my force, so as not to give in. Forward, said Frau Simon. Have we all our luggage? What I am bringing with me will give the people some refreshment. There are restoratives and bandages in my box, too, said I. And my handbag contains instruments and medicines, added Bresser. Then we gave the needful orders to the soldiers who accompanied us. Two were to wait with the horses, and the others come with us. We passed under the gate of the chateau. Stifled sounds of woe proceeded from various sides. All was dark. Light. The first thing is to strike a light called out Frau Simon. Alas, we had brought all possible things with us, chocolate, meat essence, cigars, strips of linen, but no one had thought of a candle. There was no means of illuminating the darkness which surrounded us and the poor fellows. Only a box of lucifers, which the doctor had in his pocket, enabled us for a few seconds to see the terrible pictures which filled this abode of the wretched. The foot slipped on the floor, slippery with blood, if one tried to go on. What was to be done? To the hundred despairing men who were groaning and sighing here, a few more people had come to despair and sigh. What is to be done? What is to be done? I will find out the clergyman's house, said Frau Simon, or get some assistance somewhere else in the village. Come, doctor, you conduct me with your lucifer matches to the egress, and you, Frau Martha, remain here meanwhile. Here, alone, in the dark, amongst all these wailing people, in this stifling odor. What a situation! I shuddered to the marrow of my bones, but I said nothing against it. Yes, I replied, I will remain on this spot, and wait till you come back with the light. No, cried Bresser, putting his arm through mine. Come with us. You must not be left behind in this purgatory, amongst men who may be in the delirium of fever. I was thankful to my friend for this speech, and clung tight to his arm. 
to stop behind in these rooms might perhaps have driven me mad with fear. I was still a cowardly, helpless creature, not brought up to the misery and the horror into which I had now plunged. Why had I not kept at home? Still, supposing I should find Frederick again, who could tell whether he might not be lying in these same dark rooms which we were just quitting? As we went out, I called out his name, more than once, but the answer which I hoped for and feared, Here I am, Martha, was not returned. We got again into the open air. The wagon was standing in the same place. Dr. Bresser decided that I should get in again. Frau Simon and I are going, meanwhile, into the village to seek for aid, and you shall remain here. I willingly submitted for my feet could hardly carry me. The doctor helped me to get up and arranged a convenient seat for me with the straw that was lying about. Two soldiers remained behind with the wagon. The rest, Frau Simon and the doctor, took along with them. After about half an hour, the whole expedition came back. No success. The parsonage was destroyed, like everything else, and empty. All the houses in ruins, no light to be obtained anywhere. So there was nothing else to be done except to wait till day dawned. How many of the poor wretches in whom our coming had already roused hope, and whom our aid might still have saved, might perhaps die during this night. What a long, long night that was, though in reality only between three and four hours passed before sunrise, how endless these hours necessarily seemed to us, their course being marked not by the ticking of a clock, but by the helpless cries of fellow men for aid. At last the morning dawned. Now we could act. Frau Simon and Dr. Bresser took the road again to see whether they could rouse up some of the concealed inhabitants of the village. They succeeded. Out of the ruins here and there one or two peasants crawled forth, at first morose and distrustful. When, however, Dr. Bresser spoke to them in their own language, and Frau Simon urged them with her soft voice, they agreed to give their services. It was necessary before all things to recruit all the other hidden villagers so that they might help in the work. Bury the dead that were lying about, get the wells into working order so as to procure water for the living, collect the field kettles that lay scattered about the roads so as to have vessels, empty the knapsacks of the slain and the dead, and used the linen they contained for the wounded. Now arrived also a Prussian staff surgeon with men and aid materials, and then the work of bringing help to these poor creatures could be undertaken with some success. Now the moment was come for me, too, when I might perhaps discover him at whose fancied call I had undertaken this luckless journey, and whose recollection whipped up to some extent my failing powers. Frau Simon betook herself under the conduct of the Prussian surgeon, first to the chateau, where most of the wounded were lying. Dr. Bresser chose to search through the other places in the village. I preferred to keep with my friend, and went along with him. That Frederick was not lying in the chateau, the doctor had discovered by a previous look around it. We had hardly gone a hundred paces when loud cries of pain smote on our ears, they came from the open door of the little village church. We went in. There, more than a hundred men were lying on the hard stone pavement, severely wounded, crippled. With feverish, wandering eyes they shrieked and cried for water. I had nearly sunk down even on the threshold. Still, I walked through the whole row. I was seeking for Frederick. He was not there. Presser with his people set themselves to attend to the poor fellows. I leaned against a side altar and contemplated the scene of woe with infinite horror. And this was the temple of the God of Love. These were the wonder-working saints who were there folding their hands so piously in the niches and on the walls and lifting up their heads with the golden glories round them. O oh, Mother of God, Holy Mother of God, one drop of water, have mercy on me, I heard a poor soldier pray. That prayer he had probably been addressing all the day long to the gaudily painted dumb image. Oh, poor men, 
till you yourselves have listened to the command of love which God has put into your own hearts, you will always call in vain upon God's love. So long as cruelty is not overcome in your own selves, you have nothing to hope from the compassion of heaven. Ah, how much I had to see and to go through in the whole of this same day. It would in truth be the simplest way and the most pleasant to pursue the narrative no further. One shuts one's eyes and turns away one's head when something altogether too horrid presents itself. Even the recollection has the power to make one shut one's eyes. And if there is no more power to help, and what can be altered in this stony past? Why torture oneself and others by writing up these horrors? Why? I will answer the question afterwards. Now I can only say I must do it. More still, I will not merely tax my own memory that I may be able to relate what I have in view, for my powers of perception were far too weak to bear the burden of the events. But I will also add what Frau Simon, Dr. Bresser, and the Saxon inspector of field hospitals, Dr. Naundorf, told me. As in Horanoas, so also in many of the villages in this neighborhood, hell had set up branch establishments. It was so in Sweti, in Radok, in Problos, so in Pardubitz, where, when the Prussians first took possession of it, over one thousand severely wounded men, operations and amputations, were lying about, some dying, some already dead, corpses mixed with those in the act of death, and those who envied them their end, many with nothing on but bloody shirts, so that no one could tell even what countrymen they were. All those who had still a spark of life in them were shrieking for water and bread, writhing with the pain of their wounds, and begging for death as a blessing. Rosnitz, writes Dr. Bauer in his letters, Rosnitz, a place whose picture will live in my memory till the hour of my death. Rosnitz, whither I was sent by the St. John Society six days after the murderous fight and where the greatest misery which the human fancy can picture was still raining down to that day. I found there R of ours with 650 wounded, who were lying in wretched barns and stables without any nursing in the midst of death and half-dead men, some of them lying for days in their own offer. It was here that after the erection of the funeral mound of the fallen Lieutenant Colonel von F., I was so overcome with pain that for an hour I poured out the hottest tears, and could hardly regain self-control in spite of the expenditure of all my moral force. Though as a medical man I am accustomed to look at human suffering in all its forms, and in the exercise of my profession have learned to bear the shrieks of tortured human nature, yet here in very truth tears which I could not repress welled from my eyes. It was here in Rusnitz that when on the second day I found that our powers were not equal to cope with such misery, I lost courage and left off dressing the wounds. In what condition were these six hundred men? It is Dr. Naundorf who is speaking this time. It is impossible to depict it accurately. Flies were feeding on their open wounds, which were covered with them. Their gaze, flaming with fever, wandered about, asking and seeking for some help, for refreshment, for water and bread. Coat, shirt, flesh, and blood formed, in the case of most of them, one repulsive mass. Worms were beginning to generate in this mass and to feed on them. A horrible odor filled every place. All these soldiers were lying on the bare ground. Only a few had got a little straw on which they could repose their miserable bodies. Some who had nothing under them but clayey, swampy ground had half sunk into the mud it formed. They had not the strength to get out of it. Others lay in a puddle of horrible filth, which no pen could consent to describe. En Maslovid, so says Frau Simon, a place of about fifty houses, there were lying eight days after the battle about seven hundred wounded. It was not so much their shrieks of agony as their abandonment without any consolation which appealed to heaven. 
In one single barn alone, sixty of these poor wretches were crowded. Every one of their wounds had originally been severe, but they had become hopeless in consequence of their unassisted condition and their want of nursing and feeding. Almost all were gangrenous. Limbs crushed by shot formed now mere heaps of putrefying flesh, faces a mere mass of coagulated blood covered with filth, in which the mouth was represented by a shapeless black opening, from which frightful groans kept welling out. The progress of putrefaction separated whole mortified pieces from these pitiable bodies. The living were lying close to dead bodies which had begun to fall into putrefaction, and for which the worms were getting ready. These sixty men, as well as a greater number of the others, lay for a week in the same situation. Their wounds were either not dressed at all, or only in a most imperfect way. Since the day of the battle, they lay there, incapable of moving from the spot, only scantily fed and without sufficient water, the bedding under them corrupting with blood and excrement. That is how they passed eight days, living corpses through whose quivering limbs a stream of poisoned blood hardly circulated. They had not been able to die, and yet how could they expect ever again to return to life? Which is the more astonishing in this matter, says Frau Simon, in concluding her tale, the eternal living force of human nature, which could endure all this and yet go on breathing, or the want of efficient assistance? What is most astonishing, according to my way of looking at it, is that men should bring each other into such a state, that men who have seen such a sight should not sink on their knees and swear a passionate oath to make war on war, that if they are princes they do not fling the sword away, or if they are not in any position of power they do not from that moment devote their whole action in speech or writing, in thought, teaching, or business to this one end. Lay down your arms. End of section fifty one. Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks. Section fifty two of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 12, Part 7. Frau Simon, she was called the mother of the Lazarettos, was a heroine. For weeks she stayed in that neighborhood and bore all privations and dangers. Hundreds were saved by her agency. Day and night she worked, provided, directed. Sometimes she was doing the lowest offices beside the sick beds, sometimes ordering the transport of wounded, sometimes requisitioning necessaries. When she had provided assistance in one place, she hastened without any rest to another. She got a copious supply from Dresden, and conveyed it in spite of all opposing difficulties, to the points when help was needed. She undertook to represent the Patriotic Aid Society on the soil of Bohemia and made a position for herself there equal to that which Florence Nightingale took in the Crimea. And as to me, exhausted, comfortless, overpowered by pain and disgust, I had no power to render any help. Even in the church, our first station, I had fallen fainting with fatigue on the steps of that altar of the Virgin, and Dr. Bresser had a good deal of trouble to bring me round again. Thence I tottered a little further by his side, and we got into just such a barn as Frau Simon has depicted. In the church there was at least a large space, in which the poor fellows lay side by side. Here they were crowded upon each other, or in each other's arms, in heaps or rolls. Into the church there had come nurses, probably some sanitary corps on its march through, and these had given some help, though insufficient. But here... They were mere castaways, quite undiscovered, a crawling, whining mass of half-putrefied remains of men. Choking disgust laid hold of my throat, the bitterest grief of my breast. 
I felt as if my heart was breaking in two, and I gave utterance to a resounding shriek. This shriek is the last thing remaining in my memory of that scene. When I came to my senses again, I found myself in a railway carriage in motion. Opposite me sat Dr. Bresser. When he perceived that I had opened my eyes, and was looking about me astonished and questioning, he took my hand. Yes, yes, Lady Martha, he said. This is a second-class carriage. You are not dreaming. You are here in company with a slightly wounded officer and your friend Bresser, and we are on our way to Vienna. So it was. The doctor had brought a detachment of wounded from Horonewas to Konigenhof, and from thence another detachment had been given into his charge to transport to Vienna. Me, in my fainting state, fainting in both senses of the word, he had taken with him and was bringing home. I had shown myself to be entirely useless and incapable in those abodes of misery, only a hindrance and a burden. Frau Simon was very glad when Dr. Bresser got me out of the way, and I was obliged to allow that it was better so. But Frederick, I had not found him. Thank God that I had not found him, for then all hope was not dead, and if I had been obliged to recognize my beloved husband among those shapes of woe, I should have gone mad. Perhaps I should find at home a letter for me from my Frederick. This hope, no, it would be too much to say hope, but the thought of this bare possibility poured balm into my wounded soul. Yes, wounded. I felt my inmost soul wounded. The gigantic woe which I had seen had cut so deep into my own heart that I felt as if it would never be healed again completely. Even if I were to find my Frederick again, even if a long future of brilliancy and love were granted me, could I ever forget that so many others of my poor human brothers and sisters had had to bear such unspeakable misery, and must go on bearing it, till they come to see that this misery is no fatality, but a crime. I slept almost the whole way. Dr. Bresser had given me a slight narcotic, so that a longer and sounder sleep might to some extent calm my nerves, which had been so shattered by the occurrences at Horonawas. When we arrived at the Vienna station, my father was already there to take me away. Dr. Bresser, who thought of everything, had telegraphed to Kurumitz. It was not possible for him himself to see me there, for he had his wounded to see into the hospital, and wished then to return to Bohemia without delay. My father embraced me in silence, and I also did not find a word to say. Then he turned to Dr. Bresser. How can I thank you? If you had not taken this little crazy thing under your protection... But the doctor pressed our hands hastily. I must go, he said. I have duty to do. May you get home safely. The young lady wants forbearance, your excellency. She has had a terrible shaking. No reproaches, no questioning. Get her quickly to bed. Orange flower water. Rest. Goodbye. And he was gone. My father put my arm in his and led me through the crowd to the exit. There again a long row of ambulance wagons were standing. We had to go some distance on foot till we could get to the place where our carriage was waiting. The question, has any news of Frederick come during this while, rose several times to my lips, but I could not find courage to give voice to it. At last, when we had driven some distance, while my father kept silence all the way, I brought it out. Not up to yesterday, was the reply. It is possible that we may find news today. It was, of course, yesterday, immediately after the receipt of the telegram that I left for the city. Oh, what a fright you have given us, you silly creature, to go to the battlefields where you might meet the most cruel enemies, for these folks are just like savages. They are perfectly intoxicated with the victories of their needle rifle and all. They are no disciplined soldiers, these landwehr fellows. From such men you may be sure of the worst outrages, and you, a lady, to run into the midst of them, you... However, the doctor just now ordered me not to scold you. How is my son, Rudolf? 
he is crying and moaning about you, seeking you all over the house, will not believe that you could have gone away without giving him a parting kiss. And do not you ask after the rest, Lily, Rosa, Otto, Aunt Mary? You seem to me altogether so indifferent. How are they all? Has Conrad written? They are all well. A letter arrived yesterday from Conrad. Nothing has happened to him. Lily is happy. You will see that good news will very soon arrive about Tilling, too. Unfortunately, there is nothing good to be hoped in a political point of view. You have surely heard of the great calamity. Which? In the present state of things, I have seen nothing but great calamities. I mean Venice. Our beautiful Venice, given away, made a present of to that intriguer Louis Napoleon. And that after such a brilliant victory as we won at Castosa. Instead of getting back our Lombardy, to give up our Venice as well. It is true that by this means we get free from our enemies in the south, have Louis Napoleon too on our side, and can now with our whole force take our revenge for Sadawa, chase the Prussians out of our country, follow them up, and gain Silesia for ourselves. Benedek has committed great mistakes, but now the chief command will be put into the hand of the glorious commander of the army of the south. But you make no reply. Well, then, I will follow Bresser's prescription and give you repose. After a drive of two hours, we arrived at Grumitz. As our carriage drove into the court of the chateau, my sisters ran out to meet me. Martha! Martha! Both of them shouted from a distance. He is there! And again, at the carriage door. He is there! Who? Frederick, your husband. Yes, so it was. It was the day before, late in the evening, that Frederick had been brought with a consignment of wounded from Bohemia to Vienna, and from thence here. He had received a bullet in his leg, a wound which rendered him for the moment unfit for service and in need of nursing, but was entirely free from danger. But joy is also hard to bear. The news then shouted to me by my sisters, so entirely without preparation, that Frederick was there, had just the same effect as the terror of the past days. It deprived me of consciousness. They were obliged to carry me from the carriage into the chateau and put me to bed. Here, whether from the after-effect of the narcotic or the violence of the shock of joy, I spent several hours in unconsciousness, sometimes slumbering, sometimes delirious. When I came to myself and found myself in my own bed, I believed myself to have awoke from a dreadful dream and thought I had never left Grimitz. Bresser's letter, my resolution to start for Bohemia, my experiences there, the homeward journey, the news of Frederick's return home. All was a dream. I looked up. My femme de chambre was standing at the foot of the bed. Is my bath ready? I asked. I want to get up. Now Aunt Mary rushed forward out of a corner of the room. Oh, Martha, poor dear, are you at last awake and restored to your senses? God be praised. Yes, yes, get up and take your bath. That will do you good, when one is covered as you are with the dust of the roads and railways. Dust from railways? What do you mean? Quick, get up. Nettie, get everything ready. Frederick is almost dying with impatience to see you. Frederick. My Frederick. How often had I during these last days called out this name, and with what pain? But now it was a cry of joy, for now I had comprehended. It was no dream. I had been away and come back again, and was to see my husband. A quarter of an hour afterwards I went into his room, alone. I had requested that no one should go with me. No third person should be present at our meeting. Frederick! Martha! I rushed to the couch on which he lay and sobbed on his bosom. End of section 52 Recording by Cassiopeia Sparks
Section 53 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 13, Part 1. My delight in the restoration of my husband. The war practically at an end, but the Prussians continue their advance on Vienna. Life at Grumitz, military education, my brother Otto, description of the flight of a routed corps, peace imminent, victory of Lissa, plans for the future, Conrad's return, the soldier's delight in war. This was the second time in my life that my beloved husband had been restored to me from the dangers of war. Oh, the blessedness of having him once more with me! How was it that I, just I, had succeeded in emerging out of the flood of woe, in which so many had sunk, on to a safe and happy shore? Happy for those who, in such circumstances, can raise their eyes with joy to heaven, and send up warm thanks to their guide above. By this thanksgiving, which, because it is spoken in humility, they take to be humble, and of which they have no conception how arrogant and self-important it is in reality, they feel themselves relieved, inasmuch as they have, according to their own opinion, given a sufficient discharge for the benefit which has accrued to them, and which they call grace and favour. I could not put myself in that position. When I thought of the wretches whom I had seen in those abodes of misery, and when I thought of the lamentable mothers and wives whose dear ones had been hurried into torture and death by the same destiny as had so favoured me, when I thought of this, I found it impossible to be so immodest as to take this favour as having been sent by God and one for which I was entitled to give thanks. It appeared to me that just as, a little while before, Frau Walter, our housekeeper, had swept her broom over a cupboard, on which a swarm of ants who scented sugar were collected, so fate had swept over the bohemian battlefields. The poor busy black things were mostly crushed, killed, scattered, but a few remained uninjured. Now would it have been reasonable and proper in them if they had sent up their heartfelt thanks for this to Frau Walter? No, I could not entirely banish the woe out of my heart by means of the joy of meeting again, however great that were. I neither could nor did I wish to do so. I was not able to help, to dress wounds, nurse, wait on the sick, like those sisters of mercy and the courageous Frau Simon had done. My strength was not sufficient for that, but the mercy which consists in compassion that I had offered up to my poor brother men, and that I could not withdraw from them again in my selfish contentment, I could not forget. But if I might not triumph and give thanks, yet I well might love, might clasp the beloved one to my heart with a hundredfold the former tenderness. Oh, Frederick, Frederick, I repeated amidst our tears and caresses, have I got you again? And you wanted to seek me out and nurse me. How heroic and how foolish, Martha. Foolish? Yes, there I agree with you. The appealing voice which drew me on was imagination, superstition, for you were not calling for me, but heroic. No. If you knew how cowardly I showed myself when face to face with misery, it was only you. If you had been lying there, that I could have nursed. I have seen horrors, Frederick, that I can never forget. Oh, this beautiful world of ours, how can people so spoil it, Frederick? A world in which two beings can so love each other as you and I do, in which there can glow such a fire of bliss as in our union. How can it be so foolish? as to rake up the flames of hate which brings death and woe in its train. I also have seen something horrible, Martha, something that I can never forget. Just think of Godfrey versus Tessau, 
rushing wildly upon me with uplifted sword. It was in the cavalry action at Sadoa. Aunt Rosalie's son, the same. He recognised me in time and let the blade sink which he had already raised. He acted in that directly contrary to his duty. How? To spare an enemy of his king and country under the worthless pretext that he was his own dear friend and cousin. Poor fellow, he had scarcely let his arm fall when a sabre whistled over his head. It was my next man, a young officer, who wanted to defend his lieutenant colonel and... Frederick stopped and covered his face with both hands. Killed, I asked, shuddering. He nodded. Mama, mamma resounded from the next room, and the door was burst open. It was my sister Lily, leading little Rudolph by the hand. Forgive me if I interrupt your tete-a-tete on meeting again, but this boy was too ardently eager to see his mamma to be denied. I hastened to the child and pressed him passionately to my heart. Ah, poor, poor Aunt Rosalie. On the very same day, the surgeon who had been summoned by telegraph from Vienna arrived at the chateau and undertook the treatment of Frederick's wound. Six weeks of the most perfect rest, and his cure would be complete. That my husband should quit the service was a point perfectly settled between us two. Of course, this could not be carried out till the war was at an end. The war might, however, be practically looked on as over. After the renunciation of Venice, the conflict with Italy was ended. Napoleon's friendship secured, and we should be in a position to conclude peace on moderate terms with the northern conqueror. Our emperor himself was most ardently desirous to put an end to the unlucky campaign, and would not expose his capital to a siege also. The Prussian victories in the rest of Germany, joined to the entry of the Prussians into Frankfurt on the Main, which took place on July the 16th, invested our adversaries with a halo, which, like all success, extorted admiration even from our countrymen, and awoke a sort of belief that it was a historical mission which was thus being carried out by Prussia through the battles she had won. The words suspension of hostilities, peace, having been once let drop, one could count on their taking effect, as certainly as in the times when a threatening of war has once found vent one may reckon on its breaking out sooner or later. Even my father himself admitted that under the stress of circumstances a suspension of hostilities was desirable. The army was debilitated, the superiority of the needle gun must be recognised, and an advance of the enemy's troops on the capital, the blockade of Vienna, and along with that the destruction of Grummets. These were possibilities which were not particularly alluring to even my warlike papa. His trust in the invincibility of the Austrian troops had then received a severe shock by present facts, and it is, speaking generally, a predisposition of the human mind to infer from the events passing before us that they will recur in a series, that on one success another success will follow, on one misfortune a fresh misfortune. So it is better to stop in the run of bad luck the time of satisfaction and of vengeance will come one day. Vengeance, and always repeated vengeance. Every war must leave one side defeated, and if this side can only find satisfaction in the next war, a war which must naturally produce another defeated side craving satisfaction, when is it to stop? How can justice be attained? When can old injustice be atoned? if fresh injustice is always to be employed as the means of atonement. It would never suggest itself to any reasonable man to wash out ink spots with ink and oil stains with oil. It is only blood which has always to be washed out with new blood. The frame of mind prevailing at Grummets was on the whole a gloomy one. In the village panic reigned. The Prussians are coming, the Prussians are coming was always the cry of terror, which they kept uttering still, in spite of the hopes of peace, 
which were cherished in many quarters, and people were packing up their treasures at home or burying them out of sight. Even in the chateau, Aunt Mary and Frau Walter had taken care that the family plate had been put in a secret place of concealment. Lily was in constant anxiety about Conrad, of whom there had been no news for several days. My father found himself wounded in his patriotic honour, and we too, Frederick and I, in spite of the bliss which lay deep in our hearts on account of our reunion, had been most painfully shaken by the miseries of the time which we had experienced, and with which we so warmly sympathised and from all sides flowed in constantly fresh food for this pain. In all the correspondence in the papers, in all our letters from relatives and acquaintance, there was nothing but complaints and lamentations. First there was a letter from Aunt Rosalie, who had not yet learned her unhappiness, but who spoke in such moving terms of the fear in which she was of having to lose her only child a letter over which we two shed bitter tears. And in the evening, when we sat all together, there was no more of cheerful chatter, seasoned with jokes, music, card-playing and interesting reading, but always, whether spoken or read, only histories of woe and death. We read nothing but newspapers, and these were filled with war, and nothing but war, and our talk related chiefly to the experiences which Frederick and I had brought back from the Bohemian battlefields. My departure thither had been, it is true, taken very ill by them all, but for all that they listened eagerly, as I related the events there, partly from my own observation, partly from what I had been told. Rosa was an enthusiast for Frau Simon, and swore that if the war was going to continue, she would join the Saxon Samaritans. Papa, of course, protested against this. With the exception of the Sisters of Charity and the Sutlers, no woman has any business in a war. You must surely see how useless our Martha showed herself to be. This was an unpardonable prank of yours, you silly child. Your husband ought to chastise you properly for it. Frederick stroked my hand. Yes, it was a folly, but a noble one. If I spoke of the horrors which I had seen with my own eyes, or which my travelling companions had related to me, in quite naked terms, I was often interrupted reproachfully by my father or Aunt Mary, with, How can people repeat such dreadful things? Or are you not ashamed as a woman, as a gently bred lady, to take such ugly words into your mouth? This exhausted my patience. Oh, away with your prudery, away with your affected decorum. Any cruelties may be committed, but it is not permitted to name them. Gently bred ladies are not to know anything about blood and filth, but they may embroider the flags which are to wave over this bath of blood. Maidens may not know anything of the cause which is to render their lovers incapable of reaping the reward of their love, but they are allowed to promise them that reward in order to inspire their martial ardour. Death and killing do not offer anything improper for you. Well-bred ladies, as you are, but at the bare mention of the things which are the sources of the implanted life, you must blush and look aside. That is cruel ethics, I would have you know, cruel and cowardly. This looking aside, with the bodily and the spiritual eye, it is to this that is due, the persistence of so much misery and injustice. If one had but the courage to look steadily, whenever one's fellow creatures are pining in pain and misery, and the courage to reflect on what one saw. Don't get excited, interrupted Aunt Mary. However much we might look, and however much we might reflect, we should never be able to chase evil from the earth. It is now, once for all, a veil of misery, and will ever remain so. It will not, I replied, and so at least I had the last word. End of section 53
Section 54 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 13, Part 2. The danger that peace will be concluded is coming steadily nearer, said my brother Otto, complainingly one day. We were sitting at the time at the family table again, Frederick on the sofa near us, and someone had just read out of the newspapers the tidings that Benedetti had arrived in Bohemia, obviously entrusted with the mission of suggesting proposals for peace. My little brother, he was indeed big enough by this time, but I had got into the habit of calling him so. My little brother was in fear of nothing so much as that the war would come to a speedy end, and it would not be his lot to chase the enemy out of the country. For the news had just come from the Neustadt, that in case hostilities had to be resumed, then at the next period of calling out the reserves, that is, next August the 18th, not only the recruits of the last year, but also a large proportion of the last but one, would have to go at once into active service. This prospect delighted the young hero. Straight from the academy into the field. What rapture! Just so a schoolgirl looks out into the world, to her first ball. She has learned to dance, the Neustadt scholar has learned to shoot and fence. She longs to display her powers under a blazing chandelier in evening dress, to the accompaniment of the orchestra, and he longs no less for the smart uniform and the great artillery dance. My father was, of course, pleased in the highest degree at his darling's martial ardour. By easy, my brave boy, he said in reply to Otto's sigh over the threat of peace, patting him the while on the shoulder. You have a long life before you. Even if the campaign were to come to an end now, it must break out again in a year or two. I said nothing. Since my outbreak against Aunt Mary, I had, on Frederick's advice, formed and carried out the resolution to avoid these painful disputes on the subject of war as far as possible. It would lead to nothing but bitter feelings, and after having seen the traces of the grim scourge with my own eyes, I had so increased my hatred and my contempt for war that all defence of it cut into my soul like a personal insult. About Frederick we were indeed at one. He was to quit the service, and I was also clear on this point, that my son Rudolph should not be put into any military institution where the whole of the education is directed and must, to be consistent, be directed to awaken in the young a longing for deeds of war. I once asked my brother what might be the views which were put before the students on the subject of war. His replies came to something like what follows. War was represented as a necessary evil. Thus, at any rate, evil, a concession to the spirit of the age but at the same time as the chief excitant of the noblest of human virtues, such as courage, the power of self-renunciation and the spirit of sacrifice, as the bestower of the greatest glory, and lastly, as the mightiest factor in the development of civilization, The mighty conquerors and founders of the so-called universal empires, Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, were quoted as the most exalted specimens of human greatness and recommended for admiration. The successes and the advantages of war were set forth in the liveliest colours, while they passed over in complete silence the drawbacks which inevitably came in its train, its barbarising influence, its ruinous effects, the moral and physical degeneration it causes. Yes, assuredly, for the same system was pursued in my case, in the education of girls, and it was thus that was kindled in my childish spirit the admiration of warlike laurels which at first inspired me. 
if I had even myself been full of regret that the possibility of plucking these laurels did not beckon me on as it did the boys, could I now take it ill in a boy if such a possibility filled him with joy and with impatience? And so I answered nothing to Otto's complaint, but quietly went on with my reading. I was, as usual, reading a newspaper, and that was filled, as usual, with news from the theatre of war. Here is an interesting correspondence of a physician who accompanied the retreat of our troops. Shall I read it aloud? I asked. The retreat, cried Otto. I had rather not hear about that. Now, if it were the history of the retreat of the foe, hotly pursued. As a general principle, it surprises me, remarked Frederick, that any one should tell the tale of a flight which he has accompanied. That it is an episode of war, which the people concerned in it generally pass over in silence. An orderly retreat is, however, not a flight, interposed my father. We had one in 49. It was under Radetsky. I knew the story and prevented its continuation by interposing. This account was sent to a medical weekly paper and therefore was not intended for military circles. Listen. And without further request for permission, I read out the passage. It was about four o'clock when our troops began the retreat. We doctors were fully occupied dressing the wounded, to the number of some hundreds who could bear removal. Suddenly cavalry broke in on us and spread themselves beside and behind us. Over hills and fields, accompanied by artillery and baggage wagons, towards Conigratz. Many riders fell and were stamped to pieces by the horses that came behind. Wagons overturned and crushed the footmen, who were pressed in amongst them. We were scattered away from the dressing station, which disappeared all at once. They shouted to us, Save yourselves! While this cry went on, we heard the thunder of the cannon and splinters of shell began to fall amongst our crowd. And so we were carried forward by the press, without knowing whither. I despaired of my life. My poor old mother, my dear espoused bride, farewell. On a sudden we had water before us. On the right a railway embankment. On the left a hollow way stopped up with clumsy baggage and sick wagons, and behind us an innumerable crowd of horsemen. We began to wade through the water. Now came the order to cut the traces of the horses, to save the horses and leave the wagons behind. The wagons of the wounded also. Yes, those two. We on foot were almost in despair. We were wading again over our knees in water, every moment in fear of being shot down or drowned. At last we got into a railway station, which again was closely barred. Many broke through the barrier, the rest leaped over it. I, with thousands of the infantry soldiers, ran on. Now we came to a river, waded through it, then clambered over some palisades, passed again through a second river up to our necks, clambered up some rising ground, leaped over fallen trees, and arrived about 1 a.m., at a little wood where we sank down from exhaustion and fever. About three o'clock we marched, that is, some of us, another part had to remain and die there. We marched on still dripping with wet and shuddering with cold. The villages were all empty, no men, no provisions, not even a drop of drinking water. The air was poisoned, corpses covering the cornfields, bodies black as coal, with the eyes fallen from their sockets. Enough! Enough! cried the girls. The censorship should not allow the publication of things of that sort, said my father. It might destroy a man's love for the profession of a soldier. And especially the love for war, which would be a pity, I murmured half aloud. As a general rule, he went on, about these episodes of flight, the people who have been present at them should observe a decorous silence, for it is surely no honour to have borne a part at a general, suave qui peur. The fellow who by shouting, save yourselves, gives the signal for scampering, 
should be shot down on the spot. One coward raises the shout, and a thousand brave men are demoralised thereby, and obliged to run with them. Exactly so, replied Frederick, just as when one brave man shouts forward, a thousand cowards are obliged to rush on, and thus are really animated by a merely momentary courage. Men cannot in general be divided so sharply into courageous and cowards, but every one has his moments of more or less courage, and those of more or less cowardice and especially when one is dealing with masses of men, each individual is dependent on the condition of his comrades. We are gregarious animals, and are under the domination of gregarious feelings. Where one sheep leaps over, the others leap after him. Where one man rushes on shouting hurrah, the others shout and rush after him. And when one dashes down his musket into the corn, in order to run away, the others run after him. In the one case, our brave troops get praised. In the other, their proceedings are passed over in silence. Yet they are all the same persons. Yes, they are the very same men, who, obeying in each case a common impulse, behave and feel at one time courageously, at another cowardly. Bravery and fear are to be regarded, not as fixed qualities, but rather as states of the spirits just like joy and grief. I, during my first campaign, was once involved in the whirl of one of these panic flights. In the official account of the Etat Major, it is true the affair was passed over in a few words as an orderly retreat, but in fact it was a thorough rout. They rushed on, madly raging in indescribable confusion. Arms, knapsacks, shakos and cloaks were cast away no word of command could be heard panting shrieking hounded on by despair the disbanded battalion streamed on with the enemy pursuing and firing after them that is one of the many gruesome phases of war the most gruesome when the two adversaries figure no longer as warriors but as hunter and prey Thence arises in the hunter the most cruel lust of blood, in the prey the most bitter fear of death. The pursued, hunted and spurred by fear, get into a kind of delirium. All the feelings and sentiments in which they have been educated, and which animate a man as he is rushing into battle, such as love of country, ambition, thirst for noble deeds, all these are lost to the fugitive. He is filled with one impulse only, in its greatest force, liberated from all restraint, and that the most vehement which can assume the mastery of a living being, the impulse of self-preservation, and this, as danger comes nearer, rises to the highest paroxysm of terror. End of section 54「Section 55 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 13, Part 3. Frederick's recovery progressed, surely. The feverish outer world, too, seemed to come nearer to recovery. The word peace was always being spoken more frequently, and always louder. The advance of the Prussians, who found no longer any opposition on the way, and who were quietly drawing on towards Vienna, by way of Brune, the keys of which were delivered by the Burgomaster to King William, this advance was more in the nature of a military promenade, than an operation of war, and on July the 26th, a regular suspension of arms at Nicholsburg was ended by the preliminaries of peace. My father had a great delight in the reception of the news of Admiral Tegethoff's victory at Lysa. Italian ships blown into the air, the Affondatori destroyed. What a satisfaction! I could not with perfect honesty take my share in his joy. 
speaking generally, I could not understand why, since Venice had already been surrendered, these naval actions should be fought at all. So much, however, is certain that there broke out over this event the most lively shout of joy, not from my father only, but from all the Viennese papers. The fame of a victory in war is a thing which has been swollen up to such a size through the traditions of a thousand years, that even from the mere news of one, some share of pride is spread over the whole population. If anywhere a general of your country has beaten a general of a foreign country, every single subject of the state in question is congratulated. And since each man hears that all the rest are rejoicing, a thing which in itself is exhilarating, why each man ends by rejoicing, in fact. This is what Frederick called feeling in droves. Another political event of those days was that Austria at length joined the Geneva Convention. Well, are you contented now? asked my father as he read the news. Do you agree that war, which you are always calling a barbarity, is always becoming more humane as civilization progresses? I too am indeed in favour of carrying on war humanely. The wounded should have the most careful nursing and all possible relief, even on strategic principles, which in the long run are surely the most important in warlike matters. By a proper treatment of the sick, very many may become fit for service again and be replaced in the ranks in a shorter space of time. You are right, Papa. Material to be used again, that is the chief thing. But after the things which I have seen, no Red Cross will be enough, even if they had ten times as much of men and means, to conjure away the misery which one battle brings with it. No, indeed, not to conjure it away, but to mitigate it. What cannot be prevented, one must always seek to mitigate. Experience teaches that no sufficient mitigation is possible. I should therefore wish the maxim to be inverted. What cannot be mitigated ought to be prevented. It began to be a fixed idea with me that war must cease, and every individual must contribute all that he is able to bring mankind nearer to this end. Were it but by the thousandth part of a line, I could not get away from the scenes which I had witnessed in Bohemia, especially at night, when I woke out of a sound sleep, I would feel that sore pain at my heart, and felt at the same time in my conscience the admonition, just as if someone was giving me the command, Stop it, prevent it, do not suffer it. It was not till I was wide awake and thought on what I was, that the perception of my impotence came over me. What then was I to stop or to prevent? A man might as well order me, in face of the sea swelling with winds and waves, not to suffer it, dry it up. And my next thought was, especially as I listened to his breathing, one of deep happiness. I have Frederick again, and I would plunge into this idea as vividly as I could. And then I would put my arm round him as he lay beside me, even at the risk of wakening him, and kiss his lips. My son Rudolph had really reason to be jealous of his stepfather, and this feeling was actually aroused in the boy's heart, especially since recent days. That I had gone away from Grummets without bidding him goodbye, that after my return my first wish was not to embrace him, that as a general rule I did not move from my husband's side for almost the whole day. All this put together caused the poor little fellow, one fine morning, to throw himself weeping on my neck and sob out. Mamma, mamma, you do not love me a bit. What nonsense are you talking, child? Yes, only, only papa, I, I will not grow up at all if you no longer like me. No longer like you? You, my treasure? I kissed and caressed the weeping child. You, my only son, my pride, the joy of my future. I love you so, so above, no, not above everything, but infinitely. 
After this little scene, my love for my boy came more vividly into my feelings. In the days just past, I had in fact been so much engrossed by my fears for Frederick that poor Rudolph had got thrust a little into the background. The plans which Frederick and I had made up between ourselves for the future were as follows. After the war was over, to quit the military service and retire to some small cheap place where Frederick's pension as colonel and what I could contribute would suffice to keep up our little household. We rejoiced over this solitary, independent life together, as if we had been a pair of young lovers. By means of the events of our recent experience, we had been taught thoroughly that we each formed the whole world to the other. Little Rudolph, moreover, was not excluded from this fellowship. His education was a main business in filling up the existence we were planning. We were not to pass our days therein in idleness and without any aim. Amongst other things, we had marked out a whole list of studies which we were to pursue in common. In a special, there was among the sciences a branch of the science of law, international, to which Frederick intended to devote himself particularly. His aim was, quite apart from all utopian and sentimental theory, to investigate the practical side of national peace. By means of the perusal of Buckle, to which I had given him the impulse, by means of an acquaintance with the newest acquisitions in natural philosophy, which had been revealed to him in the works of Darwin, Buckner and others. The conviction had come before him that the world was arriving at a new phase of knowledge and to make this knowledge his own as far as possible appeared to him sufficient to fill up life along with domestic pleasures. My father, who meanwhile knew nothing of our views, was making quite other plans for the future on our behalf. You will now, Tilling, be colonel at an early age, and in ten years you will certainly be general. A fresh war will no doubt break out again about that time, and you may get the command of an entire corps d'armée, or who knows but what that you may reach the rank of commander-in-chief and perhaps the great happiness may come to you of restoring the arms of Austria to their full glory, which is now for the moment obscured. When we have once adopted the needle gun, or perhaps some still more effectual system, we shall soon have the best in a war with these gentlemen of Prussia. Who knows, I suggested, perhaps our enmity with Prussia will cease. Perhaps we shall some day conclude an alliance with them. My father shrugged his shoulders. If women would only abstain from talking politics, he said disdainfully. After what has taken place, we have to chastise these insolent fellows. We have to get the annexed, as they call them, I call them plundered, states back to their severed allegiance. That is what our honour demands, and the interest of our position amongst the powers of Europe Friendship, alliance with these transgressors? Never, unless they came and begged humbly for it. In that case, remarked Frederick, we should perhaps set our feet on their necks. Alliances are sought and concluded only with those whom one respects, or who can offer one protection against a common foe. In statecraft, the ruling principle is egotism. Oh yes, my father replied, if the ego means one's country, everything else is certainly to be subordinated to it. And everything is certainly allowable and commanded, which seems serviceable to its interests. It is, however, to be wished, answered Frederick, that in the behaviour of communities, the same elevated civilization should be reached, as has banished from the behaviour of individuals the rough self-worship, resting on fist law, and that the view should prevail more and more that one's own interests are really most effectually furthered by avoiding damage to those of foreigners, or rather in union with the latter. But Frederick could not, of course, repeat this long sentence and illustrate it, and so the discussion ended. I shall be at Grummet's tomorrow at one o'clock, Conrad. Everyone can imagine the delight which this telegram caused Lily. 
no other arrival is hailed with such joy and rapture as that of one returning from the wars. It is true that in this case there was not also what is the favourite subject of the common ballads and engravings, viz. the conqueror's return, but the human feelings of the loving sweetheart would not be interfered with by patriotic considerations, and if Conrad had taken the city of Berlin, I believe this would not have availed to heighten the warmth of Lily's reception of him. To him, of course, it would have been better if he had come home along with troops who had been victorious, if he had contributed to conquer the province of Silesia for his emperor. Meantime, the very fact of having fought is in itself an honour for a soldier. Even if he is one of the beaten, nay, one of the fallen, the latter is even more especially glorious. Thus Otto told us that in the academy at Weiner Neustadt the names of all the students were inscribed on a table of honour, to whom the advantage had befallen of having been left dead on the battlefield. To à l'ennemi, they say in France, and in that country, as everywhere else, it is a much prized ancestral distinction. The more progenitors one can point out in one's family who have lost their lives in battles, whether won or lost, the prouder is the descendant of that. The more value may he set on his name, the less value on his life. In order to show oneself worthy of one's slain ancestors, one must have a lively joy of one's own in slaying, active and passive. Well, so much the better is it that as long as war exists, there should also be found people who see therein elevation and inspiration, nay, even pleasure. The number, however, of these people is daily becoming less, while the number of the soldiers becomes daily greater. Whither must this finally lead? To its becoming intolerable, and whither will this lead? Conrad did not think so deeply. His way of looking at it was excellently expressed by the well-known song of the lieutenant in the Dame Blanche. Oh, what delight is a soldier's life, what delight! To hear him speak, one might have actually envied him the expedition of which he had just formed part. My brother Otto was really filled with this envy. This warrior returned from his baptism of blood and fire, who even before looked so knightly in his hussar uniform, and who was now also adorned with an honourable scar over his chin, received in the shower of bullets, who had perhaps given their quietus to so many of the foe, he seemed to him now surrounded by a nimbus of glory. It was not a successful campaign, that I must admit, said Conrad, but I have brought back from it one or two grand reminiscences. Tell us, tell us, Lily and Otto besought him. Well, I cannot give you many details. The whole thing lies behind me like a dream. The powder gets into one's head in such a strange way. The intoxication, in fact, or the fever, the martial fire, in a word, begins from the moment of marching. The parting from one's love, indeed, comes hard on one. It was the one hour in which my breast was full of tender pain. But when one is once off with one's comrades, when the thought is, now I am going on the highest duty which life can lay on a man, viz. to defend my beloved country, when, then, the musicians struck up Radetzky's march and the silken folds of the flags rustled in the wind, I must confess, Lily, that at that moment I would not have turned back. No, not into the arms of my love. Then I felt that I should never be worthy of that love, except by doing my duty out there by the side of my brethren. That we were marching to victory we did not doubt. What did we know about the horrible needle bullets? It was they alone that were the cause of our defeat. I tell you they fell in our ranks like hail, and we had also bad leaders. Benedek, you will see, will yet be brought before a court-martial. We should have attacked. If I should ever become a general, my tactics would be to advance. Always advance. 
play a forward game, invade the enemy's country, that surely is only another kind, and the most weighty one too of defence. If it must be so, go forward, forward go, the way is found by never looking back, as the poet says. However, that is nothing to the point. The emperor has not put me in command, and so I am not responsible for the tactical blunders. The generals must see how they are to settle with their military superiors and with their own consciences. We officers and soldiers did our duty. We had to fight, and fight we did. And that is a grand sensation in itself. The very expectation, the very excitement one feels when one rushes onto the foe, and when the word goes round, now it is afoot. This consciousness that in that moment a portion of the world's history is being enacted, and then the pride, the joy in one's own courage, death right and left, great and mysterious, and yet one bids him a manly defiance. Just like poor Godfrey Tessau, murmured Frederick to himself, well, of course, it is the same school. Conrad went on eagerly. One's heart beats higher, one's pulse flutters, there awakes, and that is the peculiar rapture of it. There wakes the joy of battle. The rage, the hate of the foe blazes up, and at the same time, the most burning love for one's menaced country, while the onward rush, the hewing down at them becomes a delight. One feels transported into another world from that in which one grew up. A world in which all the ordinary feelings and ways of looking at things are changed into their opposites. Life is changed into plunder. Killing becomes a duty. Only, however, heroism, the most magnificent self-sacrifice, are left surviving. All other conceptions have perished in the tumult. Then add the powder smoke, the battle cries. I tell you, it is a state of things to which no parallel is to be found elsewhere. At the most, perhaps the same fire may glow through one in the lion or tiger hunt, when one stands in the face of the maddened wild beast and... Yes, broke in Frederick, the fight against an enemy who threatens you with death, the longing, proud desire of conquering him, fills you with peculiar enjoyment. Pray forgive me the word, Aunt Mary, as indeed everything which sustains or expands life is guaranteed to us by nature, through the reward of joy. As long as man was in peril from savage assailants, on two legs or four, and could only protect his life by killing the latter, battle became one of his delights. If in the midst of a fight the same pleasure creeps through our veins, still, though we are civilised men, it is only a reminiscence of heredity. And at the present time, when there are in Europe no more savages or beasts of prey, in order that this delight may not vanish from us entirely, we have invented artificial assailants for ourselves. This is what goes on. Attention. You wear blue coats, and those men there, red coats. As soon as we clap hands three times, the red coats will be turned for you into tigers, and the blue coats will become wild beasts to them. So now, one, two, three, blow the charge, beat the attack, and now you can set off and devour each other, and after ten thousand, or always in proportion to the rise in the magnitude of armies, one hundred thousand artificial tigers have devoured each other with mutual delight in the battle at Exdorf. Then you have the battle of Exdorf, which is to become historical. And then the men who clap hands assemble round a green congress table in Ekstadt, rule lines for altered frontiers on the map, haggle over the proportion of contributions, sign a paper which figures in the historical annals as the piece of Ekstadt, clap their hands three times once more, and say to the redcoats and the bluecoats surviving, embrace each other. Men and Brethren End of section 55
Section number 56 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Voice of Landis, Zanesville. You can find me at VoiceOfLandis.com. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha Von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 14, Part 1. The Prussians advance on Vienna. Prussian officers quartered at Grimmitz. My brother Otto's warlike ardor. He gets into trouble. A grand dinner to self-invited guests. Sudden engagement of my sister Rosa to Prince Henry von Rus. General felicity and enjoyment. Departure of the Prussians. Outbreak of cholera at Grimmitz. The chateau is infected. First some of the servants, then my sisters, then Otto die of cholera. And lastly, my father dies from heart disease, cursing war with his last breath. Conrad's suicide. There were Prussians quartered everywhere in the neighborhood, and now Grummets had to come into the circle. Though the suspension of hostilities was already in force, and peace was almost certain, Yet general fear and mistrust reign throughout the people. The idea that these spike-helmeted tigers would tear them to pieces if they could was not easily eradicated out of the people. The three claps of the hand at Nicholsburg had not yet availed to undo the effect of the three claps of the declaration of war, and to make the country folk look on the Prussians again in the light of brothers. The very name of the opposing nation gathers round it in wartime a whole host of hateful implied meanings, it is not merely the distinctive name of a nation hostile for the moment, but it becomes the synonym for enemy, and comprises in itself all the repugnance which that word expresses. And so it happened that the folks in the neighborhood trembled, as before wolves broken loose, if a Prussian quartermaster came there to procure lodging for his troops. With some besides fear, hatred also was expressed and these thought that they were discharging a patriotic duty if they did anything to injure a Prussian. If they sent a rifle bullet out of some place of concealment after the foe. This had often taken place, and if the guilty party was caught, he was executed without much circumstance. These examples had the effect of making the people suppress their hatred and receive without opposition the soldiers quartered on them. Then they found, to their no small amazement, that the enemy really consisted of nothing but good-humored, friendly fellows who paid their way honestly. One morning, it was early in August, I was sitting in the bow window of the library and looking out through the open window. From this point was a long view over the surrounding country. I thought I saw from a distance a troop of cavalry moving along the high road in our direction. Prussians coming for quarters was my first thought. I adjusted a telescope which stood in the bow and looked towards the point in question. Right. It was a troop of about ten riders with waving black and white little flags on the points of their lances, and among them a man on foot in hunting costume. Why was he walking in the way between the horses? A prisoner? The glass was not powerful enough. I could not make out whether the man I took for a prisoner might not be one of our own foresters. Still, it was right to warn the inhabitants of the chateau of the fate impending over them. I hastily left the library to look for Papa and Aunt Mary. I found both in the drawing room. The Prussians are coming! The Prussians are coming! I announced to them breathlessly. One is always glad to be able to be the first to communicate important tidings. Devil take them! was my father's rather inhospitable exclamation. While Aunt Mary hit on the right thing to do, as she said, I will immediately give Frau Walter her orders for the necessary preparations. And where is Otto, I asked. Someone must acquaint him and warn him not to let his hatred of the Prussians peep out anyhow, and not to be uncivil to the guests. Otto is not at home, replied my father. He went out early today after the partridges, you should have seen him. How well his hunting dress sat on him. He grows a fine fellow. My delight is in him. Meanwhile, the house filled with noise. Hasty steps were heard and excited voices. 
They are come already, those windbags, muttered my father. The door was dashed open, and Franz, the valet de chambre, rushed in. The Prussians, the Prussians, he shouted, in the same tone as one calls, fire, fire. Well, they won't eat us, growled my father. But they are bringing a man with them, a man from Grummets, the man went on in a trembling voice. I do not know who it is. He has fired on them, and who would not like to fire on such a scum? But it is all over with him. Now one heard the tramp of horses and tumult of voices together. We went down to the ground floor and looked through the windows which opened out into the courtyard. At that moment the Ulans came riding in, and in their midst with pale, defiant face, Otto, my brother. My father uttered a shriek and hurried down the steps. My heart stood still. The scene before us was horrible. If Otto had really fired at the Prussian soldiers, which seemed very like him, I dared not think of the conclusion. I had not the courage to go after my father. Consolation and insistence and all sorrows I always sought from Frederick only. So I collected myself in order to betake myself to Frederick's room. But before I got there, my father came back again, and Otto after him. By their bearing, I saw that the danger was over. The hearing of the matter had given the following result. The shot had been discharged accidentally. When the Ulans came riding on, Otto wanted to see them close, ran across the field, stumbled, fell down into a ditch, and in doing so, discharged his gun. At the first moment, the statement of the young sportsman was doubted by the men. They took him in their midst and brought him to the chateau as their prisoner. But when it came out that the young gentleman was the son of General Otthaus and was himself a military student, they accepted his explanation. The son of a soldier and himself a future soldier might well fire on hostile soldiers in honorable fight, but not in a time of truce, and not like an assassin. On this speech of my father's, the Prussian subaltern had set the young man free. And are you really innocent? I asked Otto. For from your hatred of the Prussians, it would not surprise me if... He shook his head. I shall, I trust, have plenty of opportunities in the course of my life to fire at a few of them, but not from behind, not without exposing my heart, too, to their bullets. Bravo, my boy, cried my father, delighted by these words. I could not share his delight. All these phrases in which life, whether one's own or another's, is tossed about so contemptuously and so boastfully, have a repellent tone for me. But I was glad at heart that the matter had passed over thus. How horrible would it have been for my poor father if these men had shot down the presumed malefactor without more ado? In that case, the unhappy war by which our house had hitherto been spared would have yet plunged it into misery. The detachment in question had come in the regular way to take up quarters. Schloss Grummets had been selected as the habitation of two colonels and six officers of the Prussian army. The men were to be lodged in the village. Two men were to be set as sentinels in the courtyard of the chateau. An hour or two after the settlement of the quarters, the involuntary and self-invited guests made their entry into our house. We had been prepared for the event for several days, and Frau Walter had seen that all the guest chambers and beds were in readiness. The cook also had laid in plenty of provisions, and the cellar held a sufficient number of full barrels and old bottles. The Prussian gentlemen should not find any scarcity in our house. End of section 56. Recording by Voice of Landis, Zanesville. You can find me at voiceoflandis.com. Section 57 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Rando. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 14, Part 2. When the company in the chateau mustered in the drawing room that day at the sound of the dinner bell, the room presented a brilliant and lively picture. The gentlemen, all excepting minister to be sure, who was our guest for the moment, all in uniform, 
the ladies in full dress. For the first time for a long while, we were all in our glory, Lori especially, the lively Lori, who had arrived that same day from Vienna, had on the news that foreign officers were to be present, unpacked her fine dresses, and adorned herself with fresh roses. The object, no doubt, was to turn the head of one or other of the members of the enemy's army. Well, as far as I was concerned, she might have conquered the whole Prussian battalion, so she left Frederick undazzled. Lily, the happy fiancé, wore a light blue robe. Rosa, who also seemed very happy to have the chance once more of showing herself off to young cavaliers, was dressed in pink muslin, and I, feeling that wartime, even if one has no person to mourn, is always a time of mourning, put on a black dress. I recollect still the singular impression which it made on me when I entered the drawing room, in which the rest were already assembled. Glitter, cheerfulness, distinguished elegance, the well-dressed ladies, the smart uniforms. What a contrast to the scenes of woe, filth, and terror that I had seen so short a time since. And it is these same glittering, cheerful, elegant personages who of their own accord set this woe in motion, who refuse to do anything to abolish it, who on the contrary glorify it, and by means of their gold lace and stars testify the pride which they find in being the agents and props of this system of woe. My entrance broke up the conversation which was being carried on in the different groups, since all our Prussian guests had to be introduced to me, most of them distinguished sounding names ending in Al and in Wits, many Vons and even a Prince, one Henry, I don't know of what number, of the House of Rose. Such then were our enemies, perfect gentlemen with the most exquisite manners in society. Well, certainly one knows as much as this, that if war is to be carried on at the present day with the neighboring nation, one has not to do with Hans and Vandals, but for all that it would be much more natural to think of the enemy as a horde of savages, and it requires some effort to look upon them as honorable and civilized citizens. God, who drivest back by thy mighty protection, the adversaries of those who trust in thee, hear us graciously as we pray for thy mercy, so that the rage of the enemy having been suppressed we may praise thee to all eternity. This was the prayer daily offered by the priests at Grummets. What conception must there have been formed by the common people of this raging enemy? Certainly not anything like these courteous noblemen who were now giving their arms to the ladies present to take them to dinner. Besides this, God this time had listened to the prayer of the other side and had suppressed our rage the foaming, murderous foe who through the might of the divine protection, which, to be sure, we call the needle gun, had been driven back were ourselves. Oh, what a pious concatenation of nonsense! I was thinking something to this effect as we were sitting down in a brilliant row at the table, adorned with flowers and dishes of fruit. The silver, too, had been brought out of its hiding place at the order of the master of the house. I was seated between a stately colonel, ending in owl, and a tall lieutenant in its, Lily, of course, by her lover's side. Rosa had been taken in to dinner by Prince Henry, and the naughty Lori had once again succeeded in getting my Frederick as her next-door neighbor. But what of that? I was not going to be jealous. He was assuredly my Frederick, my very own. The conversation was very abundant and very lively. The Prussians evidently felt highly pleased, after the tolls and privations they had gone through, to be sitting down again at a well-furnished table and in good company, and the consciousness that the campaign which was ended had been a victorious one must certainly have contributed to raise their spirits. But even we, the vanquished, did not allow anything of grudge or humiliation to appear and did all we could to play the part of the most amiable of hosts. To my father, it must have cost some self-control, as I could judge from knowing his sentiments, but he played his part throughout with exemplary courtesy. 
The one who was most dejected was Otto. It was visibly against the grain for him, with the hatred which he had been cherishing against the Prussians in these late days, with his eagerness to chase them out of the country, to have now to reach the pepper and salt for this same foe in the most polite manner, instead of being allowed to pierce him with a bayonet. The topic of the war was carefully avoided in the conversation. The foreigners were treated by us as if they had been pleasure travelers who happened to be passing through our neighborhood, and they themselves, with still greater caution, avoided even hinting at the real state of things, viz., that they were stationed here as our conquerors. My young lieutenant even tried, quite in earnest, to pay his court to me. He swore by his honor and credit that there was no such pleasant place in the world as Austria, and that there, shooting sideways a needle-gun glance, the most charming women in the world were to be found. I do not deny that I too coquetted a little with the smart son of Mars, but that was to show Lori Griesbaugh and her neighbor that in a certain given case I was capable of having my revenge. The folks opposite, however, remained quite as undisturbed as I myself was really at the bottom of my heart. It would have been more reasonable and more to the purpose, however, if my dashing lieutenant had directed his killing glances to the fair Lori. Conrad and Lily, in their character of engaged persons, and such folks should really be always put behind a grating, exchanged loving glances quite openly and whispered and clanked their glasses together by themselves and played all sorts of other drawing-room turtle-dove tricks. And as it seemed to me, a third flirtation began on the spot to develop itself. For the German prince, Henry the so-and-so, kept conversing in the most pressing way with my sister Rosa, and as it went on, his countenance became a picture of the most unconcealed admiration. When we rose from table, we went back into the drawing-room, in which the chandelier, which had now been lighted, diffused a festive glow. The door on to the terrace was open. Outside was the warm summer night, flooded by the gentle light of the moon. The evening star shed its rays over the grassy expanse of the park, fragrant with hay, and mirrored itself in glittering silver on the lake, which spread out in the background. Could that really be the same moon, which a short time ago had shown me the heap of corpses against the church wall, surrounded by the shrieking birds of prey? And were these people inside? Just then a Prussian lieutenant opened the piano to play one of Mendelssohn's leader on a vata. Could they be the same as were laying about them with their sabers a short time since to cleave men's skulls? After a time, Prince Henry and Rosa came out too. They did not see me in my dark corner and pass by me. They were now standing, leaning on the balustrade, near, very near each other. I even believe that the young Prussian, the foe, was holding my sister's hand in his. They were speaking low, but still some of the prince's words reached me. Charming girl, sudden, conquering passion, longing for domestic happiness. The die is cast. For mercy's sake, do not say no. Do I then inspire you with disgust? Rosa shook her head. Then he raised her hand to his lips and tried to put his arm round her waist. She, like a well-brought-up girl, disengaged herself at once. Ah, I would almost have preferred that the soft moonlight had then and there shone on the kiss of love. After all the pictures of hate and bitter woe, which I had been obliged to witness a short time ago, a picture of love and sweet pleasure would have seemed to me like some compensation. Oh, is it you, Martha? Rosa had now become aware of me and was at first very much shocked that anyone should have been listening at this scene, but then pacified that it was only me. The prince, however, was in the highest degree, discomposed and perplexed. He stepped towards me. I have just made an offer of my hand to your sister, gracious madam. Kindly say a word in my favor. My action may perhaps seem to both of you somewhat sudden and presumptuous. At another time, I should myself perhaps have proceeded more cautiously and more modestly, but in these last few weeks 
I have been accustoming myself to advance quickly and boldly. No hesitation or trembling was allowed then, and the practice which I formed in war I have now involuntarily again exercised in love. Pray forgive me and be favorable to me. You are silent, Countess. Do you refuse me your hand? My sister, said I, coming to Rosa's assistance, who was standing there in deep emotion with her head turned aside, cannot surely be expected to decide her fate so quickly. Who knows whether our father will give his consent to a marriage with an enemy? Who knows again whether Rosa will return an inclination so suddenly kindled? I know, she replied, and stretched out both her hands to the young man, and he pressed her warmly to his heart. Oh, you silly children, I said, and drew back a few paces to the drawing-room door to watch that, at least at that moment, no one should come out. End of section 57 Section 58 of Lay Down Your Arms This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Rando. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 14, Part 3. On the following day, the betrothal was celebrated. My father offered no opposition. I should have thought that his hatred of the Prussians would have made it impossible for him to receive into his family a hostile warrior and a victor, but whether it was that he separated altogether the individual question from the national, a common method of action, for one often hears people protest, I hate them as a nation, not as individuals. Though there is no sense in it, no more sense than if one were to say, I hate wine as a drink, but I swallow each drop with pleasure. Still, a phrase need not be rational in order to be popular, quite the contrary, or whether it was that ambition got the upper hand and an alliance with the princely house flattered him, or finally that the sudden love of the young folks so romantically expressed touched him. In short, he said yes and with seeming heartiness. Aunt Mary was less disposed to agree. Impossible, was her first exclamation. The prince is surely of the Lutheran sect. But in the end, she comforted herself with the consideration that Rosa would probably convert her husband. The deepest resentment it awoke was in Otto's heart. How would you like it, he said, supposing the war was to break out again? that I should chase my brother-in-law out of the country? But to him also the famous theory of the difference between nation and individual was explained, and to my astonishment, for I could never understand it, he understood it. How quickly and easily does one in happy circumstances forget the misery one has gone through? Two pairs of lovers, or if I may venture to say so, three, for Frederick and I, the married ones were not much less in love with each other than the betrothed. Well, so many pairs of lovers in the little company gave an air of felicity to everything. For the next day or two, Schlotz Grommets was an abode of cheerfulness and worldly enjoyment. I, too, gradually felt the pictures of terror of the past weeks fading out of my remembrance. It was not without reproaches of conscience that I became aware how my compassion, which had been so burning a short time since, was at some moments quite gone. It is true that sounds of mourning still came pealing from the world without, the complaints of people who in the war had lost goods or money or lives of those dear to them, accounts of threatened financial catastrophes, of the outbreak of pestilence, it was said that the cholera had shown itself among the Prussian troops. A case had even been reported in our village, but only a doubtful one, it is true. It might be diarrhea, which occurs every summer, was the consolatory remark. Let us only chase away troubled thoughts and anxious fears with, it is nothing, or it has passed over, or it will not come, 
All this is so easy to say. All that is wanted is a vigorous shake of the head and the unpleasant facts are gone. I say, Martha, said the happy fiancé to me one day, this war was indeed a horrible thing, and yet I must bless it. Without it, should I ever have been so immeasurably happy as I am now? Should I ever have had the opportunity of making Henry's acquaintance? And as to him, would he ever have found a bride to love him so? Very well, dear Rosa, I shall be happy to share this view of it with you. Let your two hearts made happy be weighed against the many thousands of hearts that have been broken. But it is not only individual destinies that are concerned, Martha. In the gross and on the whole war also brings great gain to those who conquer, and therefore to a whole nation. You must hear Henry talk on that subject. He says Prussia shines out grandly. In the army universal exultation reigns, and enthusiastic thankfulness and love for the generals who have led it to victory. And in this way, there arises for German civilization, for commerce, or perhaps, he said, for the prosperity of Germany. I have forgot the exact term. It's historical mission. In short, you should hear him talk himself. Why does not your fiancé prefer to speak of your love rather than of political and military matters? Oh, we speak about everything, and everything he says sounds like music in my ears. I feel that it is so good for him that he is proud and happy to have joined in fighting out this war for his king and country and carried away for himself so dear a sweetheart as his booty, I added to finish her sentence. His future son-in-law suited my father very well, and who would not have been pleased with such a grand young man? Still, he gave him his sympathy and his blessing with all kinds of protestations and restrictions. You are dear to me in every respect, dear Rose, as a man and as a soldier and as a prince. This is what he said to him repeatedly and in various modes of speech. But as a Prussian officer, of course, I reserve to myself the right, despite any family connection, of wishing for nothing so much as a future war in which Austria may pay back handsomely the present victory snatched from her. The political question must be separated altogether from the personal. My son will one day, God grant that I may live to see it, take the field against the Prussian state. I myself, if I were not too old, and if my emperor were to summon me to it, would at once accept a command to fight William I, and especially his overbearing Bismarck. This does not prevent me from recognizing the military virtues of the Prussian army and the strategic science of its leaders, and from thinking it quite a matter of course that in the next campaign you, at the head of your battalion, should try to storm our capital and set fire to the house in which your father-in-law lives. In short, in short, said I, one day breaking in on a rhapsody of this kind, confusions in terms and inconsistencies of fact twine round each other like the infusoria in a putrefying drop of water. It is always so when you pin up together conceptions repugnant to each other. To hate the whole and love its parts. To want to have one way of thinking as members of a nation and another as a man. That will not do. It must be one thing or another. So I approve of the Indian chief's way of looking at it. He entertains for the adherent of a different tribe, as to which he does not even know that it consists of individuals no other wish than to scalp him. But my dear girl Martha, such savage feelings do not suit the stage of our civilization, which has grown more cultured and more humane. Rather say that our present stage of civilization does not suit the savagery which has come down to us from old times. As long as this savagery, that is, so long as the spirit of war is not cast out, our much-valued humanity cannot be looked on as reasonable. For surely now, as to the speech you made just now, in which you assured Prince Henry that you would love him as a son-in-law and hate him as a Prussian, value him dearly as a man, and abominate him as an officer, that you give him your paternal blessing with pleasure, and at the same time 
allow him the right, in given circumstances, of firing on you. Forgive me, my dear father, but will you really uphold this as reasonable? What are you saying? I do not catch a word. The favorite deafness had again come on at the right moment. End of section 58. Section 59 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Randall. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha Von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 14, Part 4. After a few days, all became quiet again at Grummet's. The soldiers quartered on us, had to march off, and Conrad had been ordered to join his regiment. Lori Greensbaugh and the minister had already departed before. The marriage of my two sisters had been postponed till October. Both were to be married on the same day at Grummet's. Prince Henry was to quit the service now that he had finished this glorious campaign in which he had earned distinction, he could easily do this and so repose on his laurels and on his estates. The partings of the two pairs of lovers were painful and joyful at the same time. They promised to write to each other every day, and the certain prospect of bliss so near made the anguish of parting seem not so severe. Certain prospect of bliss? There is, in reality, no such thing, and assuredly, least of all in seasons of war. Then misfortunes hover around, as thick as the swarms of gnats in the air, and the chances that you may be standing on a spot that will be spared by the descending scourge are at best but small. True, the war was over. That is, it had been proclaimed that peace was concluded, a word is sufficient to unchain the horrors, and thence one is apt to think that a word will also suffice to remove them again, but no spell has in reality that power. Hostilities may be suspended, and yet hostility may persist. The seed of future war is sown, and the fruit of the war just ended spreads still further in wretchedness, savagery, and plagues. Yes, no falsehood, and no not thinking of it, was any good now. The cholera was raging through the country. It was on the morning of 8th August. We were all seated at the breakfast table and reading our correspondence, which had just come by the post. The two fiancés had fastened on the love letters that had come for them. I was turning over the newspapers. From Vienna, the news was... The cholera death rate is rising considerably, not only in the military, but also in the civil hospitals. Many cases have been already reported, which must be looked on as genuine Asiatic cholera, and energetic measures are being taken on all sides to check the progress of the epidemic. I was about to read the passage aloud when Aunt Mary, who had in her hand a letter from one of her friends in the neighboring chateau, gave a cry of horror. Horrible! Betty writes me that in her house two persons have died of cholera, and now her husband is ill also. Your Excellence, the schoolmaster wishes to speak to you. The gentleman announced followed the footman into the room. He looked pale and bewildered. Count, I tell you with all deference that I must close the school. Two children were taken ill yesterday, and today they are dead. The cholera? We cried out. I think it is. I think we must give it that name. The so-called diarrhea which broke out among the soldiers quartered here, and of which twenty of them died, was the cholera. Great terror prevails in the village, because the doctor who came here from town has affirmed without any concealment that the horrible disease has now beyond doubt taken hold of the population of this place. What sound is that, I asked, listening, that one hears? That is the passing bell, Baroness, announced the schoolmaster, 
someone must be lying at his last gasp. The doctor tells us that in town, the passing bell absolutely never stops ringing. We all looked round at each other, pale and speechless. So here it was again, death. And each one of us saw his bony hand stretched out in the direction of some dear one's head. Let us flee, suggested Unmary. Flee? Whither? answered the schoolmaster. The pest has by this time spread everywhere around. Oh, far, far away, over the frontier. But a cordon will be drawn there, over which no one will be allowed to pass. Oh, that would be horrible. Surely no one would hinder people from quitting a land stricken with pestilence. Assuredly the healthy neighborhoods will protect themselves against infection. What is to be done? What is to be done? And Aunt Mary wrung her hands. To await God's will, answered my father. You are besides such a believer in destiny, Mary. I cannot understand your desire for flight. Everyone's fate finds him, wherever he is. But at the same time, I should like it better if you children could depart. And you, Otto, see that you touch no more fruit. I will telegraph at once to Bresser, said Frederick, to send on disinfectants. What happened immediately after this, I am no longer able to set down in detail, because the scene at the breakfast table was the last which at that time I entered in the red book. I can only tell the events of the next few days from memory. Fear and anxiety filled us all. Yes, all. Who, in a time of epidemic, could help trembling when living amongst those dear to him? For the sword of Damocles was always suspended over the dear one's head, and even to die oneself, so terribly and so uselessly. Who is there that such a thought would not fill with horror? The chief proof of courage consists in this, not to think about it. To flee? The idea had occurred to myself also, so as to get my little Rudolph into a safe place. My father, in spite of all his fatalism, insisted on flight for the others. The whole family were to be off next day. He alone determined on remaining, in order not to abandon his household and the inhabitants of the village in their danger. Frederick declared in the most decisive manner his determination to remain and this involved at once my decision. I would never voluntarily leave my husband. Aunt Mary, with the two girls and with Otto and Rudolph, were to depart as quickly as possible. Whither? That was not yet settled. In the first place, to Hungary, as far away as possible. The fiancés did not make any opposition whatever, but were busy in helping to pack. To die when the near future promised the fulfillment of the warm desires of love, i.e., a tenfold delight in living, would be to die tenfold. The boxes had been brought into the dining room, so that with the united assistance of all the work might go on quicker. I was bringing a package of Rudolph's clothes under my arm. Why does not your maid do that? asked my father. I do not know where Nettie has got to, I have rung for her several times, and she does not come, so I prefer to wait on myself. You spoil your people, said my father angrily, and he gave orders to a footman to look for the girl everywhere and bring her there immediately. After a time, the man who had been sent returned, looking confused. Nettie is lying down in her room. She is, she has, she is, well, can't you speak? thundered my father. What is the matter with her? She is already quite black. A cry burst out of all our mouths. So the horrible specter was already present in our own very house. Now what should we do? Could one leave the poor girl to die unaided? But whoever went near her brought death on himself almost certainly, and not only on himself, he spread it again more widely among the rest. Ah, uh, a house like that, into which the pest has penetrated, is like one encircled by robbers, or as if it were in flames, everywhere and in every corner and place, at every step and move, death is grinning at you. Fetch the doctor immediately, was my father's order, and you children hurry your departure. 
The doctor went back to town an hour ago, was the servant's reply to my father's direction. Oh, dear, I feel so ill, now cried Lily, and she turned pale to her very lips and clutched at the arm of her chair. We ran to her. What is the matter with you? Don't be foolish. It is only fear. But it was not fear. There is no doubt what it was. We had to carry the poor thing to her room, where she was seized at once with violent vomiting and the other symptoms. This was the second case of cholera in the chateau in this same day. It was horrible to see my poor sister's sufferings and no doctor at hand. Frederick was the only one who could perform the duty of one as well as he might. He ordered what was wanted, warm fomentations, mustard poultices to the stomach and the legs, ice and fragments, champagne. Nothing did any good. These means, which are sufficient for slight attacks of cholera, could not save in this case, but at least they gave the patient and the bystanders the comfort of knowing that something was being done. When the attacks had subsided, the cramps followed, quiverings and tearings of the whole frame till the very bones cracked. The poor thing tried to lament, but could not, for her voice failed, the skin turned blue and cold, the breath stopped. My father was running up and down, wringing his hands. Once I put myself in his way. This is war, father, I said. Will not you curse it? He shook me off and gave no reply. In ten hours, Lily was dead. Nettie, my poor lady's maid, had died before, alone in her room. We were all of us busy about Lily, and of the servants, none had ventured to go near one who had already turned quite black. End of section 59section 60 of lay down your arms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by d rando lay down your arms by bertha von sutner translated by timothy holmes chapter 14 part 5 meanwhile dr bressa had arrived he himself brought the medicines which we had telegraphed for. I could have kissed his hands as he walked into the midst of us to devote his self-sacrificing services to his old friends. He at once took on himself the command of the establishment. He had the two corpses carried into a remote chamber, barred up the rooms in which the poor things had died, and made us all submit to a powerful disinfecting process. An intense carbolic odor now penetrated all the rooms, and to this day, whenever this smell meets me, those dreadful days of cholera rise before my imagination. The intended flight had to be postponed a second time. On the very day of Lily's death, the carriage was standing ready which was to convey away Aunt Mary, Rosa, Otto, and my little boy, when the coachman, seized by the invisible destroyer, was forced to get off the coach box again. Then I will drive you, said my father, when the news was brought to him. Quick, is everything ready? Rosa came out. Drive on, she said, but I must stop behind. I am going Lily's way. And she spoke truth. The break of day dawned on this second young bride, too, in the chamber of death. Of course, in the horror of this new calamity, the departure of the others was not carried out. In the midst of my anguish, of my raging fear, the deepest scorn again seized me for that gigantic folly which had voluntarily called forth so great a calamity. My father, when Rose's corpse had been carried out, had sunk on his knees with his head against the wall. I went to him and took him by the arm. Father, I said, this is war. No answer. Father, do you hear? Now or never will you now curse war? He, however, collected himself. You remind me of it. This misfortune shall be borne with a soldier's courage, 
It is not I alone. The whole country has to offer its sacrifice of blood and tears. What comfort then has come to the country from the sufferings of you and your brethren? What comfort from the lost battles? What from these two girls' lives cut short? Father, oh, do me this kindness for the love of me. Curse war. See here. I drew him to a window, and just then a black coffin was being brought on a car into the courtyard. See here, that is for our lily, and tomorrow another such for our Rosa, and the day after, perhaps a third. And why? Why? Because God has willed it so, my child. God, always God. All that, however, is folly, all savagery, all the arbitrary action of men hiding itself under the shield of God's will. Do not blaspheme, Martha. Do not blaspheme now when God's chastening hand is so visibly. A footman came into the room. Your Excellency, the carpenter will not carry the coffin into the chamber where the countesses are lying, and no one will venture into it. Not you either, coward? I could not alone. Then I will help you. I will myself see to my daughters. And he strode to the door. Back, he cried to me as I was following him. You must not go with me. You must not die as well as me. Think of your child. What could I do? I hesitated. That is the most torturing thing in such circumstances, not to know at all where one's duty lies. If one pays to the sick and the dead the loving service which one's heart yearns to do, then one spreads the germs of the evil wider again and brings danger on the others who have as yet been spared. One would be willing to sacrifice oneself, but one knows that in risking this one, risks sacrificing others also. In such a dilemma, there is only one helpful way, to give up life, not one's own merely, but also that of all one's dear ones, to assume that all is done with and for each one to stand by the other in his hours of suffering, as long as they last. Looking backward, looking forward, all that must cease. Together, on the deck of a sinking ship, no means of escape, let us hold each other in our arms, close, close as possible to the last moment, in a due fair world. The resignation had come over us all, the plan of flight had been given up. Everyone went to the bed of every patient and of every one who had died. Even Bressa no longer tried to keep us from this, the only humane way of acting. His neighborhood, his energetic, unresting rule gave us a certain feeling of security. Our sinking ship was at least not without a captain. Oh, that color were weak in grummets. Over twenty years have passed since then, but I still feel a shudder through my bones and marrow when I think of it. Tears, wailing, heart-rending death scenes, the smell of carbolic acid, the cracking of the bones of those seized with cramp, the disgusting symptoms, the incessant tolling of the death bell, the interment, no, the huddling away of the dead, for in such cases there is no funeral pump all the order of life given up, no meal times, the cook was dead, no going to sleep at night, here and there a morsel snatched standing and a doze as one sat in one's chair in the morning hours. Outside, as though from the irony of indifferent nature, the most splendid summer weather, the joyous song of the blackbird, the luxuriant colors of the flower beds, in the village, death, without cessation. All the Prussians who were left behind were dead. I met the man who buries the dead today, said Francis, our valet de chambre, as he was coming back from the churchyard with his empty carriage. One or two more taken there? I asked. Oh, yes, six or seven, about half a dozen every day, sometimes even more. And it does happen sometimes that one or other gives a grunt or so inside the hearse there but that makes no matter. In he goes into the trench, the duh. <sighs> Prussian. Next day, the monster died himself. 
and another man had to take up his office, at that time the most laborious in the place. The post brought nothing but sorrow, news from all quarters of the ravages of the pest, and love letters, letters to remain forever unanswered, from Prince Henry, who knew nothing of what was going on. To Conrad, I had sent a single line to prepare him for the awful event. Lily, very ill. He could not come immediately. The service detained him. It was not till the fourth day that the poor fellow rushed into the house. Lily, he cried, is it true? He had heard of the misfortune as he was on the way. We said yes. He remained unnaturally still and tearless. I have loved her many years, was all he said, low to himself. Then aloud, where is she lying? In the churchyard? Goodbye. She is waiting for me. Shall I come with you? Someone offered. No, I prefer going alone. He went, and we saw him no more. On the grave of his sweetheart, he put a bullet through his brains. So ended Conrad Count Althaus, Captain Lieutenant in the 4th Regiment of Hussars, in his 27th year. At another time, the tragic nature of this event would have produced a very shocking effect. But now, how many young officers had not the war carried off immediately? This one only indirectly. And at the moment when we heard of his deed, a new misfortune had occurred in our midst, which called for all the anguish of our hearts. Otto, my poor father's adored and only son, was seized by the destroying angel. His sufferings lasted the whole night and the next day, with alternations of hope and despair. About 7 p.m., all was over. My father threw himself on the corpse, with such a thrilling shriek that it pealed through the whole house. We could hardly tear him from the dead body, and, oh, the cries of agony that now ensued. For hours and hours long, the old man poured out howling, roaring, rattling, shrieks of desperation. His son, his pride, his auto, his all. To this outburst succeeded on a sudden, a stiff, dumb apathy. He had not had the strength to attend the burial of his darling. He lay on a sofa, motionless, and it almost seemed unconscious. Bressa ordered him to be undressed and put to bed. After an hour, he seemed to awake. Aunt Mary, Frederick, and I were at his side. For a time, he looked about him with a questioning look and then sat up and tried to speak. He could not, however, pronounce a word and was struggling for breath with a puzzled face of anguish. Then he began to shake and to throw himself about as if he were attacked by those terrible cramps which are the last symptoms of the cholera, though he had not shown any of the other symptoms of it. At last, he got out one word, Martha. I fell on my knees at his bedside. Father, my poor dear father. He held his hands over my head. Your wish, said he with difficulty, may be fulfilled. I curse, I cur... He could get no further and sank back on his pillow. In the meantime, Bresser had come in and, in answer to our anxious questions, gave us his opinion that a spasm of the heart had caused my father's death. The most terrible thing, said Aunt Mary, after we had buried him, is that he departed with a curse on his lips. Don't trouble about that, Aunt, I said to console her. If that curse fell from the lips of everybody, yes, of everybody, it would be a great blessing to humanity. Such was the cholera week at Grummets. In the space of seven days, nine inhabitants of the chateau had been snatched away. My father, Lily, Rosa, Otto, my maid, Nettie, the cook, the coachman, and two grooms. In the village during the same time, over 80 persons died. Stated in this dry way, all this sounds like a noteworthy statistical fact, or if it stands recorded in the tale book, like an extravagant play of the author's fancy. But it is neither so dry as the one 
nor so romantically terrible as the other. It is a cold, intelligible fact, full of sadness. It was not Grommets alone in our neighborhood that was so hardly hit. Whoever chooses to search the annals of the neighboring villages and chateaux may find there plenty of similar cases of enormous calamity. For example, there is Schloss Stockern in the vicinity of the little town of Horn, of the family which inhabited it during the time from the 9th to the 13th of August, 1866, and also after the departure of the Prussian troops quartered there, four members of the family, Rudolf, age 20, his sisters Emily and Bertha, and his uncle Candid, and besides them, five of the servants succumbed to the plague. The youngest daughter, Pauline von Ingelshofen, was spared. She afterwards married a Baron Sutner, and she, even now, still tells with a shudder the tale of the cholera week at Stockton. At that time, such a resignation to woe and death had come over me that I was in daily expectation that death, whose characters had been stamped on the land for the last two months, would carry off myself and my loved ones. My Frederick, my Rudolph, I actually wept for them in anticipation. And yet, along with all this, and in the midst of my trouble, I still had sweet moments. Such were when leaning on my husband's breast and encircled by his loving arms. I could pour my tears out on his faithful heart. How gently then would he speak words to me, not a consolation, but a fellow feeling and love, so that my own heart warmed and expanded to them. No, the world is not so bad. I was compelled against my will to think. The world is not all lamentation and cruelty. Compassion and love are alive in it. At present, it is true, only in individual souls, not as an all-pervading law and a prevailing normal condition. Still, they are present. And just as these feelings glow in us twain, sweetening by means of their gentle contact, even this time of suffering, just as they dwell in many other, nay, in most other souls, so they will one day come to an outbreak and will dominate the general relations of the human family. The future belongs to goodness. End of section 60. Section 61 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Allison Speaks. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 15, Part 1. Summer Sojourn in Switzerland My husband's researches in the history of the Geneva Convention and in international law. Seclusion and mourning. Visit to Vienna. Frederick enters a new army, the Army of Peace. Visit to Berlin. On our way, we visit the battlefield of Sadua on All Souls' Day. The Emperor as a mourner. Aunt Cornelia, her grief, and the consolations of religion. The Army Chaplain. A military theological discussion. We are summoned to Aunt Mary's deathbed. Retired life at Vienna. Minister to be sure. Political talks. Universal liability to serve. We passed the remainder of the summer in the neighborhood of Geneva, Dr. Bresser's powers of persuasion had at last succeeded in moving us to fly from the infected country. I at first strove against leaving so quickly the graves of my family, and, as I have said, I was filled with such a resignation to death that I had become wholly apathetic and held every attempt at flight to be useless. But, in spite of all this, Bresser was certain to conquer when he represented to me that it was my maternal duty to carry little Rudolph out of the way of danger as well as I could. 
that we chose Switzerland as our place of refuge resulted from Frederick's wish. He wanted to become acquainted with the men who had called the Red Cross into life, and to gain information on the spot about the proceedings of the conferences which had been held, as well as about the further aims of the convention. Frederick had given in his resignation of the military service, and as a preliminary had received half a year's leave till his request should be granted. I had now become rich, very rich. The death of my father, and of my brother and two sisters, had put me in possession of Grumitz and of the whole family property. "'Look here,' I said to Frederick when the title deeds were delivered to me from the notaries. What would you say if I were now to praise the war which had just passed because of the advantages which have fallen to my share from its consequences? Why, that you would not then be my Martha. Still, I understand what you mean. The heartless egotism which is capable of rejoicing over material gains that proceed out of the ruin of others, this impulse which every individual, even if he is base enough to feel it, still takes all possible care to hide, is proudly and openly confessed by nations and dynasties. Thousands have perished in untold sufferings, but we have thereby increased in territory and in power. So let there be praises and thanks to heaven for the successful war. We lived very quietly and retired in a small villa situated on the shore of the lake. I was so oppressed by the scenes through which I had gone that I would have absolutely no intercourse with any strangers. Frederick respected my mourning, and made no attempt whatever to recommend me the vulgar resource of diversion as a cure for it. I owed it to the graves at Grumitz, and my tender husband saw this well, to grieve over them for some time in perfect quiet. Those who had been hurried so speedily and so cruelly out of this fair world should not be equally quickly and coldly stolen also out of the place of memory which they held in my mourning heart. Frederick himself went often into the city in order to follow up the object of his stay there, the study of the Red Cross question. Of the results of this study I do not retain any clear recollection. I did not at the time keep any diary, and thus what Frederick communicated to me of the experiences he met with has for the most part passed out of my recollection. I only recollect clearly one impression which the whole of my surroundings made on me. The quiet, the ease, the cheerful activity of the people whom I happened to see, as if they were living in a most peaceful, most good-humored time. There was hardly anywhere even an echo of the war that had just ended, or at the most in a conversational tone, as if it had contributed one more interesting event, nothing more, which might furnish pleasant matter for talk along with the rest of European gossip, as if the awful thunder of the cannonades on the Bohemian battlefields had had nothing more tragic in them than a new opera by Wagner. The thing belonged now to history, and had for its result some alterations in the atlas. But its horror had passed out of recollection, or perhaps had never been present to these neutrals. It was forgotten. The pain was over. It had vanished. The same with the newspapers. I read French newspapers chiefly. All the interest was concentrated about the Universal Exhibition in Paris, which was in preparation for 1867, about the court festivities at Compiègne, about literary celebrities, two new geniuses had come to light who caused much discussion, Flaubert and Zola, about the events of the drama, a new opera by Gounod, a new leading part designed by Offenbach for Hortense Schneider, and so forth. The little exciting duel which the Prussians and Austrians had fought out La Bas and Bohème was an event that had already become, to some extent, a thing of the past. <sighs> what lies three months back, or at thirty miles' distance, what is not being played out in the domain of the now and the here, is a thing which the short feelers of the human heart and the human memory cannot reach. We quitted Switzerland towards the middle of October. We betook ourselves back to Vienna where the course of the business of my inheritance required my presence. When this business was dispatched, our intention was to stay for a considerable time at Paris. Frederick had it in his mind to smooth the way with all his power for the idea of a league of peace, and his view was that the projected universal exhibition offered the best opportunity for setting on foot a congress of friends of peace, and he also thought Paris was the most appropriate place for giving actual vitality to what was a matter of international concern. I have, he said, 
renounced the trade of war, and that I have done from convictions gained in actual war. I will now work for these convictions. I enter the service of the Peace Army, a very small army indeed, it is true, and one whose combatants have no other shield or sword than the sentiment of justice and the love of humanity. Still, everything which has ultimately become great has started from small or invisible beginnings. <sighs> I sighed. It is a hopeless beginning. What can you, a single man, achieve against that mighty fortress, thousands of years old and garrisoned by millions of men? Achieve? I? I am not really so foolish as to hope that I personally can bring about a conversation. I was only saying just then that I wished to enter the ranks of the peace army. When I had my place in the army of war, did I, do you suppose, hope that I should save my country, that I should conquer a province? No. The individual can only serve. And still further, he must serve. A man who is penetrated by any cause cannot do better than work for it, then devote his life to it, even if he knows how little this life in and by itself, can contribute towards its victory. He serves because he must, not only the state, but our own conviction, if it is enthusiastic, lays on us the duty of defending it. You are right, and if at length there are enough millions animated by the enthusiasm of this duty, then that thousand-year-old fortress will be abandoned by its garrison and must fall. From Vienna I made a pilgrimage to Grumitz, whose mistress I had now become but I did not even enter the chateau. I only laid down four wreaths in the churchyard and drove back again. After my most important matters of business were put in order, Frederick proposed a little journey to Berlin in order to pay a visit to Aunt Cornelia, who was so much to be pitied. I assented. During our absence I put my little son Rudolf in the charge of Aunt Mary. The latter had been cast down more than I can describe by the events of the cholera week at Grumitz. Her whole love, her whole interest in life, she now concentrated on my little Rudolph. I even hoped that she might be somewhat diverted and raised in her spirits by having the child with her for a time. We left Vienna on November 1. We broke our journey in Prague, intending to spend the night there. Next day, instead of pursuing our journey to Berlin, we made a new pilgrimage. All Souls' Day, I said. How many poor dead bodies are lying on the battlefield in this neighborhood, for whom even this day of honor to the graves does nothing, because they have no graves? Who will pay them a visit? I looked at him for a while in silence. Then, half aloud, I said, Will you? He nodded. We understood one another, and in an hour we were on our way to Klum and Kloningratz. End of section 61。section 62 of lay down your arms。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox dot org。Lay Down Your Arms by Berta von Suttner, translated by Timothy Holmes, Chapter Fifteen, Part Two. What a prospect! An elegy of Tiedj came into my mind. Oh, sight of horror! Mighty prince, come see, and o'er this awful heap of mouldering clay, swear to thy folk. A gentler lord to be, and give to earth the light of peaceful day. Great leader, when thou thirstest for renown, come count these skulls before the solemn hour when thine own head must lay aside its crown, and in death's silence ends thy dream of power. Let the dread vision. Hover o'er thee ever. Of these sad corpses here around thee strown, and then say, Does it charm thee, the endeavor upon men's ruins to erect thy throne? Yes, unfortunately it will charm men, 
so long as the histories of the world, i.e., those who write them, build the statues of their heroes out of the ruins of war, so long as they offer their crowns to the titans of public murder, to refuse the laurel crown, to give up fame would be nobler. Is that what the poet means? The first thing to do should be to despoil the thing, which it should appear so beneficent to renounce of its glory, and then there would be no ambitious man any longer to grasp after it. It was twilight already when we got to Chlum, and from thence walked on arm in arm to the battlefield near at hand in silent horror. A mist was falling, mingled with very fine snowflakes, and the dull branches of the trees were bent by the shrill-sounding pipe of a cold November wind. Crowds of graves and the graves of crowds were all around us, but a churchyard? No. No pilgrim weary of life had there been invited to rest and peace. There, in the midst of their youthful fire of life, exulting in the fullest strength of their manhood, the waiters on the future had been cast down by force and had been shoveled down into their grave mold. Choked up, stifled, made dumb forever, all those breaking hearts, those bloody, mangled limbs, those bitterly weeping eyes, those wild shrieks of despair, those vain prayers. On this field of war it was not lonely. There were many, very many, whom All Souls' Day had brought hither from friends and enemies' country, who were here come to kneel down on the ground where what they loved most had fallen. The train itself which brought us was full of other mourners, and thus I had heard now for several hours weeping and wailing going on around me. Three sons, three sons, each one more beautiful and better and dearer than the others, have I lost at Sedova, said to us an old man who looked quite broken down. Many others, besides of our companions in the carriage, mingled their complaints with his, for brother, husband, father, but none of these made so much impression on me as the tearless, mournful three sons, three sons of the poor old man. On the field one saw on all sides and on all the roads black figures walking or kneeling or painfully staggering along and breaking out from time to time into loud sobs. There were only a few there who were buried by themselves, few crosses or stones with an inscription. We bent down and deciphered, as well as the twilight permitted, some of the names. Major V. Royce of the Second Regiment of the Prussian Guards, perhaps a relation of the one engaged to our poor Rosa, I remarked. Count Gruna, wounded July 3rd, died July 5th. What might he not have suffered in those two days? Was he, I wondered, a son of the Count Gruna who uttered before the war the well-known sentence, We are going to chase the Prussians away. What foot? Ah, how frantic and blasphemous! How shrilly out of tune sounds of a surety every word of provocation spoken before a war when one stands on a place like this. Words and nothing more. 
boasting words, scornful words, spoken, written, and printed. It is these alone that have sown the seed of fields like these. We walk on. Everywhere earth heaps, more or less high, more or less broad, and even there where the earth is not elevated, even under our feet, soldiers' corpses are perhaps moldering. The mist grows thicker constantly. Frederick, pray put your hat on. You will take cold. But Frederick remained uncovered, and I did not repeat my warning a second time. Among the mourners who were wandering about here were also many officers and soldiers, probably such as had themselves shared in the nobly contested day of Kuningratz, and now were making a pilgrimage to the place where their fallen comrades were sleeping. We had now come to the spot where the largest number of warriors, friend and foe together, lay entombed. The place was walled off like a churchyard. Hither came the greatest number of mourners, because in this spot there was most chance that their dear ones might be entombed. Round this enclosure the bereaved ones were kneeling and sobbing, and here they hung up their crosses and their grave lights. A tall, slender man of distinguished, youthful figure in a general's cloak came up to the mound. The others gave place reverently to him, and I heard some voices whisper, The Emperor! Yes, it was Francis Joseph. It was the Lord of the country the supreme lord of war, who had come on All Souls' Day to offer up a silent prayer for the dead children of his country, for his fallen warriors. He also stood with uncovered and bowed head there in agonized devotion before the majesty of death. Long, long he stood without moving, I could not turn my eyes away from him. What thoughts must be passing through his soul, what feelings through his heart, which after all was, as I knew, a good and a soft heart. It came into my mind that I could feel with him, that I could think the thoughts at the same time as he, which were passing through that bowed head of his. You, my poor, brave fellows, dead, and what for? No, we have not conquered. My Venice, lost, so much lost, ah, so much, and your lo young lives, too, and you gave them so devotedly for me. Oh, if I could give them back to you, I, for my part, never desired the sacrifice. It was for you, for your country, that you, the children of my country, were led forth to this war, and not by my means, no, not though it was at my order, for I was not compelled to give the order. The subjects do not exist for my sake. No, I was called to the throne for their sakes, and any hour have I been ready to die for the weal of my people. Oh, had I followed the impulse of my heart, and never said yes, when all around me were shouting, war, war, still could I have resisted them? God is my witness that I could not. What impelled me? What forced me? At this moment I do not know exactly, only so much I know. That it was an irresistible pressure from without, from yourselves, ye, dead soldiers. Oh, how mournful, mournful, 
mournful. How I have suffered for it all, and now you are lying here and on other battlefields, snatched away by grape shot and saber cuts by cholera and typhus. Oh, if I had said no, you begged me to do so, Elizabeth. Oh, if I had said it. The thought is intolerable that, oh, it is a miserable, imperfect world. Too much, too much of woe. During the whole time that I was thinking thus for him, I fastened my eyes on his features. And now, yes, just as I came to too much, too much of woe, now he covered his face with both hands and broke out into a hot flood of tears. So passed All Souls' Day on the battlefield of Sedova. End of section 62、section 63 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 15, Part 3. We found the city of Berlin in the height of jubilation. Every counter jumper and every street loafer bore on his countenance a certain consciousness of victory. We've given the fellows there a good licking. That appears anyhow to be a very elevating feeling, and one which may be spread over the whole population. Still, in the families which we visited, we found many people deeply cast down, those, that is to say, who had one never to be forgotten lying dead on the German or Bohemian battlefields. For my own part, I feared most the meeting with Aunt Cornelia again. I knew that her handsome son Godfrey was her idol, her all. And I could judge of the pang which the poor bereaved mother must now be experiencing. I had only to fancy to myself that my Rudolph, if I had brought him up to manhood, no, that thought I absolutely refused to think out. Our visit was announced. With a beating heart I entered Frau von Teslow's house. Even in the antechamber, the morning which reigned in the house was perceptible. The footman who opened the door for us wore a black livery. In the great reception room, The chairs of which were covered over with chair covers, there was no fire lighted, and the mirrors and pictures on the walls were all covered with crape. From hence, the door into Aunt Cornelia's bedroom was opened for us, and she received us there. It was a very large room, divided into two by a curtain, behind which the bed stood, and it served Aunt Cornelia now as her regular reception room. She no longer quitted the house at all, except every Sunday to go to the cathedral. And very seldom her room, except for one hour every day, which she spent in what had been Godfrey's study. In this, everything was left standing or lying as he had left it on the day of his departure. She took us into it in the course of our visit, and made us read a letter which he had laid on his portfolio. My own dear mother, I know well that you will come here after my departure, and then you will find this letter. My personal departure is over. So much the more will it please and surprise you to find one more line, to hear one more last word from me, and indeed a joyful, hopeful one. Be of good cheer. I shall come back again. Two hearts that hang together so entirely as ours do, fate will not tear asunder. I've settled now that I'm going to serve through a fortunate campaign, gain stars and crosses, and then make you a grandmother six times over. I kiss your hand. I kiss your dear, soft forehead. Oh, you most adored of all little mothers, your Godfrey. When we went into Aunt Cornelia's room, she was not alone. A gentleman in a long black coat, recognizable at the first glance as a clergyman, was sitting opposite to her. She got up and came to meet us. The clergyman rose at the same time from his seat, but remained standing in the background. What I expected occurred. When I embraced the old lady, both of us, she and I, Broke out into loud sobs. Frederick also did not remain dry eyed as he pressed the mourner to his heart. In this first minute, no word at all was spoken. All that one could say at such a moment, at one's first meeting after a severe misfortune, 
is sufficiently expressed by tears she led us back to the place where they were sitting and pointed us to the chairs that stood there then after drying her eyes she made the introduction my nephew colonel baron tilling herr mosler head military chaplain and consistorial counsellor silent bows were exchanged my friend and spiritual adviser she proceeded who has allowed me to lay on him the burden of instructing me in my trouble but who unfortunately has not succeeded in instilling into you the proper resignation the proper joy in bearing the cross my valued friend said he why is it that i have always to witness a fresh outburst of these very foolish tears oh forgive me when i last saw my nephew with his sweet young wife my godfrey was there she could speak no further your son was there in this sinful world still exposed to all temptations and dangers while well, now he has gone into the bosom of the father after meeting with the most glorious and most blessed of deaths for king and country you colonel turning now to my husband who have just been introduced to me as a soldier can assist me to give this afflicted mother the consolation that her son's fate is an enviable one you must know what delight in death animates the brave warrior the resolve to offer his life as a sacrifice on the altar of his country glorifies for him all the pain of departing this life and though he sinks in the storm of the battle amidst the thunder of the artillery yet he expects to be transferred to the great army on high and to be present when the lord of sabbath holds muster above you colonel have come back in the number of those to whom divine providence has granted a righteous victory forgive me reverend consistorial counsellor i was in the austrian service oh i thought oh really replied the other quite confused a grand brave army too is the austrian he rose but i will not intrude longer you will be wishing doubtless to talk of family matters farewell dear lady in a few days i will come again till then raise your thoughts to the all-merciful without whose will not a hair falls from our heads and who causes all things to serve for the good of those that love him even sorrow and suffering even privation and death i salute you with all devotion my aunt shook his hand i hope i shall see you soon very soon pray he bowed to us all and was stepping toward the door when frederick detained him reverend consistorial counsellor may i ask you a favour pray tell me what it is colonel i conclude from your conversation that you are penetrated equally by the religious and the military spirit in that case you might do me a great pleasure i listened with interest what could frederick mean the fact is he continued that my little wife here is full of scruples and doubts of all sorts her opinion is that from a christian point of view war is not quite permissible i of course know to the contrary for there is no alliance closer than that between the professions of priest and soldier but i have not the eloquence to make this clear to my wife would you then reverend consistorial counsellor so far favour us as to give us to-morrow or next day an hour of your conversation with the view oh with great pleasure the clergyman said interrupting him will you give me your address frederick gave him his card and the day and hour of the visit he asked for were fixed at once then we remained alone with our aunt does your intercourse with this friend really afford you consolation asked frederick consolation there is no consolation for me any more here below but he speaks so much and so beautifully about the things which i like most to hear of about death and mourning about the cross and sacrifice and resignation he paints the world which my poor godfrey had to leave and from which i longed to be released as such a veil of misery of corruption of sin and of advancing ruin and so it seems to me a little less mournful that my child has been called away he is assuredly in heaven and here on this earth the powers of hell often prevail that is true i have again seen proof of that close to me replied frederick thoughtfully the poor lady next questioned him about the two campaigns that he had passed through the one with the other against godfrey he had to relate hundreds of details and in doing so he was able to give the bereaved mother the same comfort that he once brought me back from the war in italy namely that the lamented one had died a rapid and painless death it was a long and mournful visit 
i also again recounted there all the details of the horrible cholera week and my experiences on the bohemian battlefields before we left aunt cornelia took us into godfrey's room where i wept bitter tears anew at the perusal of the letter which i have quoted above and of which at a later period i begged a copy End of section 63section 64 of lay down your arms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nancy cochran gergen gilbert arizona lay down your arms by bertha von Sutner. translated by timothy holmes chapter 15 part 4 now explain to me i said to frederick as we got into our carriage which was in waiting in front of aunt cornelia's villa why you asked the consistorial counsellor to a conference with you do not you understand that is to serve me as material for study i want to hear once more and this time to take note of the arguments by which priests defend public murder i put you forward as the leader in the fray it better becomes a young lady to nourish a doubt from the christian point of view as to the lawfulness of war than a gallant colonel but you know that my doubt is not from a religious but a humanitarian point of view we must not lay this at all before the reverend consitorial counsellor or else the discussion would be transferred to a different field the efforts after peace of free thinkers suffer from no internal inconsistency but it is this very inconsistency existing between the maxims of christianity and the orders of military authorities which i should like to hear explained by a military chaplain i e a representative of militant christianity the clergyman was punctual in his arrival the prospect was evidently an inviting one for him of having to preach a sermon of instruction and conversion i on the contrary looked forward to the conversation with somewhat painful feelings for the part assigned to me in it was a dishonest one but for the good of the cause to which frederick had devoted his services henceforth i was easily able to put some constraint on myself and comfort myself with a proverb the end justifies the means after the first greetings we were all three seated on low easy chairs before the fire the consistorial counsellor began thus allow me dear lady to enter on the object of my visit the matter is to remove from your soul some scruples which are not destitute of some apparent grounds but which can easily be refuted as sophistical you think for example that christ's command to love your enemies and also the text he who takes the sword shall perish by the sword are inconsistent with the duties of a soldier who no doubt is empowered to injure the enemy in body and life certainly reverend counsellor this inconsistency seems to me irreconcilable then there occurs also the express command of the decalogue thou shalt not kill oh yes to a superficial judgment there is some difficulty in that but on penetrating deeper all doubt vanishes as regards the fifth commandment it would be more correctly given as it is actually in the english version of the bible thou shalt not murder killing for necessary defense is not murder and war is in reality only necessary defense on a large scale we can and we ought following the gentle precept of our saviour to love our enemies but that does not mean that we are not to venture to defend ourselves from open wrong and violence then does it not follow of course from this that only defensive wars are justifiable and that no sword-stroke ought to be given till the enemy has invaded the country but if the opposing nation proceeds on the same principle how then can the battle ever begin in the late war it was your army reverend counsellor which first crossed the frontier and if one wishes to keep the foe off dear lady as we have the most sacred right to do it is utterly unnecessary to put off the favourable opportunity and to wait until he has first invaded one's country on the contrary the sovereign must 
under all circumstances, have freedom to anticipate the violent and unjust. In doing so, he is following the written word, He who takes the sword shall perish by the sword. He presents himself as God's servant and avenger on the enemy, because he strives to make him, as he has taken the sword against him, perish by the sword. There must be some fallacy in that, I said, shaking my head. It is impossible that these principles should justify both parties equally. And as to the further scruple, pursued the clergyman, without noticing my remark, that war is of, and by itself displeasing to God, this must depart from every Christian who believes in the Bible, for the Holy Scriptures sufficiently prove that the Lord himself gave commands to the people of Israel to wage wars in order to conquer the promised land, and he granted them victory and his blessing on their wars. In Numbers 21.14, a special book of the wars of the Lord is spoken of, and how often in the Psalms is the assistance celebrated which God has granted to his people in war? Do you not know what Solomon says? Proverbs 21.31 The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. In Psalm 144, David thanks and praises the Lord, his strength, who teacheth his hand to war and his fingers to fight. Then a contradiction prevails between the Old and the New Testament. The God of the ancient Hebrews was a warlike deity, but the gentle Jesus proclaimed the message of peace and taught love to neighbor and to enemy. In the New Testament also, Jesus speaks in a figure, Luke 14.31, without the least blame of a king who is going to make war against another king. And how often, too, does not the Apostle Paul use figures from the military life? He says, Romans 13.4, that the magistrate does not bear the sword in vain, but is God's servant, a revenger on him that doeth evil. Well, then, in that case, the contradiction I mean exists in the Holy Scripture itself. By your showing me that it is present in the Bible, you do not remove it. There one sees the superficial and at the same time arrogant method of judgment, which seeks to exalt one's own weak reason above the word of God. Contradiction is something imperfect, ungodlike, and if I show that a thing is in the Bible, the proof is complete that in itself, however incomprehensible it may be to the human understanding, it can contain no contradiction. Unless the presence of contradiction does not much rather prove that the passages in question cannot possibly be of divine origin. This answer trembled on my lips, but I suppressed it, in order not to change entirely the object of the discussion. Look here, Reverend Counselor, said Frederick, now mingling in the conversation. A chief captain of artillery in the seventeenth century has laid down much more forcibly than you have done the justifiability of the horrors of war by an appeal to the Bible. I extracted the passage and have read it to my wife, but she did not sympathize with the spirit expressed in it. I confess the thing seems to me, well, a little strong, and I should like to hear your view about it. If you will allow me, I will fetch the paper. So he took a sheet of paper out of a drawer, unfolded it, and read, War was invented by God himself, and taught to men. God posted the first soldier with a two-edged sword in front of paradise, to keep out of it Adam, the first rebel. You may read in Deuteronomy how God, by means of Moses, gives people encouragement to victory, and even gives them his priests for advance guard. The first stratagem was practiced at the city of Ai. In this war of the Jews, the sun had to stand and show light in the firmament for two whole days together, in order that the war and the victory might be followed up, and many thousands put to the sword and their kings hung up. All the horrors of war are permitted by God, for the whole of the Holy Writ is full of them, and proves satisfactorily that regular war is an invention of God himself, and that, therefore, every man can, with a clear conscience, serve in it, and can live and die in it. He is permitted to burn his enemy, or brand him, 
flay him, shoot him down, or hack him to pieces. All this is just. Let others judge as they please about it. God, in these passages, has forbidden nothing, but has permitted the most horrible ways of destroying men. The prophetess Deborah nailed the head of Sisera, the leader in that war, to the earth. Gideon, chosen by God as the leader of the people, revenged himself on the princes of Sukheth, who had refused him some provisions, like a soldier. Sword and fire were too poor. They were thrashed and torn in pieces with thorns. And, as before, this was righteous in the sight of God. The royal prophet David, a man after God's own heart, invented the most cruel tortures for the vanquished children of Ammon at Rabbath. He had them hewed with sabers, caused chariots to drive over them, cut them with knives, and dragged them through the places where they made the bricks. And so did he in all the towns of the children of Ammon. Besides this, that is horrible, abominable, broke in the chief chaplain. It could only be a rough soldier of the savage times of the Thirty Years' War, to whom it would appear natural to produce examples like these out of the Bible, in order to found thereon a justification for their cruelties against the enemy. We preach quite other doctrine now. Nothing more is to be striven for in war than to make your adversary incapable of harm, even up to his death, but without any evil design against the life of any individual. If any such design enters in, or even any murderous desire or any cruelty against those who are defenseless, in such a case killing in war is exactly as immoral and as impermissible as in peace. No doubt in past centuries, when the adventurous delight in feud and quarrel prevailed, when leaders of lanchnecks and vagrant persons carried on war as a trade, in such times an artillery captain might ride in that style. But in the present day, armies are not put into the field for gold and booty, not without knowing for whom or for what, but for the highest ideal objects of mankind, for freedom, independence, nationality, for justice, faith, honor, purity, and morality. You, Reverend Consistorial Council, I interposed, are at least milder and more humane than the artillery captain, and thus you have no proofs out of the Bible to allege for the lawfulness of cruelty in which our forefathers of the Middle Ages, and presumably also the ancient Hebrews, took a pleasure. And yet it is the same book, and the same Jehovah, and he cannot have become milder, and everybody still gets from him as much support as suits his views. On this I received a slight sermon of rebuke for my want of reverence for the word of God, and for my want of judgment in reading it. Still, I succeeded in leading the conversation back again to our special subject, and now the consistorial council launched out into a long dissertation, and one which this time was allowed to be uninterrupted, about the connection between the military and Christian spirits. He spoke of the religious devotion, which is dwelling in the oath to the standard, when the colors are carried solemnly, with the accompaniment of music, into the church, with the guard of honor of two officers with drawn swords. And there the recruit marches out for the first time in public with helmet and sidearms, and for the first time follows the colors of his company, unfolded now before the altar of the Lord, torn as they are, and stained with the honorable marks of the battles in which they have been carried. He spoke of the prayer offered every Sunday in church. Preserve the royal commander of the army, and all true servants of their king and country. Teach them as Christians to think of their end, and grant that their servants may be blessed, to the honor and the good of the country. God with us, he went on, is, as you know, the motto on the belt buckle with which the foot soldier buckles on his side arms, and this watchword should give him confidence. If God be with us, who can be against us? Then, there are also the universal days of public prayer and humiliation, which are ordered at the commencement of a war, that the people may beg for God's help in prayer, both in the comfortable hope of his support 
and in the confidence through the support of gaining a victorious termination. What devotion does there not lie in this for the departing warrior? How mightily does this exalt his delight in battle and in death? He can, with comfort, enter into the ranks of the warriors when his king calls for him, and can reckon on victory and blessing for the cause of right. God the Lord will no more deprive our people of this than his people, Israel of old, if only it is with prayers to him that we carry on the work of battle. The ultimate alliance between prayer and victory, between piety and valor, easily follows, for what can more assure one of joy in the prospect of death than the confidence that if our last hour should strike in the confusion of the battle, we shall find favor at the hands of the judge in heaven? Fidelity and faith, in union with manliness and warlike virtue, belong to the oldest traditions of our people. He went on in this tone for a long time more, now with oily mildness, with sunken head, in the softest tones, speaking of love, humility, little children, salvation, and precious things, now with military voice of command, with a proud, erect attitude, talking of strict morals and stern discipline, sharp and cutting, of sword and shield. The word joy was never used otherwise than in composition with death, battle, and dying. From the point of view of the army chaplain, to kill and to be killed seem to be the most exquisite delights in life. Everything else is exhausting, sinful pleasure. Verses, too, were recited. First this one of Kerner. Father, do thou guide me. Guide me to victory. Guide me to death. Lord, I confess thy command. Lord, as thou willest, so guide me. God, I confess thee. Then the old popular song of the Thirty Years' War. No happier death on earth can be than one good stroke from mortal foe, on fresh green turf in breezes free. No woman's tears, no cries of woe, no grim deathbed whence, lone and slow, from life's gay scene your soul must go. Like swaths of grass in lusty row, mid shouting friends, death lays you low. And then the song by Lenau of the war-loving armorer. Peace steals on, and, mining slowly, saps our vigor, dims our story. While she boasts her influence holy, cobwebs gather o'er our glory. Hark! Then sounds war's joyous rattle. Wounds may yawn, blood flow in battle. We need yawn in sloth no longer. War's pruning makes mankind the stronger. And, to conclude, the saying of Luther, When I look at war as a thing that protects wife, child, house, land, goods, and honor, and in doing so gains peace and secures it, in that view, war is the right precious thing. Oh, yes, if I look at the panther as a dove, in that case, the panther is a very gentle beast, I remarked unheard. The military chaplain did not allow himself to be disturbed in his flow of eloquence. And, when he ended and took leave, I found myself with two convictions. That war, from the Christian point of view, is a justifiable, and in and by itself is a precious thing. It was visibly a very agreeable thing to him to have, by means of this rhetorical victory, both fulfilled the duty of his profession and in doing so rendered a considerable service to the foreign colonel. For, as he rose to go, and we expressed to him our thanks for the trouble he had been so good as to undertake, he deprecatingly rejoined, It is for me to thank you for having given me an opportunity of chasing away your doubts through my feeble word, whose entire efficacy is to be ascribed to the word of God, which I have so often quoted, Doubts, which are of such a nature as to bring nothing but pain to a person who is not only a Christian, but a soldier's wife. Peace be with you. Oh, I groaned when he was gone. That was torture. Yes, said Frederick, it was. Our want of straightforwardness especially was uncomfortable to me, and, particularly the false premises under which we got him to display his eloquence, 
At one moment I was on the point of saying to him, Stop, reverend sir, I myself entertain the same views against war as my wife, and what you are saying only serves, as far as I am concerned, to enable me to see more clearly the weakness of your arguments. But I held my tongue. Why interfere with an honest man's conviction, a conviction which is besides the foundation of his profession in life? Conviction? Are you certain of that? Does he really believe that he is speaking the truth, or does he purposely deceive his common soldiers when he promises them an assured victory through the assistance of a god of whom he nevertheless must know this, that he is invoked in exactly the same way by the enemy? These appeals to our people and to our cause as the only righteous one, and one which is God's cause too, were surely only possible at a time when one people shut out all other peoples and considered itself as the only one entitled to exist, the only one beloved of God. And then all these promises of heaven, with the view of more easily procuring the sacrifice of earthly life, all these ceremonies, consecrations, oaths, hymns which are intended to awaken in the breast of the man ordered into war, that joy in death, repulsive words to me, which they so admire. Is it not? Everything has two sides, Martha, said Frederick, interrupting me. It is because we deprecate war that everything which supports and excuses it, everything which veils its horrors, appears hateful to us. Yes, of course, because the hateful thing is upheld thereby. But not thereby only. All institutions stand on roots of a thousand fibers, and as long as they exist, it must be a good thing that those feelings and methods of thought should persist by which they are excused, by which they are rendered not only tolerable, but even beloved. How many a poor fellow is helped through his death agony by that same joy in death into which he has been educated? How many a pious soul relies in all confidence on the help of God of which he has been assured by the preacher? How much innocent vanity and proud feeling of honor are awakened and satisfied by those ceremonies? How many hearts beat higher at the sound of those hymns? From the total of the pain which war has brought on men, we must at least deduct that pain which war poets and war preachers have contrived to sing away and lie away. End of section 64 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen Gilbert, Arizona Section 65 of Lay Down Your Arms This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha Von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 15, Part 5. We were summoned away from Berlin very hurriedly. A telegram announced to me that Aunt Mary was very ill and wished to see me. I found the old lady given up by her physicians. It is my turn now, she said. For my own part, I am right willing to go. Since my poor brother and the three children were snatched away, this world has had no more joy for me. Apart from anything else, I shall never more have the strength to bear up after such a blow. I shall find the others there above. Conrad and Lily are also united there. It was not ordained that they should be united here on earth. If they had finished their arrangements in proper time, I was disposed to say in opposition, but I stopped myself. I could not surely raise any discussion with this dying person, and still less try to unsell her about her favorite theory of preordination. I have one comfort, she went on, that you, at least, dear Martha, remain behind happy. The cholera has spared you, and that proves clearly that it is ordained for you to grow old in company. Only try to make of your little Rudolph a good Christian and a good soldier, so that his grandfather up in heaven may still find his joy in him. Even on this point I preferred to keep silence, for I was firmly resolved to make no soldier of my son. I will pray for you incessantly, 
so that you may live long and happily. Of course, I did not dwell on the inconsistency that an inevitable destiny could be influenced in one's favor by incessant prayer, but I interrupted the poor creature by begging her not to exhaust herself with talking, and, in order to distract her attention, told her about our doings in Switzerland and Berlin. I also related how we met Prince Henry, and that he had caused to be erected in the park of his castle, a marble monument in memory of the bride, whom he had lost as soon as won. Three days afterwards, poor Aunt Mary fell asleep, resigned and calm, fortified with the sacrament for the dying, which she had herself begged for, and which she received with devotion. And thus were all my relations gone from the earth, all those in whose midst I had been brought up. In her will, the entire inheritance of her little fortune was left to my son Rudolph, and as his trustee, minister, to be sure, was nominated. This circumstance brought me now into frequent contact with this old friend of my father. He was also pretty nearly the only visitor at our house. The deep mourning into which the unhappy week at Grumitz had plunged me caused me, as a matter of course, to live in perfect retirement. Our plan of settling in Paris could not be carried out till all my affairs were put in order, and in any case several months more would be necessary for that. Our friend the minister, who, as I have said, formed almost the whole of our society, had in these latter days either received or obtained his discharge. I never quite fathomed the matter, but in short he had withdrawn into private life, but he was still as fond as ever of busying himself about politics. He continually contrived to turn the conversation onto this, his favorite theme, and we also willingly took our share in it. As Frederick was now occupying himself so busily with the study of international law, any discussion was welcome to him, which touched on this province. After dinner, Mr. To be sure, for we always between ourselves made use of this nickname for him, was always asked to dine at our house twice a week. The two gentlemen would plunge into a long political conversation, but in doing this my husband took care not to let this conversation turn into the political gossip, which he so hated, but was careful to lead it to views of more general interest. In this, to be sure, Mr. To be sure, could not always follow him, for in his character as an inveterate diplomatist and official, he had accustomed himself to follow what is called practical politics, a thing which is directed merely to the private interests which lie nearest to hand and knows nothing about the theoretical questions of social science. I sat by, busy over some needlework, and took no share in the conversation, a thing which seemed quite natural to the minister, for politics is, as is well known, far too high a thing for ladies. He was sure that I was thinking all the time of other things, whilst I, on the contrary, was listening very attentively, since it was my business to impress the tenor of this dialogue on my memory, in order to transfer it afterwards into the red book. Frederick made no secret of his opinions, though he knew what a thankless part it is to set oneself to oppose what is generally received, and to defend ideas whilst they are in the stage when, even if they are not condemned as subversive, still they are derided as fantastic. I am in a position today to communicate to you an interesting piece of news, dear Tilling, said the minister one afternoon with an air of importance. People in government circles, that is to say, in the Ministry of War, are ventilating the idea of introducing a universal liability to service amongst us also. What? The same system which before the war was so universally condemned and derided among us? Tailors and arms, and so on? To be sure, we had a prejudice against it a short time since. Still, it has rendered good service to the Prussians, you must allow. And in fact, from the moral point of view and even from the democratic and liberal point of view, for which you occasionally appear so enthusiastic, it is surely a just and elevating thing that every son of his fatherland, 
without any regard to his position or stage of education, should have to fulfill the same duties, and from a strategic point of view, could little Prussia have been always victorious if she had not had the landwehr, and if the latter had been introduced amongst us before, should we have been always beaten? Well, the meaning of that is, that if we had had more material, the material which our enemy had would not have served him. Ergo, if the land were, were introduced everywhere, it would not benefit anybody. The war game would be played with more pieces, but the game, nevertheless, depends still on the luck and the ability of the players. I will suppose that all the European powers have introduced the obligation of universal defense. The proportion of forces in that case remains exactly the same. The only difference would be that, in order to come to a decision, instead of hundreds of thousands, millions would have to be slaughtered. But do you think it just and fair that a part only of the population should sacrifice themselves in order to protect the dearest possessions of the others, and that these others, chiefly because they are rich, should be entitled to stop quietly at home? No, no, that will cease with this new law. Then there will be no more buying off. Everyone will have to take his part and it is especially the educated, the students, those who have some learning, who will contribute the elements of intelligence and therefore a victory. The other side has the same elements ready to hand, and so the advantages to be gained from educated petty officers neutralize each other. On the other hand, what remains, and equally to both sides, is the loss of material of priceless mental worth, of which the country is deprived by the fact that the most educated, those who might have promoted its civilization by means of inventions, works of art, or scientific inquiry, are set up in rank and file to be marks for the enemy's shot. Oh, well, for making inventions and producing works of art, and investigating skull bones, and all sorts of things of that kind, which do not advance the position of the state's power one drachma. Hmm. What? Oh, nothing. Go on. For all that, there remains plenty of time for people. And besides, they need not serve for the whole of their life, but a few years of strict discipline are assuredly good for everybody, and make them only so much the more competent to fulfill their other duties as citizens. We must, in the present state of things, pay the blood tax some time, so it ought to be divided between all equally. There would be something to say for that, if it fell less heavily on individuals on that account. But that would not be the case. The blood tax would not be divided by that measure, but increased. I hope the project may not be carried out. There is no seeing whither it may lead. One state would then try to outvie the other in strength of army, till at last there would no longer be any armies, but only armed nations. More people would be constantly drawn into the service. The length of service would be constantly increased. The incidence of war taxes and the costs of armaments constantly greater, so that without fighting each other, the nations would all come to ruin in making preparations for war. But, dear Tilling, you look too far. One can never look too far. Everything a man undertakes, he ought to think out to its remotest consequence at least as far as his mind reaches. We were likening war, just now, to a game at chess. Politics, also, is of the same nature, Your Excellency, and those are only very feeble players who look no further forward than a single move and are quite pleased with themselves if they have got into a position in which they can threaten a pawn. I want to develop the thought of defensive forces constantly increasing, and the universal extension of liability to military service still more widely, till we reach the extremist verge, i.e., where the mass becomes excessive. What then, if, after the greatest numbers and the furthest limits of age are reached, one nation should take it into its head to recruit regiments of women too? The others might imitate it. Or battalions of boys? The others must imitate it. And in the armaments in the means of destruction, where can the limit be? Oh, this savage, blind leap into the pit! 
Calm yourself, dear Tilling. You are a genuine faddist. If you could only point me out a means to do away with war, it would be a perfect benefit, to be sure. But, as that is not possible, every nation must surely endeavor to prepare itself, for it is as well as possible, in order to assure itself of the greatest chance of winning in the inevitable struggle for existence. That is the cant word of the fashionable Darwinism, is it not? If I should choose to suggest to you the means of doing away with wars, you would again call me a silly faddist, a sentimental dreamer, rendered morbid by the humanitarian craze. That, I think, is the cant word in favor with the war party, is it not? To be sure, I cannot conceal from you that no practical foundation exists for the realization of such an ideal. One must calculate with the actual factors. In these are classed the passions of men, their rivalries, the divergences of interests, the impossibility of coming to an agreement on all questions. But that is not necessary. When disagreements begin, an arbitration tribunal, not force, is to decide. The sovereign states would never betake themselves to such a tribunal, nor would the peoples. The peoples? The potentates and diplomatists would not. But the people? Just inquire, and you will find that the wish for peace is warm and true in the people, while the peaceful assurances, which proceed from the governments, are frequently lies, hypocritical lies, or at least are regarded as such, on principle, by other governments. That is precisely what is called diplomacy, and the peoples will go on, ever more and more, calling for peace. If the general obligation of defense should extend, the dislike of war will increase in the same proportion. A class of soldiers, animated with love for their calling, is, of course, imaginable. Their exceptional position, which they take for a position of honor, is offered to them as a recompense for the sacrifice which it entails. But when the exception ceases, the distinction ceases also. The admiring thankfulness disappears, which those who stay at home offer to those who go out in their defense, because then there will be no one to stay at home. The war-loving feelings, which are always being suggested to the soldier, and, in so doing, are often awakened in him, will be more seldom kindled. For who are those that are of the most heroic spirit, who are most warm in their enthusiasm for the exploits and dangers of war? Those who are safe against them, the professors, the politicians, the beer shop chatterers, the chorus of old men, as it is called in Faust. When the safety is lost, that chorus will be silenced. Besides, if not only those devote themselves to the military life, who love and praise it, but all those also are forcibly dragged into it, who look on it with horror, that horror must work. Poets, thinkers, friends of humanity, timid persons, all these will, from their own point of view, curse the trade they are forced into. But they will, beyond doubt, have to keep silent about this way of thinking, in order not to pass for cowards, in order not to expose themselves to the displeasure of the higher powers. Keep silence? Not forever. As I talk, though I have myself kept silent long, so will the others also break out into speech. If the thought ripens, the word will come. I am an individual who have come to the age of forty before my conviction acquired sufficient strength to expand itself into words. And, as I have required two or three decades, so the masses will perhaps require two or three generations. But speak they will at last. End of section 65 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 66 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. 
Chapter 16, Part 1 New Year's Day, 1867 The Luxembourg Question Disputes between France and Prussia Arbitration The alarm blows over We visit Paris Plan of Napoleon III for general disarmament Frederick's efforts in the cause of peace The protocol of peace A little daughter is born to us Renewed happiness Frederick's studies, Monsieur Desmoulins' proposals, return to Paris and re-entry into the gay world, talk of the Revanche de Sadova, pressure of the war party on Napoleon III, whirl of gaiety, we seek repose in Switzerland, illness of my little daughter, return to Paris in March 1870. Napoleon III drops his plan of disarmament under the pressure of the war party. Still peace seems assured. The New Year, 67. We kept the Sylvester night quite alone, my Frederick and I. When it struck twelve, do you recollect, I asked with a sigh, the speech my poor father made in proposing a toast last year at the same hour? I do not dare to wish you good fortune now. The future sometimes hides something so unexpectedly terrible in its bosom, and no wish has ever availed to turn it aside. Then let us use the turn of the year, Marta, as an occasion not for thinking of what is coming, but for looking back into the year which has just flown by. What sufferings you have had to endure, my poor brave wife, so many of your dear ones buried, and those days of horror on the battlefields in Bohemia. I do not grieve that I have seen the cruel things that took place there. Now I can at least participate with all the might of my soul in your efforts. We must bring up your, rather our, Rudolf, with a view of his pushing these efforts further. In his time a visible mark will perhaps arise above the horizon, hardly in ours. What a noise the people are making in the streets. They are greeting with shouts the new year, in spite of the sufferings which the old one, that was greeted in the same way, brought on them. Oh, how forgetful men are! Do not chide them too much for their forgetfulness, Frederick. We too are beginning to brush away from our memory the sufferings of the past, and what I feel is the bliss of the present, the bliss of having you, my own one. We were not to speak of the future, I know, still I think that the future we have before us is good. United, loving, sufficient in ourselves, rich, how many exquisite enjoyments can not life still offer us? We will travel, we'll make acquaintance with the world the world that is so fair, fair so long as peace prevails, and peace may now last for many, many years. But if war is to break out again, you are no longer involved in it, and Rudolf, too, is not threatened, since he is not going to be a soldier. But if, according to Minister to be sure's information, every man should be obliged to share in the defence, oh, nonsense! So what I mean is we will travel, we will bring up our Rudolf to be a pattern man, we will follow our noble aim, the propaganda of peace, and we, we will love each other. The carnival this same year brought with it once more balls and pleasures of all sorts, but my mourning kept me away from all such things. But what astonished me was that the whole of society did not abstain from such mad goings-on. Surely there must have been a loss in almost every family, but as it seemed folks set all that at naught. A few houses, it's true, remained closed, especially among the aristocracy, but there was no want of opportunities for the young people to dance, and the most favoured partners were, of course, those who'd come back from the battlefields of Italy and Bohemia, and the naval officers were those most fated, especially those who had fought at Lisa. Half the lady world had fallen in love with Tegetov, the youthful admiral, as they had done with the handsome General Gablenz after the campaign of Schleswig-Holstein. Kustotza and Lisa were the two trump cards which were everywhere played in any conversation about the war which was over. Along with this, the needle gun and Landwehr came in, two institutions which must be introduced as speedily as possible, and then future victories were assured to us. Victories? When? And over whom? On this point people did not speak out, but the idea of revenge which is wont to accompany the loss of a game, even if it be only a game at cards, was hovering over all the utterances of the politicians. If even we did not ourselves take the field once more against the Prussians, perhaps there might be others who would take it on themselves to avenge us. All appearances seemed to show that France would get into a quarrel with our conquerors, and then they might get paid off for a good deal. 
the thing had even got a name in diplomatic circles, La Revanche de Sadova. Such was the triumphant announcement to us of Minister, to be sure. It was at the beginning of spring that once more a certain black spot appeared on the horizon, a question, as they call it. The news also of French preparations provided the conjectural politicians with what they loved so, the prospect of war. The question this time was called that of Luxembourg. Luxembourg! What was there, then, of such great importance to the world in that? On this subject I had again to embark in studies similar to those about Schleswig-Holstein. The name was indeed familiar to me only from Suppé's Jolly Companions, in which, as is well known, a count of Luxembourg spends all he has in dress, dress, dress. The result of my studies was as follows. Luxembourg belonged, according to the treaties of 1814 and 1816, ah, there we have it, treaties, they contain ready-made the root of a national quarrel, a fine institution, these treaties, to the king of the Netherlands, and at the same time to the German Bund. Prussia had the right to garrison the capital. Now, however, as Prussia had renounced her share in the old Bund, how could she keep the right of garrison? That was the point, the question. The peace of Prague had in fact introduced a new system into Germany, and thereby the connection with Luxembourg had been dissolved. Why then did the Prussians maintain their right of garrison? To be sure, that was an intricate affair, and the most advantageous and righteous way of settling it would be to slaughter fresh hundreds of thousands. That every enlightened politician must allow. The Dutch had never attached any importance to the possession of the Grand Duchy. The king also, William III, attached no importance to it, and would have been happy to cede it to France for a sum to be paid into his privy purse. So private negotiations now commenced between the king and the French cabinet. Exactly, secrecy is always the essence of all diplomacy. The peoples are not to know anything of the matters in dispute. As soon as the latter are ripe for decision, they have the right to bleed for them. Why and wherefore they are fighting each other is a question of no importance. It was not till the end of March that the king made the official announcement, and on the same day as that on which his assent was telegraphed to France, the Prussian ambassador at The Hague was informed of it. On that began negotiations with Prussia. The latter appealed to the guarantees of the treaties of 1859, the foundations on which the Kingdom of Holland stood. Public opinion in Prussia what is meant by public opinion, possibly the writers of leading articles, was indignant that the old German Reichsland should be torn away, and in the Reichstag of North Germany on April 1st there were heated questions on the subject. Bismarck, it is true, remained cool about Luxembourg, but nevertheless he set on foot preparations against France on this occasion, and they, of course, were followed by counter-preparations on the French side. Ah, how well I know that tune! At that time I trembled sorely for fear of a new fire being lighted in Europe. No want of people to poke it. In Paris, Cassagnac and Émile de Girardin, in Berlin, Menzel and Heinrich Leo, have then such provokers of war even the remotest notion of the gigantic enormity of their transgression. I hardly think so. It was at this time, as I first heard the tale many years after, that Professor Simpson used the following expression in the presence of the Crown Prince Frederick of Prussia about the question in dispute. Quote, if France and Holland have already come to an agreement, that signifies war. Unquote. To which the Crown Prince, in hot excitement and alarm, replied, You have never seen war. If you had seen it, you would not pronounce the word so quietly. I have seen it, and I say to you that it is the highest duty, if it be anyhow possible, to avoid it. And this time it was avoided. A conference met at London, which on May 11th led to the wished-for peaceable solution. Luxembourg was declared neutral, and Prussia drew her troops out. The friends of peace breathed again, but there were plenty of people who were discontented at this turn of affairs. Not the Emperor of the French, he wished for peace, but the French war party. In Germany, too, there were voices raised to condemn the behavior of Prussia, sacrifice of a fortress, submission looking like fear, and other things of the kind. But every private person also, who on the sentence of a court gives up his claim to any possessions, shows the same submission. Would it be better for him not to bow to any tribunal, but to settle the matter with his fists? The result achieved by the Conference of London may, in such doubtful questions, be always achieved, and the leaders of states can always find that avoidance possible, which Frederick the Noble, afterwards Frederick III, called the highest duty. End of section 66, read by Sandra.